Hey everyone, and welcome to the best of July 2022. Tonight we have just a little bit over 10 hours worth of stories in no particular order, as per usual. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. Let's go for... Let's do something a little bit higher than usual. Let's go for 1700 likes. I think if everybody took a quick second, we could do it. Subscribing if you are new is also very much appreciated, as I post content just like this all of the time. But yeah, I hope you're all having a great summer. I hope things are going well for all of you. Grab a coffee, a snack, whatever it is that you do to relax, and enjoy. And of course, as always, I hope you all have a great night. I never thought I'd be one of the people to write a story here, to share something horrible. I actually never used to read Reddit or anything like that. I don't even like horror stories, but my mother loves everything scary. She decorates her house for Halloween in August. She watches slashers like they're her stories. I guess I started reading these stories to try and engage in her hobby. It never really clicked, but I tried. My mom was always interested in this stuff though. When true crime became bigger during the pandemic, she eagerly started watching every YouTube channel she could find. I'd wake up in the mornings at 8am to the words throat slashed or eyes gouged out or stabbed 44 times. I was 18 and I had heard my mother say exsanguination more often than she'd said I love you. I know that sounds dramatic, but not only is it true, it's frighteningly relevant. I saw less and less of the woman who had raised me, and more of an empty shell with nothing to fill her but the horrible words coming from our TV at all hours. My dad wasn't in the picture. He hadn't been for over 10 years, for reasons I won't get into. But I know he was depressed. It was just me, my mom, and the TV. Once, when I had managed to drag her out to a doctor's appointment, I joked that the TV was my new dad. She just looked at me with her tired eyes, no anger or humor, and I didn't say anything about it again. I began to wish for her to get angry at me, to do something, to feel again. I regret that now. The thing about true crime, beyond the obvious that it's true, is that most of the cases that get sensationalized are unsolved. I read somewhere that there are as many as 50 active serial killers in the US at any given time. Of course that means a lot of them don't get reported at all. But the ones that do, and the ones that aren't solved, get turned into televised candy for bored housewives. Exactly a month ago today, I woke up to my mom doing the same thing she did every morning. Drinking her coffee and watching a video on YouTube. Hey mom, I said, expecting no response. It was almost startling when she snapped her head towards me and grinned. Hey Em, she said cheerful. It was the most emotion I'd heard in almost two years, and I admit I was a bit nervous by the sudden change. You want to watch this with me? She asked, gesturing at the television with her coffee mug. I'd bought it for her a few years ago. It said, Number One Cat Grandma. A stupid joke, and an upsetting one. My cat had run away a few months ago. But I can't pretend that I wasn't also a little happy to finally be invited into this secret world my mother languished in. She wasn't antisocial, but I wouldn't say she liked talking during her stories. Maybe a few comments here or there, but mostly to herself. I sat on the couch. Instead of continuing the video, my mother clumsily navigated the Roku remote control and began a new one. A glance at the video info said it had been posted around midnight, eight or so hours ago. She patted my leg awkwardly as the video began. I smiled a little weakly and then focused on the TV. I was honestly confused by her enthusiasm. She practically vibrated with emotion as we watched the opening scrawl. It was the usual stuff, the name of the channel, 
and the name of the episode, and a few words about Patreon. On the bottom left, a little pop-up about paid promotions being in the video slid into the screen, and I felt my eyes glaze over. Yes, I'd tried to engage with my mother before, but I can't say I was thrilled about this. The voice on the screen had a dead, utilitarian sound. Subtitles were on despite the words themselves already gliding across the screen. I recognized Windows Movie Maker style transitions and almost laughed. Today's story is pretty unique to the channel, says the man's voice. Most of the cases we discuss on here are old, cold cases, but today's is as fresh as a daisy. It was a bit strange to hear someone talk about what was probably a terrible crime, that it was the latest fashion, but I digress, he continued. In the sleepy town of Caston, Maine, a gruesome scene was discovered on May 12th. I stopped. Caston? Is that why my mom wanted me to watch? It was the town next to ours, only a few miles drive to the west. I must have made a face. My mom turned to me with a huge grin, nodding her head and never quite meeting my eyes. Two homeless men were found dead, their throats cut, their bodies stashed in a dumpster behind a local grocery store. The funny thing is the killer obviously had trouble getting the bodies in there. They built a makeshift stairway with old pallets. No DNA was found at the scene beyond the victims, which honestly was everywhere. The killer rolled them up the stairs like old rugs. On the screen, an amateurish recreation of the scene drawn in Photoshop popped up for a moment. Then, all right, said the voice. Here's a message from today's sponsors. I turned to my mom. She still looked thrilled to be sitting there watching it with me. She had more color in her cheeks than she had in over a year. Her blonde hair, streaked with gray, was brushed and pulled into a fancy bun. She'd stuck a blue pin through her hair. It was a dragonfly styled in fall stained glass. I'd gotten it for her on her 50th birthday. There had been a real sapphire tucked away among the blue and white painted glass. It had fallen out, but the hairpin itself was still beautiful. The blue in her gray blonde hair added made her look 10 years younger. After the sponsorship spiel was over, we finished the video. It was pretty cut and dry. The only real shock was that it had happened so close to our house. The police had no leads and the video ended up with a number to call in case there was any info. So? My mom said. What did you think? Oh, um, I said not really sure what to say. It was kind of scary that something like that could happen so close to us. I know those guys were homeless, but that doesn't mean it isn't awful. What's awful about it? My mom asked with a bitter note. Uh, two people died, mom. Oh, she perked up again and smiled. After that, we ordered pizza and watched a movie. She let me pick, which meant it was the first non-horror film I'd watched with my mom ever. After that, things went back to mostly normal. I still woke up at 8am to the sounds of true crime on the TV, but there was a small difference. My mom would ask me questions about the videos. I'd sit, laptop on my legs, and job application after job application on my screen. And she'd ask me if I thought the killer might get caught or if he or she was smart enough to elude police. If fingerprint evidence was enough to catch someone, I didn't really know, but even though it was still about her hobby, I responded. I even felt myself starting to get into it. It was almost like a soap opera. Even though you knew the content was bad, it sucked you in. Until tonight. I'm writing this from the bathroom, my mom thinks the food we ordered didn't sit well with me, but the truth is that I'm fine, at least physically. I had decided to actually start watching the videos ahead of time, so I could answer her questions. 
get more info and gain some knowledge about this hobby of hers. I reasoned it wasn't her fault she was bored. It wasn't her fault she was retired and the world had gone mad and there was a pandemic. I'd loaded up the video as soon as it popped up. The same channel that had started this whole mess. Windows Movie Maker, a pop-up telling me there was a paid promotion, and two more bodies. More homeless men. The voice on the screen had more pep to it. He was happy that there were now four bodies. You need three kills for it to be a serial. The cops were still pretty dumbfounded, but they had a small lead. The killer had possibly left behind some evidence. And the YouTuber was thrilled to have procured a picture. Legally, he swore, but I rolled my eyes. As the image slid onto the screen, I felt my stomach fall. It was a small plastic baggie. Picture taken by an inexpert hand, probably with a phone. Inside, a tiny sapphire, glue still encrusted on the side where it had fallen from its setting. Help me. I'm sure there isn't a single person reading this that doesn't know what liminal spaces are by now, but just in case. The concept of liminal spaces relates to physical locations that are typically transitional in nature. Hallways, waiting rooms, and parking lots are classic examples. The liminal aesthetic can be defined by the unique feeling of eerie nostalgia people experience when presented with such places outside of their designated context. For instance, an abandoned hospital corridor might seem ominous and uncanny due to the prevalence of human activity usually associated with medical facilities. While the specific aesthetics has always existed, it was recently popularized and further defined by the backrooms, a, by now, infamous creepypasta about what happens when you no clip out of reality. At least, that's how I first became familiar with the term. Like many other fans of the original work, I was eager to contribute to the ever-expanding subgenre of horror games inspired by liminal spaces. The project itself wasn't anything revolutionary. Basically, it began as a glorified first-person walking simulator without any particular purpose or goal where you can explore various unique 3D liminal environments. The only thing about it that was somewhat novel was that I didn't intend in implementing any actual scares into the game, instead relying entirely on the atmosphere to instill a sense of constant suspense in the player. Pretentious, I know, but I've always liked the idea of a horror game that leaves you in a perpetual state of questioning whether you're truly alone or not. There are very few games that scratch that particular itch for me, so I decided to just make it myself. The first level I created was an abandoned multi-story car park. I based it on the one across the street. Each floor was near identical to the last, and with the outside being just an endless expanse of fog, you couldn't really tell whether you were making progress or you were just stuck in a loop. Again. I know that what I'm describing doesn't sound all that impressive, but keep in mind that I was a 16 year old kid learning how to use a gaming engine for the first time. I must have replayed that level over 50 times, making sure that everything, from the camera's movements to the ambience, was exactly the way I wanted it. I remember spending days just toying with the shaders alone. I didn't want the location to feel too artificial. But I also didn't want to distract from the liminality by adding extra clutter. I was looking for that sweet spot between minimalist and dingy. Once I was finally done, or at least as close to done as I was going to get, I asked my best friend Alex if he could play it for me and tell me what he thought. He is a bit of a wimp when it comes to any kind of horror media, thus making him the perfect test subject. I made a point of deliberately not telling him that there were no ghosts or spooky monsters haunting the level. I was looking for a genuine impression, after all, and well, I thought it would have been funny. 
He called me a few hours later. I could tell from his nervous laughter that he was still playing. Alright, bruv, I give up. What's behind the door? How do you open it? I was confused. I didn't remember implementing any doors or anything that could be described as one. My initial assumption was that he had caught on to the joke and was now trying to mess with me in return, so I just played along. Oh, that. Yeah, so you gotta collect the 77 pages and then a hyper-realistic animatronic Slenderman will come out of there and start chasing you. I could practically hear him rolling his eyes. Hilarious, mate. No, but seriously, how do I open it? I've looked everywhere for like a pressure pot or a key or something. At least give me a hint. I persisted, sharply dismissing his nagging. But after a while, it became apparent that his frustration was genuine. We moved the call to Discord and he shared his screen, showing me what he was talking about. Turns out that he was being very much for real. Plastered across one of the walls was the flat texture of a door. It was red, resembling a fire exit, which made it all the more jarring against the color palette of grays and faded browns that otherwise dominated the environment. I blinked in confusion and leaned forward in my chair. I certainly hadn't put that there. With Alex still on the call, I booted up my level editor and clipped up to the seventh floor, the same floor that he was on. Sure enough, the bright red door was on my version of the project as well. It appeared to be part of the texture pack that I was using. Not sure how, but I guessed I'd somehow missed it during my numerous playthroughs. It was a fun little WTF moment, but obviously nothing we were about to lose sleep over. I even briefly considered keeping it there as an inside joke, but ended up replacing the door with a more fitting surface. I began work on the second level just a few days later. It was inspired by a reoccurring dream I've had. A looping, white, sterile corridor with rows of yellow lockers on each side. The player would have been dropped at the end of it and given no further directive. There were no puzzles to be solved, no hidden switch that would reveal some secret passageway. That was sort of the point. I remember thinking I was being so clever, so abstract, as though I was on the verge of creating the piece de resistance of all walking sims that would be dissected and theorized on for years to come. In reality, all I did was make a tech demo using a bunch of pre-made assets. The Stanley Parable, it most definitely was not. After playtesting it for a bit, I sent the finished version to Alex. It didn't even take a full hour for him to call me back. This time around, he sounded more agitated than nervous. I've been walking for like 30 minutes. Where am I meant to be going? I laughed, but... Internally, I was actually quite annoyed with him for not appreciating my vision for what it was. I chalked it up to my friend being a meathead without a single creative bone in his body. There was surely no other reason as to why somebody wouldn't be positively enthralled by the mere prospect of walking through the same hallway over and over again. Don't know. Try tugging the left wall. I snidely replied, Screw off. It all looks the same. Am I supposed to, like, do something with the lockers? There's the door, but that doesn't seem to do anything. So I'm assuming... I perked up. Door? What door? Alex laughed sarcastically. Don't start again. It wasn't even that funny the first time. I scooted closer to my desk and adjusted my headset, adopting what I considered to be a more serious tone while launching the editor once more. Where is it? Alex's microphone crackled as he exhaled into it. He was still convinced that I was trying to mess with him, which, given our usual dynamic, I guess I couldn't blame him for. I don't know, man. Close to where you spawn? I found it almost immediately. Snugly nestled between two neighboring lockers was the red door. Unlike its previous iteration, it was no longer just a flat texture, but rather a fully rendered 3D asset. I couldn't believe it, yet there it was, 
its clean metallic surface gleaming beneath the harsh lighting. Just to reiterate once more, I'm absolutely, positively certain that I hadn't put that there. I could no longer attribute it to negligence either. It's one thing to accidentally misplace a texture, but there was no way that I had somehow added an entirely new object to the game without realizing it. Of course, there was nothing actually behind the door, nor a way to open it as far as I could tell, but that didn't make the whole situation any less weird. The only other person that would have had access to my computer was mom, but she doesn't even know how to work a browser, much less do something like this. Could a hacker be responsible? But why would somebody take the time to remotely edit my game and leave everything else on my PC untouched? Just to freak me out? They were succeeding if that was the case. Once I managed to persuade Alex that this wasn't my idea of an elaborate prank, he was even more freaked out than I was. He went full creepypasta protagonist on me, saying that the game must have been haunted or something. Now, I like my Ben Drowned and Sonic.xe as much as the next kid that grew up in the 2010s, but it would have taken a lot more than that for me to consider the possibility of a spooky cyber ghost that gets off on putting random doors in people's games. We spent the rest of the evening talking in circles. In the end, we nestled on the tried and true method of doing nothing. I vaguely remember mentioning something about having my OS reinstalled, but I never got around to it. I already had a lot of things that I was dealing with at the time. I suppose you could say that this project was my means of escapism. It made me feel productive, like I was actually working towards something however inconsequential. In short, I needed it, and I wasn't about to let a few bizarre coincidences take it away from me. The third and last level that I ever worked on was my most ambitious yet. The way I envisioned it is kind of difficult to describe. I think it was inspired by an image I saw on Reddit. Imagine a large field, complete with rolling hills and broad valleys. But instead of grass, it's all covered by a green carpet. Pinned against the painted on sky was a very obvious spotlight, which would have followed the player around, always shining directly at them whenever they would look up. The goal was to make it feel like you were stranded in this uncanny, poorly put together mock reality that didn't even try to hide the fact that it was a set. It, as in whatever was messing with my game, didn't even wait for me to fully finish the level this time. I was still in the process of making sure that the camera didn't clip through the more uneven parts of the terrain. As I turned my point of view around, I saw it. The by now all too familiar red door, suspended in the middle of an untextured plain. It stood vertically on its own, there was nothing behind or around it. I would have probably been more unnerved had a part of me not subconsciously expected for it to eventually show up. In fact, I wasn't scared at all for some reason. Worse, I felt inexplicably drawn to it. My player character inched forth without my input. It was like I was in a cutscene. Soon enough, I was standing directly in front of that door, looking up at its imposingly tall frame. I had neither the option to step back nor approach any further. As I looked down at the fully rendered handle, a prompt appeared in semi-transparent white letters. Press E to open. I swallowed hard and, desperate to sate this newfound sense of morbid curiosity, did as instructed. My screen went completely black and then transitioned to solid red. Another prompt floated into view. Use WASD keys to move. I would have never realized that I could control my character again had the game not expressly told me. Upon retreating a few steps, I realized that I had been standing up close to a wall and in actuality, I was in some kind of enclosed space. Every inch of it was painted in that same shade of solid, uniform red. Unless viewed from a specific angle, you couldn't really tell where one surface ended and another began. It was nausea inducing. 
I tried pulling up the console menu. Nothing happened. I could neither exit nor minimize the game. Regardless of what combination of keys I attempted, it became increasingly clear that I was no longer in control. And yet, I couldn't quite bring myself to press the power button on my PC. I had this inexplicable urge to uncover the secrets of this place. It was like some sort of primal impulse that was hardwired into my brain. The seemingly endless network of empty spaces was divided by walls and narrow passageways. Distinguishing one room from another was close to impossible. It felt like I was walking in circles, and that most likely was the case for a good while, until I stumbled into a room that actually had something in it. Placed on an equally red table was a can of silver spray paint. Immediately upon picking it up, I was prompted to press F on my keyboard to use it. A crudely drawn check mark materialized on the surface I was facing. I now had the ability to mark off places that I've already explored, which, needless to say, proved immensely valuable. Armed with my new way of navigation, I now felt like I was making some actual progress. The more I explored, the more I began to pick up certain patterns. I realized that each section was comprised of a set of cyclical layouts. For example, every fifth room was L-shaped, and every tenth room was H-shaped and connected to multiple corridors, one of which always looped back to the start of the sequence. It practically turned into a rhythm game. One, two, go left, three, four, go right. If the levels that I'd already created could be looked at as their own self-contained microcosms, then I suppose that this was their version of the back rooms. A maze of uniformly textured procedural spaces that, ironically, embodied the spirit of liminality even better than anything I could have consciously conceived. And then, finally, after what felt like hours, I entered a room that was quite unlike the previous ones. The oppressive red was replaced by beige wallpaper. It gave me this intense feeling of deja vu, and still does whenever I think about it. Mounted onto the opposite wall was what looked like a flat screen TV. There were no other exits apart from the one that I came in through. I seemed to have reached the end of the monochromatic labyrinth. Upon approaching the vertically placed monitor, I was promptly presented with two options. Press Y to meet your host, press N to go back. I paused for a moment and looked over at my phone. It was 4.45 AM. I had already gone this far. No way I was backing down now. I briefly considered calling Alex, but thought better of it. Even if I did manage to wake him up, I would have then had to spend another hour trying to convince him that this wasn't my idea of a joke. No, I needed answers, and I needed them now. My finger hovered over the Y key. I took a deep, anxious breath and pressed it all the way down. The virtual TV came to life, white lines raced across its screen. At the center of a blank background appeared the still portrait of a man. The image was low res, that I could count the individual pixels that comprised it. What it lacked in detail, however, it made up for in expressiveness. The unfamiliar man's cartoonishly large frown dripped to the corners of his jaw and his eyebrows were scrunched together in a peevish stare. It was like someone had taken the stock photo of a typical suburban dad and used the liquify filter to exaggerate his features. I nearly jumped out of my seat as a grainy and eerily upbeat voice suddenly emanated from my speakers. There had been virtually no audio cues this far, which made it all the more jarring. Hello guest 185, this is Henry. Henry is an introvert. Henry doesn't like having guests. What you see at the bottom of your screen is Henry's patience meter. There was now a green bar occupying the bottom of my POV. It was at 99%. You best get going. Henry's not a patient man. Use shift to sprint. 
After delivering its brief tutorial, the TV flickered and slumped down from its perch, crashing against the floor. I glanced down at the rapidly dwindling bar. 90%. The pressure was on. I was no longer questioning the logistics of what I was experiencing. I just knew that I had to find my way back and quick. The logical part of my brain tried to reason with the rest of my body, assuring me that I was in no real danger, and yet there was no denying the pounding in my chest, or the cold beads of sweat rolling down my forehead. Using the shift key, as per instructed, I backtracked through the red corridors as swiftly as I could, applying the same methods that I used before, but in reverse. I audibly sighed in relief whenever I came across a previously marked room, as it assured me that I was headed in the right direction. 75%. It took me several hours to initially solve it, and I now had to reach the start of the maze in a fraction of that time. The increase in movement speed certainly helped, but not as much as I would have hoped. 30%. I could have sworn that the meter was decreasing faster the further I got. It was as if the place didn't really want me to leave and was just toying with me making me think that I stood a chance at escaping. 5%. I was panting even though I wasn't the one actually running. I was so close, but evidently not close enough. As I turned a corner and headed down what I presumed to be the penultimate stretch, I saw that there was another asset blocking the claustrophobic passage. It was one of those old, bulky TV sets, which projected a static image of the same warped face as before. It was pointed right at me, expecting me. Zero percent. Uh-oh. The disembodied, enthusiastic voice announced, You've really gone and done it now. The one thing that Henry hates more than guests are guests who outstay their welcome. But not to worry. Suddenly, a loud thump shook the window next to my desk. My blood ran cold. I swallowed the proverbial lump in my throat and slowly turned my head towards it. There was a dark hand pressed against the glass. It was followed by another, and then another, all reaching in from different angles, until all I could see were various sized palms grasping at the flat pane, applying more and more pressure against it. Henry will just have to pay you a visit instead. Henry could always use more red paint. I fell out of my chair just in time as the window practically exploded. Glittering shards scattered across my bedroom. Terrified, I rolled onto my hands and knees, propelling myself up to my feet before bolting for the door. A tsunami of hopelessness crashed against me as I soon as I emerged onto the other side. I was no longer in my apartment. Stretching before me was a branching, crimson corridor. This wasn't a game anymore. Or if it was, I was the entertainment. Something grabbed the back of my sweatshirt. I squirmed away, leaving it in my pursuer's grasp. I ran, I screamed, and I pleaded. I barreled through the identical rooms and interrelated passages desperate to evade the imminent presence that followed my every step. I glanced back for only a second, which was enough to refuel my panicked frenzy, as what I saw will haunt me until the day I die. A cluster of elongated limbs ending with human-shaped hands. Using them, it crawled forth like a centipede. At the center of the flailing mass was that face. Although its deep frown was now an impossibly wide grin filled with straight teeth, its eyes had become two circular voids. They trembled with excitement the closer it drew. This was it, I thought. There was no way that I was getting out of this alive. My legs were bound to give out sooner rather than later, and I was in no state to assess where I was going. Whatever that grotesque monstrosity was intending on doing to me, I just hoped that it was quick. I was on the verge of surrendering my fate when my salvation appeared before me in the most unlikely and yet ironically fitting form. A red door. 
It blended so seamlessly with the walls that I saw only its outline, but it was there nonetheless, my way out. I mustered what remaining endurance I had and charged towards it. My lungs were on fire. I couldn't feel my calves anymore. It was like I was running on stilts. I shut my eyes and threw myself against the door, spilling onto the wet asphalt beyond it. My shoulder and elbow absorbed the brunt of the impact. Thankfully, it wasn't my skull. Still high on adrenaline, I snapped my head back. The door was gone. There was only concrete stained with old graffiti. I rubbed my bleeding elbow and steadily rose back up, then looked around. I was in the abandoned car park across from my apartment complex. The one that I used as inspiration for the first level I ever created. The morning sun shone through the gap in the outer wall. I broke down crying then and there. It was over. Against all odds, I had somehow survived and made it home. It was too good to be true, and, well, as it turns out, it was. I stepped out into a world that I quickly realized isn't my world. The differences are subtle, but they are there, chief among them being my own mother not knowing who the hell I am. She'd apparently never had a son. Alex threatened to call the cops on me after I repeatedly showed up at his school to try and talk to him. In his defense, if some random guy walked up to me and told me that they were my best friend from another timeline, I'd probably react the same. Things haven't been easy for me as you can probably guess. I spent two years sleeping on park benches and diving through dumpsters, even turned to drugs to cope with the overwhelming trauma and loneliness. I can't say that things are all well and good now, but I do have a roof over my head, which is an improvement. I don't think I'll ever be able to live a normal life, but I am trying. Hence me writing this. I don't want to be alone anymore, and the internet is the only place where I can talk about this without worrying that I'd be thrown in a padded cell. You don't have to believe me. I wouldn't believe me either, but hey... Thanks for reading anyway. There's one thing in particular that I can't stop thinking about. That creepy voice called me guest 185, which implies that there were 184 guests before me. Did I escape into the reality of some other version of me that got inadvertently sucked into that place as well? You know what? Come to think of it, I don't really want to know. Do you know what a tumor smells like? Oranges. Not ripe ones. Rotten. The type you bite into and immediately regret it. I realized there was something not quite right with me when I smelled oranges on my kindergarten teacher. I made sure to tell her every day. I'd walk in and catch the same stink in the air. Miss Weller was in her mid-thirties and always greeted me with a bright smile. When she opened her arms to pull me into a hug like every other morning, the smell was intoxicating, and when I wrinkled my nose and tried to sniff it out and find the source of rotten oranges, it hit me that it was Miss Weller's head that smelled, not her hair. Her hair always smelled of lavender and strawberries. No, it was what was inside my kindergarten teacher's head, right inside her skull. I knew something was wrong told her one day. When the other kids were playing in the playground, I ran over to where she was bent over her flower garden, planting roses, and smiled widely. Your head smells of bad oranges, I said, and Miss Weller looked shocked for a moment before laughing it off and telling me to go and play. But you do, I said. You smell of bad oranges. The teacher settled me with a smile. Well, I haven't had any oranges. What do you mean, Mina? I didn't know what to say, because how was I supposed to describe it? You just smell, I whispered. A few months later, Miss Weller stopped coming to school. 
and I learned from listening in on my parents' hissed conversation that my kindergarten teacher was very sick. It wasn't long before she passed and her flower garden was abandoned. I still went there to see if I could still smell the rotten oranges, but the only smells were the roses and lavender planted for her. I guess I should preface this by saying, I've had a strange sense of smell my whole life. When I was 14, I was sitting in my middle school cafeteria talking to my friends, when I was attacked with the sudden aroma of chicken, which was so potent in my nose and throat, I thought I was going to throw up. I didn't, thankfully. But Olivia Lennox, who had been sitting across the table from me, suddenly choked on a chicken drumstick. I remember her body face down on the table in a halo of willowy blonde hair as Mrs. Michaels attempted the Heimlich maneuver in CPR to a lunch full of traumatized kids. We were all expecting the chicken bone to fly out of Olivia's mouth like in the movies, but when Olivia Lennox stopped making spluttering noises, and a teacher pressed her ear to the girl's light pink t-shirt before jumping up and telling us all to stand back, I knew she was gone. Olivia had been talking about summer vacation before she died. She was excited to go to Italy. Reality is different from the movies. It's a whole lot more cruel. When people are destined to die, they actually die. The end. I bet you wish you had a way to know when your time is up. People see it as a blessing so they can complete their bucket list and enjoy life to the fullest. When it's not your date, however, it's different. I suddenly had the power to know how strangers and loved ones were going to die just by the smell coming off of them, and yet my own death was a mystery. It made me wonder if I was dying too. Maybe I was connected with recently dead souls, as well as souls who were going to die soon, but according to my doctor's checks, I was healthy. There was nothing wrong with me, so what was happening to me? The sense I caught didn't always match how someone was going to die. Olivia was a rare occasion when it actually did. It didn't happen all the time. I managed to live a fairly normal life up until my teenagehood. People die and it's normal. That's what I thought to myself at least. After I caught the smell of popcorn and caramel when I walked past a little girl. Or on the way home from school when the mailman greeted me with a smile and I was suffocated with the smell of moldy cheese. I never saw a countdown or a time limit, or anything to suggest when people would die. I just knew they were going to. The mailman's death was in the newspaper several days later. He'd been struck by a drunk driver and killed instantly. As for the little girl, six-year-old Ellie Chambers had drowned in the local swimming pool. I couldn't do anything about them. I considered it, but then I realized how crazy I'd sound if I ran up to some random person and told them they were going to die. Not just that, but I knew from their smell, I'd be labeled crazy. I learned to ignore it, as selfish as that sounds. I finished high school with decent grades and planned to go to college. I didn't exactly have specific goals or a college or a major. I guess I was winging it. I wanted to see the world and distract myself from the suffocating smells. I was at our senior bonfire when I first got the whiff of gas. I was maybe two beers down and was already feeling it. We were all sitting around a raging fire and drunkenly singing and exchanging memories from our four years at Bellevue High School. When I smelled it again, it was suffocating. A sharp, intense stink turning my stomach. I was suddenly all too aware of my classmates around me. Their faces lit up in orange, wide smiles and glazed over eyes. I panicked. I mean, anyone else would panic if they had the same sense of smell. I jumped up from where I'd been sandwiched between my best friend and boyfriend and stumbled over to the cooler of drinks, grabbing bottles of water. The others didn't seem to notice me. Enveloped in some story one of the cheerleaders was telling everyone. The smell was ready to turn over my stomach, and I was swallowing down the taste of beer creeping back up. 
I doused the fire with trembling hands, and I didn't stop pouring water into flickering orange flame until a warm hand was wrapped around my wrist. Mina? My boyfriend's voice was white noise compared to the screech in my head. I didn't notice I was crying until the empty bottle of water slipped from my hands. I waited for someone to die. I waited for one of the cheerleaders to trip and fall, or a guy to start vomiting blood, but nothing happened. I was led back to my seat and I was trembling. The fire hadn't been completely put out, but some kids were complaining, jumping to their feet and announcing they were going to get firewood. I kept to myself for the rest of the night, waiting for a death, and when one didn't come, I found myself filled with both confusion and relief. On the way home, I fell in and out of sleep, my head bumping the window of my best friend's car. The radio was playing mellow pop songs and my friends were talking about college admissions and a movie recently released they wanted to go and see. I remember joining in the conversation, laughing along with them, and reveling in the relief flooding me. Nobody was dead. I caught the scent of someone who was going to die, and I made sure to count everyone in our class before I left. They were all there, all smiling and happy and definitely not dead, so... The question haunted the back of my mind, despite me shaking it off and trying to be positive, trying to believe that I was finally rid of the stupid curse. Who was going to die? As we neared my parents' house, the question wouldn't leave me alone. So much so that I suddenly felt like I was going to be sick. It came over me like a wave of ice water, knocking the breath from my lungs. I couldn't breathe. Suddenly, my chest heaving, my heart in my throat. I was lying face down in the back of my friend's car when she jumped in the back and wrapped her arms around me in a hug so tight, I thought my heart was going to burst out of my chest. In the corner of my eye, I saw flashes. Blue and red flashes blurring into one. My friend was sobbing into my shoulder, dampening my sweater, but I couldn't concentrate on her words. They weren't fully going in. I heard accident and car, and all of me splintered apart. I'd known it was coming. That was all that went through my mind. That same tumultuous thought. It was driving me crazy. I had smelled my mother's death and couldn't stop it. How though? That's what I keep asking myself even today. How could I have known that the smell of gas had equaled my mom wrapping her car around a stop sign? That's the worst thing about whatever this is. It lets me know someone is going to die. It's up to me to join up the dots. I was through joining up dots after my mom died. I got whiffs of people and stayed the hell out of it. I distanced myself from dad. I know it wasn't my fault mom was dead, but I felt responsible knowing I could have stopped it. So I got out of town at the age of 19. I started college but dropped out three months after making friends with a boy called Caleb. He was the oddball in class and kept to himself and his drawings. I asked him to hang out one day, and we ended up going back to his dorm and binging Game of Thrones. He was my first real friend, and really the first person I'd connected with and allowed myself to get close to. I was hanging out in his dorm room helping him pick out sketches for an art competition. Caleb was an amazing artist. We were laughing over something trivial when he leaned over me to grab a brush, and I smelled it again. It wasn't as strong as before. More of a hint when I inhaled deeply to make sure. Rotten oranges. The aroma brought back memories of flower gardens and a sweet woman's smile. I couldn't go through that again. Not with Caleb. Stupid Caleb with his dorky grin and obsession with studio Ghibli movies. I dropped out of college the second I left his dorm. That rancid smell following me. I made sure to text him to see a doctor, and then I deleted and blocked him. I know it sounds cruel. It is cruel. 
But you have to understand I can't bear to be around people I know are dying and can't stop it. I don't know how to stop it. Even if Caleb gets help and somehow survived it, the smell doesn't go away. I like to think because the smell wasn't as potent. Maybe there was a chance Caleb could have survived. I've never had the heart to check after abandoning him. So here I am five years later. I moved to the city, got an apartment. Not exactly five stars, but it works. You're here for the title, so I'll get to the meat of it. Please bear in mind I will be changing the names of everyone mentioned to the characters in Bram Stoker's Dracula. Because I can't think of aliases, and I really don't want to reveal names. I'm not the best at social interactions, so when a work friend dragged me to a random party without specifying it was a party, she called it Gathering of Talented People, which I could understand since we were in the capital. Well known for talented people, or pretentious art students who live off of daddy's buck. Anyway, the party was in some warehouse apartment which was on the shadier side of the city, so naturally. I started to get wary in the Uber ride there. I hadn't spoken for most of the ride, more interested in my Duolingo lesson. I was on a four week streak. Where exactly is this party? I leaned over to my friend Calliope, shouting into her ear over the screamo on the radio. Luckily she wore enough perfume to drown out the scent she might be harboring. I'd initially been cold to her when we first met. I didn't want to get attached to anyone. Calliope, however, had a certain charm, an energy I couldn't say no to. She absorbed all positive energy and most of the time she drives me mad, but I love her. Unlike me, she was an actual college student and worked part-time at the antique store I'd found solace. There were almost no customers and the people who did come in were either rich kids looking for something sparkly or middle-aged women with insane stories to tell. The kinds of stories I could turn into books if I knew how to write properly. Man, the things I've learned. One woman once told me she was abducted by aliens who used her blood for glue. She was completely serious. Relax. Calliope was already high flirting with the uber driver, who was more interested in her cleavage. It's just around the corner. Really? Pressing my face against the window, I squinted into the night. Blurs of colors from passing apartments and clubs dancing in my eyes. The city at night was my favorite. I liked that my thoughts were drowned out by booming music and screaming, and everyone's individual smells came together in an intoxicating mix I couldn't untangle. When the Uber pulled up to a towering apartment building, I knew I'd made a bad decision following Calliope to the so-called gathering. When I jumped out of the car though, smoothing down my skirt and trying to brush down the frizz in my hair, I noticed very official looking security guards standing at the door. Calliope grabbed my arm with an excited squeal. See? I told you this was a fun idea. I tipped my head back and frowned at what looked like a rooftop party. That looks like more than a gathering. I shot my friend a skeptical smile. Calliope rolled her eyes. Okay, more than a gathering. You win. But cool, right? Yeah, cool. I nodded. But I was thinking about being in a confined space with strangers who no doubt had sense that I didn't want to know. If I could stay outside, that would be my best bet. Or I could plug my nose. When Calliope waved two slips of paper in my face, I had to squint to read the blocky font. Invitations. The two of us hurried past the security guards after flashing our invitations. Calliope with a grin, and me waving it in the air awkwardly. When they waved us in, I had to bite back a hiss of excitement. I'd never been to this type of party. Invite only seemed so exclusive. When we were presented with four flights of stairs, I started to trudge up them, sticking to Calliope's side as she danced up each step in her heels. I could hear the thrum of music getting progressively louder, shaking the building. Who cares? 
Calliope was out of breath. She twisted around to grin at me, panting. I scored them from a guy in my English class. He got a ticket for Dua Lipa and gave us them for free. I realized how out of shape I was when I found myself fighting for my breath. Lucky him. She grabbed me and pulled me up the last few steps, the two of us dragging ourselves to a wooden door spray painted with graffiti. I expected a more exclusive way in, like a secret passageway. Or a what's the password guy behind the door. But it was good enough. I could already smell stale pizza and beer, so it was going well. As long as the party was suffocated in smells I couldn't place, I would be okay. The trick was not seeking out the stink. The door opened, and we crashed through into a rooftop pool party. The crowd already moving under fluorescent lights, which danced in my eyes. Music blaring, and it was perfect. The only smells were the overbearing stink of cologne mixed with chlorine from the pool. Calliope nudged me. Mingle. She shouted in my ear before bouncing off to greet a couple of college kids waving colored party cups. I started to follow her but stopped myself. Calliope and her friends were third year English lit students. What would we talk about? She had often expressed that her class were pretentious assholes. And I'd seen it in person when a guy who had come to hang out with her, and then proceeded to go on a three-hour rant about how Midsummer was spiritual and had changed his life. When Calliope had teased him, I thought he'd laugh along and call himself out, but he was completely serious. Unsurprisingly, I glimpsed him among the others surrounding Calliope. Something told me he wouldn't appreciate my lack of knowledge of Ari Aster and A24 movies. I was told to mingle, so I tried. I joined a conversation between two girls who were both talking in Gen Z speak, so I just smiled and nodded and acted like I understood. Moving towards the open bar, I grabbed a drink and found a spot on the side of the pool, dangling my legs in illuminated water rippling over my toes. The smell of chlorine masked everything else and it was comforting. I watched the party go on around me in a blur of colors and skin enveloping together, and I was content. The pool stayed empty to my confusion. It was warm enough for a midnight swim, and yet I watched girls and guys edge around it like it was filled with poison. If I had a swimsuit and Calliope's confidence, I would have happily dove in. I glimpsed familiar faces swimming around in the crowd. B-list Twitch streamers and YouTubers. The party was pretty chill though. It seemed like everybody knew everybody and were in some artistic profession. I was just happy to inhale pool fumes for the rest of the night. I mean, that's what I thought. After an hour of sitting in the same spot choking on chlorine and staring at the pool like I was in some crazy trance, I realized my best friend wasn't getting bored. I could vaguely hear her laughing loudly with her friends. I pulled out my phone to check the time, and was hit in the face with that bird notification. I closed the app halfway through my Duolingo lesson, and he wasn't happy, sending me urgent notifications. After a quick glance at the time, which was closing on midnight, I trudged through the last three questions. I was frowning at the screen struggling to make out a Japanese phrase when a laugh sounded from behind me. I thought it was at someone else, so I ignored them when they laughed again. Is that Duolingo? The smell of spice and cinnamon suddenly hit me, and I turned to find a guy around my age holding a bright red apple. Not like he was going to eat it, more like he'd brought it to the party as an accessory. The fruit looked good, Juicy and suddenly tempting enough to reach out and snatch it from him. I wasn't sure what to stare at. His face, which I vaguely knew, or the apple. He'd been on TV, or maybe a movie I'd seen. I couldn't place a name, though. The guy stood out away from the crowd and brandished a white shirt which clung to him in all the right places. A pair of Ray-Bans pinning back dark brown bedhead. He was hot, 
and he looked pretty out of it. I didn't know if it was drugs, or maybe he'd taken a nap. Bruises shadowing his eyes. I didn't know what to say except, what's with the apple? He raised a brow. What's with the impromptu Duolingo lesson? It's fun, I said pocketing my phone. Well, so is holding an apple. I expected him to leave, taking the smell of spices and autumn leaves with him, but instead he hovered awkwardly still grasping the apple. I figured breaking the ice would be a good idea. Instead of the two of us standing together with him not saying anything, and me choking on his scent. He had a good scent though, like someone had captured the smell of fall, petrichor, and crushed leaves. You're... Uh, I racked my brain for a name. That guy. He smirked. Oh, that guy? Yeah. Yeah, I'm that guy. How did you know? I scrambled to correct myself. No, I meant... It's Ren. He said, the muscles in his face twitching into a smile. I can go by that guy too. Ren was a joker, but after the first few awkward jokes which didn't land, he grabbed a seat next to me and talked about everything from his favorite video games to the time he'd gotten food poisoning from bad shellfish. He was the type of guy who could keep you embroiled in a story which wasn't going anywhere, or a joke which had died halfway through because he was too busy laughing to properly tell it. An extrovert at his prime. Ren was choking on whatever cocktail he'd grabbed a drink. Halfway through telling me about his childhood dog when a shadow suddenly loomed over the two of us. Ren glanced up, his mouth curved around the straw on his drink. There was a girl hovering over us looking less than impressed. In her hand was a drink, and at first I thought she was going to throw it over him. But she took a delicate sip from the straw, offering me an awkward smile. She was beautiful, and I mean beautiful and didn't have to try. She wasn't wearing anything special, a low-cut t-shirt over shorts, and yet flaunted them effortlessly. When I drank her in, she looked half asleep, blinking at Ren through half-lidded eyes. She had bed hair too, a crown of dark curls framing her face. The girl had the faint smell of mint, nothing bad, just toothpaste I think. Are you an idiot? She reached out and grabbed Ren's wrist, pulling him to his unsteady feet. We've got to go, now. The girl had an urgency in her tone, and from the sudden look in Ren's eyes, like he was waking up from a trance, he nodded. Right. Fuck. Are we good? To my confusion, he tipped his head back, his gaze going to the sky. What time is it? Nearly midnight. She said in a hiss of breath, and nearly totality. Her perfectly made up eyes narrowed. Where's the apple? My gaze went to the bar. She was right. The apple had disappeared. Fuck, he hissed. Ugh, this isn't good. Ren turned a shade of white I didn't know existed, his eyes skating the horizon. I followed his gaze to the pitch black sky. It was a starless night, a half moon poking from the clouds. Is everything okay? I stood up swaying slightly. Maybe it was the drinks I downed while talking to him, or social butterflies were contagious. Ren scoffed, pinching the skin between his brow. Oh man, don't even ask. Dude. The girl hit him with a scowl, though from the look in her eyes it was teasing. Can't we just... stay here? Leaning against the bar, Ren groaned, and I noticed his expression relax once more. We've got like five minutes. The girl shot him dagger eyes, before her gaze flicked to me. He's got a thing. I mean, we have a thing. And this, uh, this thing, it's important. Uh, no. Ren crossed his arms. We don't have a thing, Luce. The girl, or Luce, rolled her eyes. Right, my mistake. He has a thing which isn't with me. 
You really have a way with words. And you're three and a half minutes away from being screwed. Luce glanced at a fancy watch on her arm. Wait, no. Two and a half minutes. You don't have to count down. I told you this was a bad idea. She gritted out. But nobody ever listens to me. I said no parties. Relax, we're going. Who are you, my mom? The two of them fell into hissed whispering, and I glimpsed a bright red apple poking from her Louis Vuitton bag. So, these guys really liked their apples. In the end, Luce dragged him away. I followed, uncertainly, stumbling over myself. Are you guys good? I had to shout over the music. I shoved past party goers, suddenly mesmerized in Ren and Luce's business. Yeah. Ren nodded, but he kept nodding, like nodding would make everything better. He seemed fidgety and paranoid, suddenly his gaze snapping from the sky to the pool and back again. Luce pulled him back into the crowd, the two of them blending in with dancing bodies. It was nice meeting you, he shouted, yelping when Luce yanked him. Mina, right? Yeah. I was about to ask for his number, but he'd gone. The two of them swallowed into the dark. When I was left standing on the edge of the pool, my eyes found the sky once more. Slivers of white light bathing the clouds as a full moon slipped into view. I found myself transfixed by the sight. Before warm arms wrapped around me, beer breath tickling my ear in a curled slur. What's the number for Chinese takeout again? Calliope, whispering sweet nothings into my ear. I spent an hour that night in my bathroom, rubbing my best friend's back as she heaved up everything she'd eaten, mixed with a cocktail of vodka and beer. I let her crash on the couch and jumped into my own bed with a spinning head. I don't remember sleeping, only waking up at 10am to sunlight pouring through my windows, and the smell of pancakes. Calliope was a good cook especially when she was hungover. I scarfed down pancakes and headed to work. I'd only gotten maybe two feet out of the door before a Starbucks latte was shoved into my face, and behind that latte was a disheveled-looking Wren. He was still in the same clothes, crumpled and torn at the bottom, a checker jacket slung over his shoulder. This time his Ray-Bans covered what I had to guess were bloodshot eyes from either drugs or drink, or both. Morning, he said cheerfully, running a free hand through his hair. I noticed he wasn't alone, two figures standing close by. I recognized Luce's hair, though the other person was a mystery. Hesitantly, I took the coffee with a smile. It was still warm. You know where I live? Hmm? Oh, yeah, you told me last night. I was pretty sure I didn't. Maybe I did. The night was kind of a blur. Early morning coffee became the norm. Ren brought me coffee every morning, and that turned into a date where both of us were too awkward to speak. A second and third date where we got closer, and before I knew it I was spending the night at his apartment. I was introduced to his two friends, Luz, who I already sort of knew and Johnny, the mystery guy. Looks wise, he was opposite of Ren, short and stocky. While Ren's attributes were a sharp jawline, Johnny had a baby face, freckles dotting his cheeks, and a liking for baggy clothes. The three of them had a friendship, or a connection, I guess, that I didn't really understand. They didn't fit as a friend group, at least that's what I thought initially. Ren was the extrovert, always loud and joking around, while Johnny spent his time on his phone or listening to music, hiding under his hood. Luce was a mixture of the two. Sometimes she was loud and overly passionate, especially about musical soundtracks, but she also seemed like a dreamer, often caught in her own thoughts. The three of them were a good distraction from my usual dilemma. Smells. Though, as I got to know them, 
I realized there was something strange about them. I noticed Ren's room was weirdly empty, and his luggage was always packed in the back of his closet like he was ready to go somewhere. But he never did. I figured it was because he was traveling for work, but he never used it. Things started to get really weird a few weeks back. We went to a party, some fancy influencer party Johnny had been invited to, and it was pretty fun. I drank and talked to people like the usual party crap. Just didn't think anyone was out of the ordinary until I walked in on Ren closing the blinds. Johnny holding duct tape and Luce sticking tape over the windows. I'd heard their hissed whispers, domineered by Luce, her voice muffled with the roll of duct tape in her mouth. What exactly do we do when someone walks in? Ren climbed onto the counter and reached out, pulling the blinds closed. They're all probably too high to realize. It's just for a few hours. Because you insisted it would rain. Johnny, from his place sitting on the counter, his feet dangling, said with a sardonic smile. He grabbed an apple from a gold-plated fruit bowl and took a bite. And look, he said through a mouthful. Clear skies and we're stuck until sunrise. Johnny slipped on his Ray-Bans and leaned back, kicking his legs. He whistled. Fuck. They're really trying hard tonight. The bastard is strong. I backed away before they noticed me. Instances like that kept happening, and I started to wonder if they were scared of the moon. It made sense. They made excuses when I suggested going out on a moonlit night, and Ren always closed the blinds, the windows, and kept silverware including mirrors and anything with a reflective surface locked away in a cabinet. When I questioned him, he said it had all been passed down from a grandparent, but I'd seen a target price on the mirror, and the silverware definitely wasn't rusty enough to be that old. Though, things got weirder. As weeks stretched on, I started to smell... burning. I woke up in the middle of the night to the stink of smoke choking the back of my throat. But there was no smoke. There was no flame. Only the suffocating stink bleeding into my mind. It was just like the rotten oranges and the smell of gas. It was him. It was all over him, blanketing his body and mind, an ignition taking over him. Ren was burning. It wasn't the usual smell of burning, not what I was used to. The smell suffocated me until I couldn't breathe, raw and slicing. I sensed flesh bubbling and torn from bone, hair singeing from a blackened scalp. I felt it all. The overbearing heat prickled my skin, a silent scream ripping from my mouth. No, not my mouth. His. It's like I could sense him, imagine his body caught in an ignition of orange. Flailing arms and clothes slowly catching light and endless fire. The burning didn't stop. It didn't falter. It kept going, scorching him from the inside. Ren, though, was fast asleep. He couldn't smell the smoke or see the phantom flames. I got out of bed and found the bathroom, dousing myself in cold water. My hands were trembling. I waited for him to die, but... He didn't. When I went back to the bedroom, he wasn't in bed. Ren was sitting cross-legged in front of the wall. His eyes were open, but on seeing, as he scratched into the paintwork, his nails dripping red with the force of each stroke. I couldn't move, only watched as he sketched out a very rough drawing of a tree. It was beautiful. A large tree with strange symbols carved into its base. I only recognized what looked like a snake, which he finished with digging his bloody nails in further. When I was finally able to force my limbs into some kind of submission, I took slow steps towards him and found myself staring into pooling black. His eyes? They weren't his eyes. His expression twitched erratically, lips moving in a soundless language I didn't understand. 
Ren saw the carving the morning after. I know he did, but he ignored it, painting over the scratching. I did manage to get a photo. I'll try to upload it. The next day, Luce showed up at the door. Johnny was behind her, shouldering a backpack, and I caught the scent automatically. Hitting. Burning. They were burning too. I could see it, twisting orange and red writhing up and down Luce's squirming legs, her endless scream harmonizing with a monstrous wail. Luce said three words in a sharp shriek. They found us. They left me without saying a word, but I can still smell them. Five days have passed, and they're not back yet. The smell is still there, still lingering in a thick fog. It's not just the smell. I can feel something. Something deep inside me telling me that he's going to burn. Every day feels like I'm living in a dream, my thoughts tangled and cloudy. Yesterday, I screamed until my chest felt like it was collapsing, blood tainting my nose and lips and running fresh and hot down my chin. It came out of nowhere, a wail that I can still feel twisted inside me, locked into my throat. Every time I open my mouth, I'm afraid it will come out. I'm afraid I'll scream until I'm hollow, until I've lost all my breath. I've tried calling, but their phones are dead. I keep thinking. I mean, I've gone over it again and again in my head. They're supposed to die. So, why? Why does it feel different for them? Why does it feel like they're going to burn in an entirely different way? And whatever it is, I can't stop it. Like Miss Weller, my mom, and Caleb. I can't stop it. When I was little, we lived in the apartment right above my grandfather's shop. He was a tailor who, according to Dad, used to do quite well back in the day, before fines forced him to shut down. Something to do with the IRS and unaccounted revenue. My poor grandfather was beside himself. I overheard Dad telling Uncle Eddie that their father was just too old to keep up with the place, and too stubborn to give it up. Now, the once thriving staple of their childhood sat fully stocked and lifeless. Dad was forced to find other work, running through a string of jobs before settling for a sales position at some insurance company downtown. He hated it, and so did Mom. She became miserable over our new lifestyle. She started drinking a lot, something even my young mind had picked up on. Then Dad caught her cheating and, rather than trying to save the family, she decided to run off with the new guy. It was strange how fast everything had changed. One night, Mom was singing me to sleep and the next, I was all alone. Dad did what he could, but he too was in pain and unable to truly explain to his six-year-old daughter what was going on. That was when the night terror started. I'd wake to the sound of someone screaming, this bone-chilling screech that would pierce through my own shrieks from under the blankets where I'd hide. Sometimes I'd catch a glimpse of a woman standing in the corner of my bedroom, staring at me from behind a curtain of long, dark hair mouth agape. It sent me into hysterics. My dad's hurried arrival would soon become a tired routine. His frustration less subtle each time he listened to me rant on about the scream lady. He tried assuring me that my mind was making me see and hear things that weren't there, all because I missed mommy so much. He said that sometimes the things that make us sad on the inside had a way of coming out. This, of course, did nothing to make the screamy lady go away. She'd show up again and again, just as I was falling asleep. The neighbors must have hated me, and for a while, I worried that my dad might too. Between the shop closing, my mother leaving, my grandfather's steady decline, and the struggle to make ends meet, my dad was already going through enough. I didn't want to add to it, and I knew that I was. Dad wasn't sure what to do with me, nor was Uncle Eddie. 
who was kind enough to babysit from time to time so his brother could work the second job he so desperately needed. Therapy was too expensive. We tried changing my diet, changing my bedtime, leaving the lights on. None of it worked. The screams continued to wake me, knowing they were coming but not knowing when. I stopped sleeping altogether, which then began to affect the rest of my life. My behavior slipped, my grades plummeted, teachers were calling home in shock, wondering what had happened to me. My dad explained it away with the divorce, but he knew this problem wasn't going away. So he got creative. He made me a doll, one that loosely resembled my mother. It was shoddily made with scraps of old fabric that had long been sitting in the back room of the shop, but dad assured me that the doll was special and would watch over me as I slept. I wasn't receptive at first. Part of me was afraid of waking up in the middle of the night to find the thing screaming at me as I held it close to my face. I was pleasantly surprised when, on our very first try, I woke to a brightening pink sky. I'd made it to morning without any screams, peering into the dark corner to find nothing there. I hugged that doll so tight and never let go, going on to sleep with it far longer into my childhood than I probably should have. My dad, of course, was elated. We were both finally sleeping again. It didn't bother him that the doll needed its own dinner plate, or that it had to be buckled into the back seat, or that I'd spend all day speaking to it as though I was the mother and the doll was me. Dad would sometimes pretend to not know which one was me and which one was the doll, a gag I thoroughly enjoyed. I teased back that the Lila doll was always wearing the same outfit, so he brought up more fabric for me to look through, smiling as he sewed to the sounds of my excitement. When I asked Dad if he could also get the Lila doll a backpack and shoes, he laughed. But then a light went off in his head. A thought about turning this into something big. A fully customizable doll with an array of attachable accessories. Fun enough to play with during the day, but soft enough to be held through the night. He pitched the idea to Uncle Eddie, who was immediately on board and probably desperate for a reason to get out from behind the supermarket cash registers. With my little Lila doll tucked under my arms, I'd creep out of bed some nights to find them tirelessly sewing or debating business plans far above my head. They made deals with local retailers and even went door to door, selling whatever they could in hopes of one day bringing the corpse of their father's shop back to life. It wasn't long before we were changing the modest, black sign from Vinnie's tailor shop to a loud pink and blue that read the Lila door store. It was crazy how quickly our lives changed. Lila's dolls sold faster than we could make them, and before we knew it, we were opening up a second store in the South Shore Mall. Dad moved us into a much nicer place, a house overlooking the hills of our downtown, the lights of the city shining into my bedroom window. I'd never seen him so happy, Certainly not since my mother had left. When I asked if this meant she would come back, he got very stern and said no. A sharp and definitive refutal. I thought I'd done something wrong, and he must have felt bad because he softened his tone and apologized, telling me about how his mother had left him too, and that he knew how difficult it was growing up without a mommy. It would be okay, he said, because... Now he had me. I smiled as he tucked me in and kissed me goodnight, trying my best to swallow how deeply I missed my mother. When Grandpa passed later that year, I held my breath at the thought of her attending the funeral. It felt wrong anticipating such a thing at that time, as Dad was more upset than I'd ever seen him. Many people, most of whom I did not know, were stopping by the house for lengthy visits distant family, or friends of my grandfather. Even some loyal customers of years past who'd grown to care for him, telling tales of the work Grandpa had done to save their weddings and such. 
Dad accepted their sympathies as warmly as he could, as well as the never-ending onslaught of food he'd tasked Uncle Eddie with stuffing into our fridge somewhere. Uncle Eddie had been staying with us during that time, and was trying to remain busy to keep his mind off this new reality of his. It was hard seeing my ever-jolly uncle so lost and empty. With so many people showing up over the course of that week, no one batted an eye when we received knocks on our door late one night, but the concern in Uncle Eddie's voice when he called up to Dad got me out of bed and peeking from around the wall to atop the staircase. My Lila doll laying limp in my hand. It was my mother. She stood in the doorway with her arms crossed and a knowing smirk plastering upon her face. I gasped and dropped the doll, my dad snapping back at the sound and ordering Uncle Eddie to take me back to my room. I cried for my mother as Uncle Eddie marched me up the stairs and carried me away. She wouldn't look at me, just kept her eyes on dad who was ushering her outside. I hurried to the window while Uncle Eddie stood awkwardly by, unsure whether or not to stop me. I could hear their muffled voices spitting back and forth at one another. She was demanding something, putting my dad on the defensive, but about what, I wasn't sure. He told her to leave and then slammed the door in her face. I watched her turn around and head back into the night, crying out for her still even as she disappeared down the driveway and out of sight. When dad came to check on me, I shouted at him for the very first time. I didn't understand why he wouldn't let me see her. All he could say was that he was sorry, which wasn't enough for me. I continued to shout when he suddenly snapped. The look on his face, I'd never seen it before. Even Uncle Eddie looked down at his feet. Dad spat that mom was poison, and that seeing her would only cause me harm, that one day I'd understand. He then ordered me to bed and that was that. But I couldn't sleep. Not that night, or the next. I'd stare out my window, waiting for mom to come back. And when she didn't, I started to slip again. I started hearing the screams. Dad was frantic. All the progress we'd made, lost. I remember him taking me into the shop early one morning, holding my hand as he showed me around the back room where countless boxes of accessories sat waiting to be put on display. He told me I could pick one for my Lila doll, anything I wanted. It was like Christmas, I wanted all of them. When I couldn't decide, he allayed my stress by promising me that I could choose one new accessory every time another shipment came in. Within weeks, my Lila doll was a whole new girl, donning sunglasses and a bright yellow shirt, with a pretty little bow on top. I pressed each new accessory onto her like the band-aids they were. As I got older, the power of the doll faded but my need for her remained. She sat on the shelf and watched as I snuck booze into my bedroom. My new remedy for nightmare-driven insomnia, one that, fortunately, would not last very long. The mere thought of vomiting into my toilet one more time was enough to make me sick. I knew I had to change, to find some other way to feel okay. My best friend knew it too. She dragged me with her to the animal shelter where she volunteered. It was there that I finally found some semblance of peace. I couldn't believe how much of an immediate impact it had on me. I started volunteering on my own days after school. Still, Lila dolls remained a big part of my life. At 15, I got my first job working weekends at both stores, filling in whenever I was needed. Kids at school would make fun of me. They all knew I was the doll girl. It didn't bother me. I took pride in my ability to run the store and in my knowledge of the products we sold. As graduation drew nearer, dad gifted me a managerial opportunity for the shop. I didn't know how to tell him I didn't want it or that I'd applied to a university several states away, with dreams of working in wildlife conservation. All that he had done for me 
It hurt me to hurt him. To turn him down and abandon the empire he'd built for me. I cried when I finally told him. But he wasn't mad or even upset. He lifted my chin so I could see his smile and then pulled me in for a hug. As we rocked gently back and forth, he whispered to me that it was okay to chase the thing that silenced my demons. He let go but kept his hands on my shoulders, gazing at the young woman I was now. There was something else in his eye, an understanding of what I was going through, of everything I had been keeping from him. It all tempered with that one look. When I left for school, my Lila doll stayed behind because I didn't need her anymore. The next few years were like a dream. I loved my classes, my friends, the views from my dorm for the mountains I hiked every weekend. I even met a guy, Caleb. His friends called him Texas, something you understood the moment he spoke. He sat next to me in an ecology class, but spent more time studying me than he did his material. He laughed when I told him I was practically famous, so I told him to look up Lila dolls. He was stunned. From that moment, he began calling me Lila doll, something I pretended to hate, and we were dating not long after. Everything seemed to be falling into place for me, and for the first time in my life, I was happy. And then I got the call. Dad was sick. Cancer. It was awful how fast it took him, how rapidly he deteriorated before my eyes. I dropped out of school to take care of him, and within months he was gone. I could hardly look at him in the end. One of the last conversations we'd had, he'd taken my hand from the hospital bed in which he was bound, begging me to remember the man I knew him to be. I promised I would, my savior. The day he passed, I sat in my old room, waiting for him to come comfort me like he always did. It was just me now and my Lila doll up on the shelf where I'd left her. She looks so different now than when I first got her, adorned in the very many accessories I'd collected over the years. The sunglasses still fixed upon her face. Her bright yellow shirt now torn and faded. I held her close like I used to, curling into a ball at the foot of my bed. It was the closest I could get to my dad being there. I never finished school. Dad left me his share of Lila doll and with just four semesters left, I decided to run the stores instead. Caleb was supportive throughout the whole thing, as was Uncle Eddie who, of course, knew a whole lot more about how to run the business than I did. I picked up on it quick. The hardest part was being enveloped around a permanent and painful reminder of my dad. It wasn't any easier when that pain went away. I didn't even notice when it happened. I just woke up one day and went to work, carrying on with my new routine. Paid the bills, watched TV, ordered takeout, laughed without remorse and cried about other things. Things really took off after Caleb moved in. Within a year, we were engaged, married, and announcing our pregnancy to a room full of what was almost entirely Caleb's loved ones. He could sense the hurt I was holding inside, but was too kind to challenge me on my weak assurances. I'd sometimes catch his eye from across the room, gauging my demeanor, so I'd bury the pain deeper. None of it would matter after one cold February morning. Sophia Grace was born healthy, beautiful, and perfect. It took some time for me and Caleb to adjust to our new lives as parents. I loved being a mom, but it was exhausting. Even with all the help from my amazing husband, not only was he running around for me and the baby, he was also looking after the stores in my absence. It was a lot. He'd try so hard to pitch in when he got home, but was almost always the first to fall asleep. I couldn't fault him. I was used to functioning on limited sleep. Most nights I'd stare down into my little girl's crib, studying her unconscious twitches until I was finally ready to drift off myself. 
Caleb caught me one time just as the sun was beginning to come up. I lied and said I had just woken up. He continued to not push, instead retrieving my old Lila doll and placing into the crib beside Sophia. The sunglasses were stuck permanently askew and the faded yellow shirt was becoming unstitched. Caleb joined me in admiring our daughter, wrapping his arms around me and assuring me we were safe. He then smacked me on the butt and said I should get some sleep. I wasn't out long before I heard it. A shrill, violent scream. It shot me awake and sent me into the kind of frenzy I hadn't experienced since I was a child. Caleb came rushing back into the room in a panic, checking first on Sophia, who was now awake and crying. Shaking, I asked Caleb if he heard the screams. He looked at me bewildered and said only the babies and mine. This was his first experience with my night terrors, and I think I'd frightened him more than it did me. I had no idea why they were happening again. I just knew it was finally time to open up to Caleb about my long history with the screamy lady. He put Sophia down and held me close, rubbing my back as I sobbed and poured it all out. Once I was settled, he told me he knew what I needed to do. I needed to confront my mother. I had no idea where she was, and hadn't seen her since that night she showed up to our door. Neither had Uncle Eddie. Caleb dropped it for a while and continued to support me as best he could, trying to hide how much he, too, was plagued by the situation, a disposition I knew all too well. I worried it might tear us apart when, much like Dad had almost 20 years prior, and in the very same room, in fact, Caleb turned to me with excitement, the light bulb in his head shining brightly upon his face. He suggested I submit my DNA to an ancestry website to track down traces of my mother's existence. There was a part of me that rejected the idea, this little pocket of fear that didn't want me to get my hopes up, but Caleb insisted, because he is the most wonderful man I know, and because my bouts of screaming in the middle of the night were scaring him more than he would admit. I was told I could expect my results in no less than eight weeks. When they finally arrived, I was afraid to look at them. Caleb came home and found me in the living room feeding Sophia. The envelope on the table before me. I'd run out of nails to bite. He opened it for me, my stomach sinking as I watched his eyes dance along the pages when he suddenly stopped and grinned. I had a half-sister. Rachel and I messaged back and forth on the website before agreeing to meet in person. She actually lived nearby. I wondered how often we might have passed each other without realizing it. She invited me over for coffee and was very excited to meet, waving at me from her doorstep before I even stepped out of the car. She, too, was married with three kids, as was evident from the state of her home, something I found endearing. Sophia was still only an infant, and I was already thinking about having more. It was strange noting the familiarities in Rachel's face as she spoke. Our eyes were especially similar. She told me that she'd always suspected mom was hiding something, and that she was not at all surprised to learn exactly who I was, given that mom would never allow her to have a Lila doll. Rachel described mom as conniving and manipulative, her father having filed for divorce after years of unhappiness. Now, mom only came around when she needed something. Rachel was happy to give me her address, but cautioned me to not expect very much from her. If only she'd known the scenario I'd played out in my head over and over. It flashed in my mind as I pulled up to mom's trailer later that very same afternoon. I sat frozen in my car for a while, anchored by the weight of this moment. There were people sitting in lawn chairs in front of the neighboring trailers, staring in my direction, increasing my nerves. I tried not to look at them as I marched up to my mother's door and gave two crisp knocks. My hands grew numb as I waited. The door opened and my mother was standing there with a cigarette in her mouth, looking just as sour as she did the last time I'd seen her. 
Only this time, I was close enough to see the work she'd had done to her face. It was not appealing. She blew smoke out her nose and asked who I was, and when I told her it was Lila, she continued to stare through me. Her daughter, I reminded her. She asked what I was doing here, and I wasn't sure how to reply. It felt stupid having to say out loud that I was just looking to see her after all these years, that I was hoping she'd want to see me too. She hardly reacted. Just took another drag of her cigarette. I informed her that she had a new grandchild. Taking out a photo for her to see, she glanced at it and scoffed, mumbling about how my dad must have been proud. When I told her that he died, she said she was sorry to hear it, and didn't even try to sound sincere. I could feel the soul being ripped out of me. I politely apologized for showing up like this and assured her I wasn't trying to be a burden. But I meant so little to her. I was less than a burden. I was an annoyance. An inconvenience taking her away from the daytime television she was blaring in the background. When I ran out of things to say, we stood in momentary silence. She broke it with a groan and wondered if I was going to give her the money or not. I had no idea what she was talking about. She said it was the least I could do given how successful the business was. That she deserved some credit for giving me my name. I suddenly understood why she showed up in the middle of the nights all those years ago. And why my dad never wanted me to see her. It was to shield me from the pain I felt in that moment. As spring rolled around, Caleb and I decided to throw a party. We both needed it. And there was still some family that had yet to meet Sophia. It was nice being able to turn our brains off while other people watched our kin. If anyone needed a drink, it was Caleb. I was more than happy to just sit back and bask in the glow of my new family. Watching them take turns with my sweet little girl. Her attentive eyes gazing out all the love she did not yet know she had. It had suddenly hit me how much I missed my dad. It really sneaks up on you in those moments. Caleb must have noticed because, after hurrying upstairs, he returned with my Lila doll in hand. I watched him wave it in front of Sophia's face, making it dance and playing peekaboo with the sunglasses. My mother-in-law stood by looking bemused. All of the brand new toys we'd been gifted, and he went with the ragged, old doll with the very noticeable stain. But it made Sophia smile, which made me break down. A hush fell over the room as I was constantly consoled by those around me. Caleb's sisters each rubbing my back while Uncle Eddie fetched me tissues. I always hated others' sympathy, but this time was different. This time was okay. The moment was interrupted by loud knocks on the door. Everyone looked around at each other as though trying to figure out which relative wasn't already present. Caleb announced the door was open, but the knocks rang a second time, loud and impatient. The playful confusion had quickly turned into concern. We all listened as Caleb answered the door trying to figure out whose voice was speaking to him from the other side. His curious cousins peeking from around the kitchen doorway suddenly parted, and my husband returned looking pale and serious. He said it was the FBI, and that they needed to speak with me about something. I could hear guests panicking in the background as I nervously escorted the two agents into the living room. They placed a folder onto the glass table and spread its contents across it. Crime scene photos. Reports. They were disturbing. Something I'd wished they had prepared me for first. But they were very direct. They told me that they believed Dad was a serial killer. One that they'd been hunting for nearly two decades. I was more than confused. I told them they were mistaken. Dad was a doll maker and a great father. They said that when I submitted my DNA to the Ancestry website, they were alerted to matches on over a dozen unsolved murders in the area. My arms were tingling. I couldn't speak. They went on to describe their struggle in putting together a profile of who they'd long called the South Shore Strangler. 
explaining how he'd chosen his victims seemingly at random. I reluctantly gazed upon the photos once more. All women. There was something familiar about them. One was wearing sunglasses. Another, a yellow shirt. Caleb appeared in the doorway with Sophia in one arm and my Lila doll in the other. When I figured it out, I screamed. This story happened five years ago, but it still freaks me out to this day. I'm a long haul truck driver. I've been doing it for most of my adult life. I love the freedom it provides. Out on the open road, not stuck behind a desk wearing a suit and tie. I would hate that. I prefer being by myself and getting to travel to new places. Anyway, on the night this incident took place, I had just stopped for the night to cross from a little diner right outside of middle of nowhere, Nevada. I figured I would grab a bite to eat before getting some sleep for the night. The diner was pretty empty, except for a guy leaning over what looked like a cup of coffee in the far corner, and a young couple in one of the booths. I grabbed a seat at the counter, setting my hat down in front of me. An older woman with permed red hair and thick coke bottle glasses approached me from behind the counter. She was holding a pot of coffee in one hand while the other hand was resting on her hip in a I'm too old and too tired to be doing this expression. What can I get ya? She asked in a very unenthusiastic tone. I'm, I'll take a club sandwich please. And a water. The overworked and underpaid waitress nodded and then headed over to the couple in the booth. The young woman was laughing her head off at something the guy had said. I turned my attention to the small TV with the antenna situated on top like a pair of rabbit ears. It was late night news and the reporter was covering a story most people had probably already read about online a few hours ago. Something about a missing prisoner. Yikes. I never thought much about the dangers of sleeping on the road until that very moment. I mean, I obviously always locked my doors and tried to park in a well-lit area. If there was one, but other than that, I had never really considered the inherent risks of sleeping in usually sketchy areas with just my flashlight for protection. I know truck drivers are usually thought of as big, burly, intimidating men, but I'm a normal height average build guy just looking to do my job. I picked up one of the little creamer cups out of the dish on the counter and started rolling it over in my fingers. The handsome reporter on the TV had handed things off to the even better looking blonde woman giving the winning lotto numbers. The door to the kitchen swung open and the waitress submerged with my food and drink balanced on one of those circular black trays. Thank God, I was starving. I hadn't eaten since early that morning, and that was just half of a Pop-Tart. Thank you, I said as she set the plate in front of me. Uh-huh. She muttered as she disappeared back into the kitchen. I had just taken a bite out of my sandwich when the lights overhead started to flicker. There was a faint buzzing noise that went along with it, like an overloaded wire. Well, that wasn't too surprising. This diner looked like it hadn't been upgraded since the 50s, with the ripped upholstery in most of the seats and the faded blue paint on the walls. It would be surprising to learn that this building's electricity still ran off vacuum tubes. I continued eating, not really caring why the lights continued their occasional strobing. I had begun to pull out the small, thin book of crosswords I carried around in the front pocket of my denim jacket when I heard the sound of the door opening and closing behind me. Two large men dressed in black suits entered the diner, both looking around before pointing in the direction of the man sitting by himself in the corner. I continued watching them as I ate. The man at the table was wearing a sweatshirt with a hood pulled over his head, his hands folded neatly on the table in front of him, like a man deep in prayer. It was hard to make out his expression because his face was obscured not only by the hood, 
but also from the long dark hair sweeping across the bridge of his nose past his chin. I swallowed, then took a sip of water as I watched the men in suits sit across from the hooded man. One of the suit guys was pointing a finger at the man, and then pointing the same finger up towards the ceiling. The hooded man continued sitting there, not moving a muscle. I finished off the rest of my food, and finished off the water in a tidy little gulp before standing up and fishing my wallet out of my back pocket. I peeled a $10 bill off the large bundle of ones and laid it on the counter. It was right as I put my hat back on and turned to leave that the lights went out again. Only this time, they stayed out. That's about the same time the waitress came crashing through the swinging door from the kitchen, screaming at the top of her lungs that she couldn't see. At first I thought that she was having a very dramatic reaction to the lights being out, but then I realized she actually meant something far worse. Blood was running from underneath those thick black glasses, onto the grease-stained apron which hung from her neck. God, help me! She screamed, running like a chicken with his head cut off. I was just about to lunge over the counter to help her when another scream shouted out from my right. This one was the young man that was sitting with his girlfriend. Only, he wasn't the one who was hurt. His girlfriend had collapsed onto the floor, violently convulsing on the ground as she started to foam at the mouth. Holy shit, somebody call 911, the young man shouted. He was kneeling next to the girl, cradling her head in his arms. Oh my god. I shouted as I sprinted through the front door of the diner. As I was running, I noticed the man that had been sitting in the corner. His hood was off, and he was standing now, as the two suited men lay by his feet. There was something horribly wrong about his face, but I couldn't tell exactly what it was in my hurry to get out to my truck. My phone was in there, and I needed it if there was any hope of getting these people help. I ran across the silent, empty street, and then slammed into my driver's side door. I frantically moved all my papers and empty wrappers around before finding my phone next to the seat. I dialed 911 and looked back across the street at the diner. My mouth dropped open as the dispatcher's voice said, Hello? Hello? Into my ear. The small building was completely engulfed in flames. Smoke was rising up into the night sky, obscuring the view of the stars. Against the backdrop of that orange fireball was the figure of a man, slowly walking towards me. I threw the phone into the truck and climbed into the driver's seat. I locked the doors and looked through the windshield. The man was gone. I pulled my keys out of my pocket with trembling hands and started the engine. I slammed my foot on the gas pedal and turned onto the road. That's when I saw him. He was standing in the middle of the street perfectly still, watching my truck as I drove away. Only this time I could actually see his face. And that is what still gives me nightmares to this day. His face was illuminated by the fire and I could see that the skin was pale white, paler than snow, and the eyes were even whiter than that. There were no eyebrows, and the lips were turned upwards into an awful sneer, exposing the rows of long yellow teeth within its mouth. I escaped that day, but I know he is still out there. It is still out there, and it may be coming for you next. I've been in a rough place lately. Last month I had to bury my older sister, Kennedy, after she'd lost her battle to brain cancer. I also quit my warehouse job a couple weeks ago as the daily verbal abuse was becoming too much to bear. Now, as a 24-year-old man living by himself in an apartment, the clock can only tick so much before the next rent cycle comes around. Kennedy's funeral wasn't cheap, and neither is my ongoing therapy. Stack inflation and the heavy cost of living in Vancouver on top of that, you've got a recipe for anxiety and unending worry. So, whether it was just placebo, or if it actually worked, 
I decided to try praying for the first time ever last night, but the response I got shook me to my core. I've never been a particularly spiritual guy. Both my parents were Presbyterian Christians, but they weren't the devout type that were at every Sunday service. They also didn't force Kennedy and I to read scriptures or pray with them. However, Kennedy always joined them without hesitation. Ever since I could remember, she was recounting all sorts of biblical tales and parables to me. I never really took them to heart, but I always found the details fascinating. My favorite was when she'd tell me the story of Noah's Ark because I was really into animals growing up. Fast forward to a year ago, and Kennedy's faith was as strong as ever. She was doing really well in her career and had started a beautiful family of her own before her diagnosis. We hung out every so often and detailed what had been going on in our individual lives. She was always incredibly rational and approached problems logically rather than purely out of faith. However, when we both were unable to solve a problem either of us had, she always said a word of prayer. Now, I didn't really believe in prayer, so I just kind of closed my eyes and waited for her to finish. I figured it was best that way anyhow, since I personally wouldn't want to feign religious faith just for the sake of it. However, her praying with me did help me feel a bit calmer and less stressed. Whether that's placebo or not, I don't know. But last night, I decided to give it a try myself. After all, I had put in dozens of job applications over the past couple weeks and haven't heard back from any of them. I felt almost compelled to reach out to a higher power at this point. I sat down on my bed, put my hands together, and started praying. Dear Heavenly Father, I reached out to you today from a place of unease and worry. I don't know where else to turn. It seems like my life is crumbling apart. I've already lost my loving sister, rest her soul. Bills are stacking up fast. Meals are becoming smaller and less frequent in my attempt to save money. I know I haven't come to you before, and I know that asking for your help may even be audacious of me, but if you can extend any signal that you are here and watching over me, please reveal it to me. Please let me know that there is some light at the end of the tunnel. A little glimmer of hope is all I need to push through right now. Thank you, and may you watch over me as I know you are watching over Kennedy. Amen. With that short prayer, I got into bed and scrolled through Instagram aimlessly until my eyes grew heavy. About half an hour later, I was asleep. I began dreaming heavily. I was inside my bedroom, and I was laying in the same position that I had gone to bed in. The moon was shining in through my bedroom window, dimly illuminating the rest of the room. I took a moment to look around before staring up at the ceiling for what seemed like eternity. This was pretty boring compared to the usual scenarios that played out. I wasn't running haphazardly from some unseen force, or drifting uncontrollably through the void of space. The mundane nature of the dream quickly changed when a sudden flash of light enveloped the entire bedroom. I was now stuck in a world where there was nothing but white. I was standing upright looking into a vast nothingness. I turned around and tried to notice anything that stood out against the blank backdrop. I began navigating aimlessly for what seemed like hours. I ran, jumped, hopped, and flailed around before finally growing tired and just sitting down on the blank ground beneath me. Suddenly. I saw a blue object off in the distance. I stood back up and focused on it. It was almost too small to perceive, but by this time I had gotten so used to pure white that a speck of dust would have stood out to me. The object got larger and larger as it drew closer. I realized that what I was observing was a small blue flame floating towards me. I watched in awe. It was as if this flame was entrancing me. It finally stopped at what I perceived to be a few feet in front of me. It began to speak in a pleasant, soft voice in the tone of what I would describe as a young woman. It was you who reached out to God earlier, wasn't it? It said slowly and calmly. I was shocked at the seemingly sentient blue flame that was talking to me. 
Yes. I stammered. Who might you be? I asked nervously. I am one of his angels. The voice replied with a reverberating echo. I came to you because your spirit is writhing in worry. The flame continued. I have descended on to you to be the signal you so fervently requested of the Lord a few hours ago. Even if it was part of a dream, this felt extremely surreal. Usually, whatever conversations that went on in my dreams were short, vague, and nonsensical when I experienced them. But this angel spoke with astounding clarity, making the moment extremely vivid. C can you help me? Is God able to help me? Is there any hope that I can get out of this predicament that I'm in? It seemed like forever before the flame began to emanate an echo, beginning its response to my question. No. I was shocked. What kind of answer was that? All across the board, there was no hope and no elaboration whatsoever. I began to shake as if I had drank too much coffee in one sitting. What do you mean? Has he no pity for me? Is it because I'm not a Christian? I asked hastily. Young one, you need not to be a Christian for the Lord to answer your prayers. I was confused now. So what's the problem? There has to be some reason why I'm not being acknowledged by him. And why does he need someone else to respond to my prayer? I was beginning to regain my composure as I engaged in further conversation with this angel. You are not acknowledged by God because nobody is acknowledged by God. The Lord abandoned humanity thousands of years ago. The voice said as calm as can be. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My anxiety began to creep up on me again. Where would Kennedy be if God abandoned his post? But... Humans were a species designed in God's likeness. The voice interjected. He considered them to be his crowning achievement. When he put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he would watch them with joy day after day as they carried out their lives. However, contrary to what the Bible says, it was not a snake or a devil or any other malevolent force that caused them to eat the forbidden fruit. This piqued my interest. What made them do it then? God created humans in his own likeness and as such granted them the same free will that he had since the moment they came into existence. The problem is, God is not an infallible, omnipotent being as you humans believe him to be. The voice grew softer in its projection. Sometimes things went wrong. Single-celled organisms were his first attempt at creating a sentient life form but their forms and functions were way off from what he had envisioned. He repeated his creation experiments for billions of years, creating life form after life form after life form. He got close to what he wanted when he formed primates, but even they did not meet his standards. When God finally created Adam and Eve, he thought he had finally done it. My mind was boggled at this point. I kept listening with uneasy interest. The Lord oversaw his greatest achievements as they wandered around the Garden of Eden, which he had generated especially for them. Adam and Eve had bore several children, and were carefree beings filled with happiness and joy. The garden was a huge expanse of lush, green forests and crystal clear waters. It was a paradise on earth that served as a home for the frolicking humans. However, one day, Adam and Eve stumbled upon a tree that bore a singular apple from one of its branches. This is where the snake descended and tricked Eve into eating the apple, right? I asked. No, the voice corrected me. The two of them laid eyes on the lone apple at the exact same time, and immediately sought to satiate their hunger with this fruit. It was at this point that a fatal flaw in God's development of humans made itself apparent. The voice paused. Greed overcame both Adam and Eve. Greed was an emotion that God did not anticipate to be a product of the human's free will. When God witnessed his perfect creatures clawing each other to death over the apple, 
He realized that the free will that had caused them to maul each other was the same free will that he possessed himself. Realizing that he was just as prone to sin as his supposedly perfect creations, the Lord went insane. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. God went... insane? A feeling of dread overwhelmed me as I awaited the angel's next response. Yes, the Lord shamefully retreated into obscurity and left us angels wandering the universe tormented by the fruitless prayers of Adam and Eve's descendants. Each and every one of you humans is descended from that ill-fated couple, and the evils of the world are spontaneously committed as a result of your flawed free will. None of us angels have the slightest clue where God went, or where he is at this moment. All we can do is listen to and address the cries of his perfect beings, who are more hopeless now than ever before. I didn't know how to process what I was hearing, let alone respond. If all this was true, then money was the least of my problems. Where's my sister? Where is Kennedy? I asked hastily. That depends, the disembodied voice replied as the flame flickered. It depends? On what? I was growing impatient. On whether an angel helped to escort her soul into the ethereal realm upon death. As I said, we angels were left without direction once the Lord abandoned us. The true among us try our best, but we are not omnipotent. We cannot have a hand in every human event, be it death, prayer, baptism, or anything else. Our numbers have waned and our divine will has wilted in the absence of God. Angels now occupy one of an infinite number of points on the spectrum of morality, just as humans do. Some stay true to their original missive instilled by the Lord. However, some prefer to do nothing and drift endlessly. Others have decided to dedicate themselves to nefarious activities in the absence of God's authority. The blue flame dimmed and the emanating voice grew somber. Have you seen your sister's apparition since she passed? No, I don't believe in such things. I answered. It doesn't matter what you believe. Apparitions are real and they exist. Contrary to what humans think, these beings are not evil or lost. They are merely the intermediate product of a human soul transitioning into the ethereal realm. Angels guide them as they complete this process. Once the apparition stage is complete, the soul melts away and ceases to be. No afterlife, no heaven or hell. Just on thinking, on feeling eternity. If you haven't seen your sister's apparition at least once following her passing, it means she never transitioned. So where is she then? I'm tired of your rambling. Are you not supposed to bring me comfort and peace? I yelled with tears forming in my eyes. No, quite the opposite, actually. The white nothingness around me went completely dark. The blue flame extinguished itself as I heard distant, guttural laughter coming from the darkness I was now in. I frantically look around and yell out, trying to locate this angel that I thought was going to help me. You see... I'm one of those angels that happens to be quite fond of tormenting you humans. A distant voice from my left announced. The voice relocated to my right. In fact, when I saw your sister hanging on to the last threads of her life, I was the first angel to lay claim to her spirit. I turned around with my fist balled up as the voice now tried to flank me from behind. I happen to know exactly where your sister is, and how she's doing. Do you want to see her? A voice tormented me. Show yourself. I don't care what you are. I'll kill you if you lay your hands on her. I was screaming at the top of my lungs with pure anger coursing through me. There was nothing but silence now. I stood still in the dark, waiting for the slightest indication that the angel was still there. My head grew numb and tinnitus rang in my ears as I focused on the unfathomably silent surroundings. 
The ringing stopped when I heard my sister's voice in the distance. Help me. I turned around to see Kennedy emerge from the darkness on all fours. She was naked and her head was forcefully rotated upside down. Her limbs were unnaturally long and her breathing was raspy and loud. The stench that filled the air was unbearable. Kennedy, or what was left of her, was looking around the endless darkness with rapid twitches of the neck and head before facing directly towards me. In the split second that I had locked eyes with her, a grin formed on her inverted face. Yellow, broken teeth made themselves fully apparent as her pupils shrunk with excitement. Kennedy lifted both her right arm and right leg in tandem, reaching forward before doing the same coordinated movement with her left arm and leg. She began crawling towards me on all fours at a gradually faster speed, her hands and feet making a sickening crunch sound with each step. She stopped right in front of me and stood up on her legs her face mere inches away from my own. She looked me in the eyes. I can't wait to see you again, brother. I woke up in a cold sweat. My heart was beating faster than I had ever felt it beat before. I was grasping for air, panning around the room for danger. Nothing. I lay awake, flinching at the slightest sound of the house settling or of animals rustling outside. I just closed my eyes, waiting in terror as my consciousness slowly drifted away back into sleep. Before I could fully knock out, though, I heard the bedroom door creak open. I finally found you, Kennedy said before the sickening crunching of her limbs returned. She got into my bed and I didn't hear a peep for the rest of the night. Well, fully coming to terms with all this has been tough. I still love my sister to death. I'll never abandon her. Nor will she ever abandon me. I'm writing this because I'm backed into a corner. There's a camera trained on me and I have nowhere to go. If anyone ever reads this, know that there's something evil going on in Port Leyland. I don't know what, and I'm scared that I won't live long enough to find out. I'm sitting here, helpless, a missing poster trembling in my hand as I write this with the other. The only thing I can do is leave this behind in the hope that someone can finish what I never meant to start. I'll go through what happened in as much detail as I remember so someone can make sense of this. I live in a small town called Port Leyland in northern Canada. It's undergone deindustrialization in recent years, and has fallen into a state of disrepair. Long story short, there's an old FBI headquarters that was left abandoned 17 years ago. Without a sliver of an explanation, the police department was just uprooted and moved to somewhere closer to the city. No one knows why, but of course, conspiracy theories are running rampant throughout the community. Some think the government is trying to cover something up. Nothing new has been built on the site, and where better to hide top secret information than in an abandoned FBI building in a totally inconspicuous little town. I've been meaning to explore it since my early teens, but all of my friends discouraged me from going, so I've decided to explore it alone. I packed a bag this morning with some snacks and a water bottle, along with a head torch. I bought a mask from the local pharmacy. That old place is probably a gold mine of asbestos, fiberglass, and whatever the hell else. I had to wait until nightfall. Even though it's been abandoned for so long, it's still pretty heavily patrolled by undercover cop cars. When I arrive at the gate, it's 11.49pm. It's pitch black and the whole neighborhood is pretty much asleep. The cop cars that patrol this place take shifts, and I've observed I have around half an hour before the next one comes. There's a weakness in the wire gate close to the bottom, so I pull up and push my backpack through. I crawl through the gap, the wire scratching at my clothes, but I manage to fit through. Being a petite woman has its perks. There's about a kilometer of dense forest surrounding the place, which I have to navigate. I wait until I'm a while in to turn on my head torch, 
just in case there are still cops around. The base should be just a straight line from here, so I trudge on. The night I chose is particularly dark, so I don't have to worry about anyone seeing me going into the forest. It gets super dark here super early in winter, which is perfect for my purposes. I can't help but notice how quiet it is in the woods. I haven't heard an owl or the footsteps of a badger slinking away from me as I walk. No cicadas, no crickets, nothing. The rest of the town is alive with the wildlife at night, but this place has a kind of deafening silence about it. After walking on through the stretch of woodland for about five minutes, I'm stopped in my tracks. As I place my foot down ahead of me, I hear a sickening squelch followed by an unpleasant crunch. I recoil in horror, immediately pulling my foot away and stumbling back. It's a dead animal. Willing myself to look closer, I discover it's the rotting corpse of a fox. The smell is putrid, unlike anything I've ever smelt before. It smells like death with a suffocating chemical smell hanging thick in the air. That's when I realize it has no head. What kind of animal could do that? There are no remnants of its decaying head, no bones, nothing. It's like something just ripped its head clean off. Deeply unsettled, I walk around it, covering my mouth and nose. I wipe my boot against some leaves, telling myself not to throw up. I'm perturbed by the fact the first animal I've come across is dead and decapitated, with a weird, artificial smell coming from it. I decide that it's nothing, and I'm probably just being paranoid. I'm not going to let anything discourage me from exploring this place. I watch my footing carefully for the remainder of the walk, trying to push the noises and the smell of that thing out of my mind. I eventually reach a clearing, after what seems like hours of walking. The building is just a few yards ahead of me. It's surreal. I've only ever seen this place from afar, shrouded by trees. I've never even seen any pictures of it. The tower is far above the trees with concrete walls painted white, dirtied by years of disuse. The main door is chained up really tight, but I've heard rumors there's an entrance through the basement. I scout through the perimeter of the building. All of the windows are barred up with thick, iron-coated, and a layer of flaking black paint. Some of the bars have been bent outwards. The glass in the windows smashed. I take a closer look at one of the windows. That's weird. I think to myself. Most of the glass had fallen outwards onto the ground. The window was smashed from the inside. Why would someone want to break out instead of breaking in? Confused but still determined to find a way in, I carry on circling the building. I come across a pile of leaves and twigs and warily use my foot to brush them away. This reveals a hatch that I can only assume leads into the basement. I brush away the remaining leaves with my hands. It's worn and made of wood with a small chain holding the handles together. It's thin and very corroded, so I began searching for a large rock to break it. I find one, before putting on my mask and taking a deep breath in. I pin one side of the chain down with one of my hands while I raise the rock above my head with the other, trying to target a weakness in the chain. I bring the rock down as hard as I can. The chain breaks with a clatter. The impact from the rock has made a small hole in the hollow wood of the hatch. I wonder how much of this place is still intact. I carefully open the doors, my eyes doing one last sweep of the perimeter before I go. Holding on tight to the edges of the hatch, I start to descend the rickety wooden staircase. Suddenly the stairway gives in with a creak, sending me tumbling down to the ground. Plumes of dust flying into the air, filling my eyes, nose, and mouth. There's a pain shooting through my calf. I rub my eyes, desperately trying to see through the fog. I bring my knee up to my chest. There's a huge splinter sticking out of my calf. A pool of blood is quickly saturating my trousers. I look up at the opening. It was about 10 steps down, and it would be near impossible for me to climb up there, even without the splinter. 
I grip my teeth debating whether or not to pull it out. Having an open wound in a place like this is hardly a smart choice, but the intense burning continues throughout my leg. There's no way I can get home and bandage it up without going into the building. I decide to carry on. After all, I'm not going to let anything stop me from exploring this place. I pull myself up on one of the stairs that still remained intact. I stand there, hunched over for a moment, taking a deep breath in before continuing. I adjust my head torch and begin to navigate my surroundings. The basement just rows upon rows of shelves. Like the storeroom of a museum or an evidence locker, there are stacks of disintegrating cardboard boxes full of faded paperwork. Everything is coated in a blanket of dust. The pain in my leg begins to subside as I make my way through the labyrinth of shelves. There's something thrilling about imagining something lurking in the shadows, playing a kind of cat and mouse game with an unknown entity. Adrenaline is what I live on. Most of the labels on the boxes are yellow and faded, the cardboard being eaten away by little critters. The paperwork stacked in them is unintelligible police jargon. The beam of my head torch is illuminating the dust hanging thick ahead of me. I weave my way through the shelves up to a staircase leading up to the first floor. I warily walk up the stairs before emerging into a large space packed with desks and worn dividers. Everything has been left, dozens upon dozens of computers and desk chairs, falling into ruin, left to rot. Why wouldn't they take stuff like that with them? I walk up to one of the computers to take a closer look, reaching into my breast pocket for my phone to send pictures to my friends. When I look up, I see a little flicker of light. The webcam of the computer is on. I stumble backwards out of sight of the camera to gather my thoughts. Why is electricity still running? It must be motion activated. I can't think of another explanation. But why? Something about this isn't right. I scan around for an exit, ducking behind the dividers in case there are more webcams switched on. I find my way into a small storage cupboard, hoping to find a floor plan. There's nothing. Apart from a cleaning rota that hasn't been updated since 2003, there's a filing cabinet in the corner with a mop and bucket leaning against it, with a few metal racks of cleaning supplies. All of the handles are blanketed in dust. Apart from one, I pull the handle revealing a column of yellow files. In amongst the old files, there's something poking out. It's bright red, and I'm immediately drawn to it. I pull it out. It's an envelope. There's no name or address on the outside. I carefully open it up to reveal a sheet of paper inside. I grab the top and begin pulling on it. The word missing is emblazoned in black ink at the top. I continue pulling it. That's weird. It's dated today. I pull it up even farther to reveal a picture. I feel my heart leap into my throat, my mind becoming hazy with thoughts, flying past too quickly for me to catch. I take a step back in pure horror. I'm snapped out of my daze by a small, mechanical clicking noise. My eyes are drawn up to the corner of the ceiling. A security camera is rotating, focusing in with a blinking red light. I back against the wall and stare at the missing poster in disbelief. My blood running cold. The picture. It's... Me. Drops of salty, shiny sweat beads formed on my forehead as I finalized my second last subject in college for the fall semester. Being an international student, I had no idea how the college course enrollment system worked. What I learned was that I needed a minimum of 13 credits and had to enroll in my classes online but had to attend them physically. I was done with enrolling in classes worth 12 credits and had chosen all the subjects I truly wanted to study. 
So, I just needed one credit and decided to take up a course with a light load. I wanted a subject that would require the least amount of effort. My dry fingers typed and scrolled furiously as I tried looking up subjects with low credits. Then my hands paused. I let out a huge sigh and pushed my laptop away. Deciding to take a break from the frustrating work, I lay on the bed. My laptop screen was still open in front of me, shining a little too bright for my tired eyes. My eyelids got heavier and I struggled to handle their weight. Before I knew it, I had taken a three hour long nap. Shit, shit, shit. I whispered in a croaky broken voice as I woke up and reached out for my phone still groggy and half asleep. I saw the laptop screen which was now completely blank from being in sleep mode and so was I. While I was switching my laptop back on, an idea struck my head. What if I just googled the easiest course available, along with the name of my university? I wouldn't have to individually check the credit system and course load for this each subject. I quickly typed the name of my university followed by the question where I misspelled subject as sobjert. But fortunately, Google realized what I was trying to ask. The first few search results were completely unrelated but the fourth result was from Reddit. It was an archived Reddit thread in which someone had asked the same question as me. There was only one answer which had the subject code 191x8g. That was it. No mention of the subject name or context. However, my still half asleep brain got what it wanted. I went back to the tab where my college course enrollment website was open and typed the subject code. The code was accepted and guess what? It was a one credit course. I pumped my fist in the air and without even seeing the name of the course, subject, or any other information, I hit the enroll button. Three months later, I was on campus ready to meet and mingle with my new college mates. In the busy weeks before my arrival, I had completely forgotten to check my class schedule. When I finally did glance through it, one class stuck out. Beer Psychology Practical was the name of the class and it was taught by Dr. S. Brown. The reason it stuck out to me was not because of the name but because of the class timing. Friday, 9.30 p.m. I was taken aback temporarily, but that was only till I saw that I only had to attend three lectures on the subject in the entire semester. I became glad and relaxed. I didn't look up any other information on the course because I thought that if Reddit says something is easy, then who am I to argue? So in my blissfully unaware state, I started college and even had some sweet friends. I sort of started to understand what our early human ancestors who traveled far to migrate to new continents must have felt like. If you dream of being in a world completely different from where you are born, who knows, you might just experience it. It was all stuff of movies, minus the student debt, which kept me grounded. Before I knew it, Friday had arrived, and after explaining to all my confused college mates that their party plans crashed with my class schedule, I was on the bus to attend Dr. S. Brown's class. Campus glowed differently in the nightlight, and took me 20 minutes to find the building mentioned in the schedule. I rushed to the new building, which I had never seen before. The moment I stepped into the building, I felt different. It was like the feeling of watching sci-fi movies, listening to glitches in the Matrix stories, experiencing thundering rain, or, to describe it more accurately, being in a dream. The lighting of the building was so different that I don't even have the words to describe it. The walls were yellow, but unlike any shade of yellow I've seen before or since. You'd think you've seen all yellows that the world has, but no. You won't find this yellow on a computer color scale. This thing was from elsewhere, or at least that's how I felt when I saw it. I looked at my schedule again. The 13th floor. I looked at the elevator and suddenly, the dreamlike, out of the world feeling was infected with a different feeling. You know you're scared when you go to a new place and adjust to a new environment. There is always this small sense of nervousness and fear. I had carried that feeling, 
when I came to college, but the moment I looked at the elevator, I felt a sudden, overwhelming sense of new fear. It was as if I had watched a horror movie and was scared that I'd be attacked by a grotesque being, but this description doesn't do the feeling justice because this fear was more profound and silent. I felt so clearly, and yet there was no logic for this fear to exist. I looked around and saw the stairs. I'd be lying if I said that the stairs looked any more appealing than the elevator, but I knew if I didn't walk up those stairs, I'd be standing in that hallway for eternity from that paralyzing fear. So, I took fast but unsure steps towards the ancient looking marbly stairs. Before I took my first step up, I looked back at the elevator. The floor sign lit up and soft elevator music started to play indicating that the lift was coming to the floor I was on. As the music got louder, so did the pounding of my heart. All I knew at that moment was that I did not want to see the doors of that elevator open, and so I ran up the stairs as fast as I could. The further I went up, the dimmer the lights got. By the time I got to the 10th floor, it was pitch black. I couldn't see anything. Again, the darkness was such a different kind of dark. I was now very scared and questioned the entire idea of going to class. I could still go back. How was there no one in the building? I looked below at the dizzying curves of the 10 floors I had already climbed. The staircase seemed scarier from up top. I looked at my phone and took a deep breath. Nope, that doesn't just happen in movies because I actually physically stood there and took three deep breaths. Everyone was probably already in class. If I didn't make it to class in the next 15 minutes, I'd be late and lose my attendance. This was supposed to be a blow-off class, and I couldn't let this stupid feeling take away my credit. The class was most probably a night school thing, and so the number of students wouldn't be that high. I told myself I was scared about nothing. This was just like going to the living room as a kid after turning off the lights and getting back to bed. As a kid, I'd start imagining a demon following me and scare myself for no reason. It was natural for me to be scared about navigating a new place all by myself, but that was what I signed up for when I decided to attend university in a new country. I turned on the flashlight of my phone and started walking up. I decided not to look around and get this over with as soon as possible. I had only gone up two or three steps when I heard what I thought was another pair of footsteps. They meshed the rhythm and speed of mind, but they were definitely not my footsteps. Oh hell no. I whispered under my breath and started to run. The footsteps behind me were running too. There was no way I was going to look back and so before I knew it, and obviously this was going to happen because well, I'm me, and so I tripped while running. The footsteps behind me stopped too. My phone fell with me and slid a little further than my hands reach. The flash was still on, and it lit up the sign in front of me, the 11th floor. I then heard a small footstep not that far off behind me. It was a tiny footstep followed by another. My heart felt like it would explode and I thought I was going to die. Another small footstep. But I was stuck in my position with fear. I wanted to get up, but I was just too scared to move. My fingers and arm hurt from the position they were in, but I couldn't even move my fingernail. The small, single footsteps got louder all of a sudden, and then they started running. I felt a strong arm grab my foot. I screamed out loud and felt myself getting pulled behind. I grabbed the railing and kicked back as strongly as I could. As soon as I felt the grip on my foot ease, I got up and continued running upstairs. I picked up my phone but still couldn't dare to look behind me at who or what had grabbed me. I was now breathing faster than ever. I couldn't hear the footsteps following but I knew my nose was bleeding and my arms were scratched up too. The legs that had been pulled hard also burned and was probably bruised but there was no time to check. Just two more floors and I could get to class, aka get to safety. 
I rushed up the stairs, but this time not only did I hear the mirroring, double footsteps again, which now for some reason felt like there were more than one behind me, but also the steps for the 12th floor were wet. Not like slippery and not dry from mopping wet, but like someone's throwing down buckets of water wet. A small light lit up in the corner of my eye. It was the elevator that was coming to the 11th floor. I could faintly hear the elevator music too. Seeing the gushing water coming down from the 12th floor, I recognized going up the stairs. Taking the elevator could possibly be faster and my chances of tripping or falling would be slimmer too. However, whoever was behind me could catch up if I tried to go toward the elevator. I had to take that decision in a split second. I took one look at the creepy elevator and started going up the stairs. My pace was slower, but I still went up as fast as I could. Despite the sound of flowing water, I could still hear splashes of steps going at the same pace as mine behind me. I wanted to cry then, but I didn't have the time or opportunity to process whatever was happening. I just had to get to class. I was gripping the railing of the staircase hard so as to not fall, but had a tighter death grip on my phone. I somehow made it halfway when I saw a rough outline of a figure on the 12th floor. My heart sank, and I felt like I'd puke. I stopped for a second, but the splashing sounds behind me did not. I knew it would only be seconds before whoever was behind me caught up. I only had two options, and the second I thought about what to do, I realized I had four options. I could go up. I could run back down. I could stay still. Or I could jump down the side of the railing. I felt like I'd probably die regardless of what I chose but I would most definitely die if I jumped. It was an 11 stories jump, and I'd without a doubt critically injure myself. I don't know what came over me, but I was in no state to think anything through. I started to go up, and the flashlight on my phone continued to illuminate the figure. I got very close to the figure when I was finally able to see the person in front of me. The man was much taller and had a crazy grin on his disheveled face. I knew this was the end for me. I am Professor S. Brown, the man said in the creepiest way, making me want to die from disgust. He moved to his right, making space for me. Sorry about the water. Some pipe broke, the man continued. I could see him a lot better now. He was a plump man wearing an old-looking oversized brown coat, over a maroon sweater, and blue denim jeans. His eyes were light blue, and he had brown hair. No, scratch that description. His eyes looked like he was high on drugs and crazed to the max. Watch your step or you might hurt yourself, he said with a giggle. The man continued to giggle till I reached the 12th floor. That is, the floor that he was on. This way, he said and started walking towards a room on the 12th floor. If this was any other day, and if I were in any other circumstances, I would have followed the man wherever he went. On that day, I quickly, but not as quickly as I'd like, opened the lock screen on my phone which directly opened my class schedule. The schedule clearly said 13th floor. I looked back at him. He had stopped and was looking directly into my eyes. He wasn't giggling anymore. He wasn't even smiling. I decided that even if this man was supposed to be my teacher, I would rather just skip this class and lose my credit than be around him. I quickly ran towards the floor above and I saw Professor S. Brown run towards me at full speed. The 13th floor did not have as much water as the 11th or 12th floor, and I could clearly hear four or five people running behind me. I ran like I had never run before, and yet it felt like I couldn't have been slower. I made it to the 13th floor and literally ran for my life. I used my flashlight to look at the door of every room, and finally came across one that said, Fear, Psychology, Practical. I felt hot tears brimming up my eyes as I tried the doorknob. It didn't open. I kept trying the doorknob frantically. 
I heard the running steps starting to catch up and simultaneously faint elevator music filled my ears. I was still trying the doorknob. Both the lift and the steps started to get louder and louder. As if it was open the whole time. The door opened and I practically fell inside the room. The door closed itself behind me as I dropped to the ground for the second time. And this time my phone felt much harder. I quickly got up in the dusty, dimly lit room and went back to lash the door shut behind me. The room wasn't very big and it was empty. I picked up my phone, but it was dead. It had completely stopped working and the flashlight feature had stopped working too. I felt the tears go down my face, but I quickly wiped them off. I couldn't hear anyone outside the door, but I knew they had to be out there. I looked around the room and saw a window. I ran towards it and looked outside. There was a broken water pipe that went down the outer walls right by the window, but there was also a tiny ladder just beside it. It went all the way down to the ground floor. For the first time that night, I felt like I was a fortunate person, but that thought was quickly replaced by the thought of the lack of practicality of the ladder. It was too tiny for me to use it. The doorknob started to rattle. Someone outside was trying to turn the knob ferociously. I looked around and saw nothing but layers of dust in a wooden room. I looked at the door and even though it was tightly shut, it didn't feel like a safe barrier. And finally, I looked at the window. The tears came up again. My body was cold and the hot tears felt like a sign of my defeat. I closed my eyes and did what I had done after entering the building. Despite the situation, I took a moment and took three deep breaths. The door was being pounded now and it was loud. I went to the window and pulled it up. The glass slid up with ease. I put my phone in my jeans pocket and climbed out the window. This was the second time I felt fortunate because most of my pants don't have pockets. I don't know how I climbed down that freaking shaky tiny ass ladder, but I did. And I ran back to a world that didn't seem or feel dreamlike weird. As soon as I sat on the bus, which would take me back to my apartment, my phone started to work. It opened my class schedule straight away. My attendance for the day's class was marked as present. And the next, fear psychology practical class had a completely different address. I got home, took a shower, and put some first aid on my wounds. It was late at night and I was just thinking of what to do next when a thought struck me. A thought that made my heart stop, my mouth go dry send chills down my spine and make my body numb. I opened my phone again. The date for my next fear psychology practical class was in a couple of months, but the class address was the address of my apartment. The following documents have been compiled together in an attempt to present a clearer picture of the unusual events leading to the abandonment of Stevensville, Colorado on July 18, 1987. The official explanation of the town's evacuation is an underground coal fire caused due to an unusually destructive and highly localized earthquake. With this evidence, I hope to change that perception. Newspaper clipping from the Stevensville Herald, April 17, 1987. McClintock Coal Mine Digging New Shaft The McClintock Coal Mine is digging a new shaft sometime in the next month. Victor Briggs, the mine's foreman, states, The company has been looking to expand for some time now. The other shafts are no longer yielding as much coal and increasing mechanization has been resulting in layoffs. Julian McClintock believes the best solution is to start a new shaft. Some recent geological surveys have hinted there may be vast wealth of coal at the proposed location of Shaft 8. This expansion will bring in dozens of new jobs. 
Something that this town desperately needs. Others, however, have less positive opinions on this development. A new mineshaft means more pollution and a greater reliance on fossil fuels, claims Diana Schneider, chairwoman of the Thomas County Conservation Society. Our greed is destroying our planet. Just look at what has happened to Lark's Creek due to runoff from the mines already. We need to think about what kind of world our children are going to inherit. Mayor Mitchell has responded to their recent criticism, explaining, We need to focus on our citizens, not a bunch of trees. These environmentalists don't understand that we need jobs more than we need a scenic view. If Miss Schneider is so concerned about the world our children are going to inherit, she should consider whether an impoverished child would rather have a pleasant view or food to eat. Julian McClintock, owner of the McClintock coal mine, could not be reached for comment. Newspaper clipping from the Stevensville Herald, May 10th, 1987. Geologist baffled over recent earthquakes. Dr. Catherine Hendricks of the Thomas County Geological Institute is unable to explain the recent quakes that seem focused around Stevensville. It just doesn't make sense, says Hendricks. It doesn't line up with any of the geological information we have for this area, and the seismograph data is just bizarre. The quakes, which started earlier this week, have all been unusually powerful for this region measuring an average of 4.6 on the Richter scale. While no injuries have been reported, the quakes have resulted in some noticeable shaking and loud rumbling. County authorities advise that residents of Stevensville should pack up and secure easily damaged valuables until further notice. Diary Entry of Ronald Winsome, June 3, 1987 I've been moved over to work on Shaft 8 today. I don't really mind, it's mostly the same work I've been doing for a while now, though some of the equipment is a bit newer. Management was right, there is a lot more coal in this area, and it seems of much higher quality as well. I'm always looking forward to the pay boost, more money for the same work is always nice. The only thing that bugs me are two of the new workers. I think their names are Jim and Robert. There is just something off about them. They work the machines just fine, of course. Excellent, even. But they don't talk much, and they always have these stupid grins on their faces. Whenever I try to make conversation while we work, they just give me this blank stare and idiotic smile. Like they're looking right through me. I thought maybe it was just me, but I asked my buddy Charlie about it, and they seem freaky to him too. Maybe they're on something. I don't know. I might bring it up with Victor. Diary Entry of Ronald Winsome, June 4th, 1987 I spoke to Victor today, and the strangest thing happened. The conversation started out completely ordinary. Nothing seemed unusual. He asked me about the wife, how I was doing, etc. But when I brought up Jim and Robert, his eyes went blank and he got the same stupid smile on his face. He just said something like, Oh, don't mind them. They're just a bit shy is all. There's nothing to worry about. I tried to elaborate and he just repeated the exact same words. Same tone, verbatim. I left it at that and didn't press the issue. If I'm being honest with myself, it chilled me to the bone. He sounded like a different person, like some sort of machine instead of a flesh and blood man. Just thinking about it gives me the creeps. I mentioned it to Charlie, and he thought it was really weird. He thinks it might be some sort of bizarre prank or something, but I don't know. Diary Entry of Ronald Winsome, June 5th, 1987 I don't know if I can take much more of this. There is something deeply, terribly wrong happening here. Charlie is acting different now, too. I've been working with this guy for years. I was excited when he got transferred over to Shaft 8 with me, happy to see a familiar face. 
But now he has the same stupid smile and blank-eyed stare as Jim and Robert. He didn't even seem to recognize me when I said hi to him earlier. I hope this is just some stupid prank. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Diary Entry of Ronald Winsome, June 8th, 1987 I quit today. I just can't take it anymore. I got back from the weekend hoping everyone would just be done with this joke, but it's gotten even worse. Jim got his hand caught in the threads of one of the diggers. He nearly got his whole arm torn off. I've seen accidents like this before. It wasn't the flesh tearing or blood spurting that's got me shaken. It was how he reacted. He just stared blankly ahead, smiling like a moron. Not so much as a flinch as the machine ripped half his arm off. I put in my resignation at the end of my shift. I told them it was a two weeks notice, but I'm not coming in there again. I saw that same grin on Victor as I told him I was going. The same blankness in his eyes. What the hell is going on? Letter from Dr. Jeremy Hopkins to his brother, Andrew Hopkins, June 9th, 1987. Andy, I'm writing to you today because I just need to get something off my chest. You've always been someone I can talk to when things have been rough, and I really can't deal with the idea of bottling this up. We had a patient wheeled into the ER yesterday. He had gotten his arm torn off in a mining accident. I'll spare you the gory details. I know you don't have much of a stomach for that stuff. Needless to say, the poor bastard was in a sorry state by the time we got to him. He had lost quite a bit of blood. We weren't sure he'd make it. Now you know me, Andy. I'm not going to get all riled up over something as simple as a severed limb. But that's not what bothered me. It was the fact this man showed absolutely no signs of stress or shock whatsoever. He was just sort of smiling, blankly, nothing behind his eyes, but strangely it didn't seem like he was in any sort of catatonic state or anything like that. He looked around, even responded to questions, always speaking in a calm sort of voice. That damn smile never left his face. Weirder still, sedatives didn't seem to work on him. We wanted to try and put him under, but the IV did nothing. I triple checked the needle. It was fine. No problem with the bag, either. I even had the nurses change out the medicine just to see if we accidentally gave him mislabeled saline, but it didn't matter. He just wouldn't fall unconscious. He kept staring at us as we worked to clean up the wound and stop the bleeding. After he was stable, I gave him a proper examination. I wanted to take a look at his head and see if there was any trauma there that could account for the utterly bizarre lack of pain or inability to fall unconscious. He bit me when I tried to. No change in that stupid smile or blank doll eyes. Just jerked his head toward me and bit me on the arm when I tried to. After I finally got him off me, and had the nurses tie him down and attempt to anesthetize him, but obviously that didn't work. He just kept smiling and staring, even as he thrashed against the bonds. We had to basically tie him down to get a good look at him, not that he ever stopped struggling. I finally did get a closer look at his head and what I found puzzled me immensely. It was very faint, but... Around the circumference of his head was a thin white scar all the way around. Like how a cartoon might depict someone getting brain surgery by just having the top of their head pulled off like the lid of a box. I barely even noticed it at first. It was so faint. It's hard thinking about what happened next. If I knew it would have turned out this way, I never would have done what I did. I wanted to get a good look at his brain. Figure out what happened, if he would need surgery. We prepped the MRI machine and strapped him in. He just kept smiling and staring blankly ahead. Gave no warning or anything. He didn't say anything at all when we pushed him into the machine. Didn't say anything as we flipped on the switch. 
He only started talking after it was too late. It was only once the machine started that he began screaming. He started shouting for help, begging us to stop. Then he said the words that will haunt me to the day I die. He shouted, They put something in my head. I tried to shut it off. I swear I did everything right. But I must have got so panicked I fumbled just a little too long. I know it's impossible, but it almost felt as if the machine was fighting back. I watched in horror as I saw his flesh start to writhe as if full of worms, his veins bulging as his eyes darted around. It could only have been a few seconds, but for me, time seemed to pass like molasses. There was a sudden sense of calm on the patient's face, and then his head exploded. Showered blood and bits of brain all over the insides of the machines. Scattered among the gore were dozens of intricate pieces of metal. Rapidly clumping into flat disks of metal under the intense magnetic force. I'm sorry. I know I said I wouldn't go into details, but I just had to tell someone. The official explanation is that the patient had some shrapnel in his head. That was previously unreported. I can't believe that. I didn't get too good of a look at whatever was inside his head before they were flattered, but it didn't seem like any shrapnel I've ever seen. In addition, there is no record of the patient ever serving in the military, and any severe enough injury to leave that much metal inside his skull would surely be recorded somewhere. Someone did this to him. I've been given two weeks off for my mental health. I was hoping I could come visit you and Christine. I think I need to see some familiar faces after this experience. I'm sorry. Yours, Jeremy. Transcript of an interview with Dr. Natasha Albertson of the cancelled TV show Bizarre Mysteries. Conducted January 13th, 2003. Interviewer is Arthur Dennings. Arthur. So, Miss Albertson, we understand that you had an unusual experience with an autopsy in 1987. Natasha. That's why I'm here, aren't I? Arthur. Why don't you tell us what happened? Natasha. Well, that's a bit easier asked than answered, but I'll do my best. It was, if I had to guess, June 28th when I became directly involved. About a week or two earlier, a miner by the name of Roger Ainsley never returned home from the mine. According to his partner, he had been acting strangely for several days beforehand. Roger had been seeming to forget how to do basic tasks, smiling strangely at inopportune moments, and sometimes just stared at the walls for hours, seeming not to blink. His partner had considered getting him to see professional help, but as they were a gay couple in the 80s, that wasn't really an option for them. So he just hoped it would pass on its own and tried to do his best to take care of him. Then one day, he just never came back after work. No explanation, no note, no nothing. He just didn't come back. From what I was told, security cameras didn't pick him up leaving the mine either. It was as if he just vanished. Arthur. Did Roger Ainsley have any history of mental illness or anything like that? Natasha. Nope, none at all. He was considered by all who knew him to be mentally sound. He had no history of depression, schizophrenia, anxiety, nothing. He occasionally had a drink or a cigarette after his shift at the mine, but nothing that would count as an addiction. And as near as anyone could tell, he'd never taken any form of illicit substances. He just started acting weird out of the blue, and then vanished. Arthur. And how did you come into the picture? Natasha. Well, after a few days of no contact, Roger's boyfriend called the police. Of course, they found nothing. They suspected he fled town or something similar, and didn't put a lot of effort into the search. Not a lot of sympathy for folks like us back then. Anyway, after a week or two, he just turned up out of the blue at the edge of the woods. 
stark naked and barely breathing. The kids who found him took Roger to the hospital, but by the time they got him there, the poor guy had already passed away. Now at the time, I worked as the pathologist at the Thomas County Hospital, so it was my job to perform an autopsy on him. I didn't have any knowledge of who he was at the time, since I didn't live in Stevensville, and word hadn't really gotten around yet. To me, he was just another John Doe. Arthur what did you find? Natasha. Nothing at first. Not a mark on him beyond some scratches and whatnot. Consistent with what someone wandering naked in the woods would have. He seemed a bit malnourished and dehydrated. But not too bad to have died. My thought at the time was an overdose of some kind. Given how he was found, that was my working theory until I took a look at his skull. Arthur, what was wrong with his skull? Natasha, there was a faint scar around the whole cranium, almost unnoticeable unless you were checking very closely. It was way too precise to have been made with any of the technology at the time, unless somehow this working class coal miner had gotten highly experimental treatment that I hadn't heard about. I was at a loss, but... It seemed to me almost as if it was some sign of brain surgery, so I did what any self-respecting pathologist would do. I opened up his skull. Arthur, what did you find? Natasha, nothing. Arthur, you mean his brain seemed normal? Natasha, no, I mean there was nothing in there. His skull was empty. Newspaper clipping from the Stevensville Herald, July 3rd, 1987. Environmentalist Group Seuss McClintock Mine. The Thomas County Conservation Society announced plans this past Wednesday to sue the McClintock coal mine over alleged violations of the Clean Water Act. I've been out there by Larks Creek just yesterday said Deanna Schneider, chairwoman of the TCCS. All of the fish out there are horribly sick, and the water is this horrible purplish-black color. I can't believe that nothing has been done sooner. When reached for comment, Julian McClintock, owner of the McClintock coal mine, said in a letter to the press, I understand the concern of the TCCS, but there is nothing wrong. I personally invite Miss Schneider to visit our facility. I am sure it will put her mind at ease. Newspaper clipping from the Stevensville Herald, July 7th, 1987. Environmentalist group retracts lawsuit. Diana Schneider, chairwoman of the Thomas County Conservation Society, issued a public statement Sunday retracting her previous vow to sue the McClintock coal mine. I've done a personal inspection of the facility, and there is no pollution of any sort. The facility is remarkably clean and environmentally friendly. There is nothing wrong. I apologize for misleading the public on this issue. Transcript from a broadcast of the radio show. Richard Ellison's Haunted America. July 10th, 1987. Alright folks. Up next, we have a caller by the name of Alice Hartford from Stevensville, Colorado, here to relate her experiences living in a haunted house. Alice. Thank you, Richard. I'm just so happy to be able to talk to someone about this. Richard. The pleasure is all mine, Miss Hartford. So tell me, when exactly did your troubles begin? Alice. Well, I'm not exactly sure. But I first noticed something was wrong on the 4th of July, just under a week ago. My family and a couple friends were celebrating with a barbecue in the backyard. Well, the beer had started to run dry, so I just popped down into the basement to get some. We kept it down there to make sure my daughter doesn't see it lying around and mistake it for some pop. And then, well, you'll think I'm crazy. Richard. Trust me, Alice. Whatever happened, you can tell me. My listeners and I make sure to keep an open mind about these things. Alice. 
Well, I started to hear voices. I couldn't understand anything the voices were saying. It definitely wasn't English. Just sort of strange sounds, but it was certainly a voice. Why I panicked so badly? Worried there were burglars. I ran all the way up the stairs and out of the house and told Mark to get down there. Richard. Mark is your husband? Alice. Yes, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned that. Richard. It's quite alright. Please continue, Mrs. Hartfern. Alice. He obliged me, even took that damn rifle of his which scares me so much. But the voices had stopped by the time he was down there. I was sure I was going crazy. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until two days later that I became convinced I didn't just imagine it. Richard. Oh? And why was that? Alice. Well, it was probably midday. Mark was off at work and my daughter Jessica was at school. I was heading into the basement to put in a load of laundry. When I heard those voices again, for a moment I was worried I was losing my mind, but I had an idea. I quickly set down the laundry and ran to Mark's office. He keeps a tape recorder there, you know, to take notes when he brings work home. Anyway, I bring it with me back to the basement and start recording. I was sure that if the recording could be heard afterwards that I wasn't going nuts. And it worked. Richard. Do you still have this recording? Alice. Yes, just a moment. There are sounds of fiddling with a tape recorder, followed by harsh whispers in an unknown language. The voices simultaneously sound nearby and distant at the same time. After this point, the recording degenerates into a high-pitched screech, followed by a thudding sound. The tape recorder clicks, and the recording ends. Richard. What were those sounds at the end of the recording, Mrs. Hartfern? Alice. Frankly, I'm not sure. I seem to have blacked out around then. When I woke up, it was about three hours later, and I was lying face up in the basement. I had a nasty bump on the back of my head, so I figured I fell down the stairs. Richard. Have you heard the voices since? Alice. Yes. Nearly every night. I've tried to tell my husband, but... Richard. He doesn't believe you? Alice. I'm not sure. I've tried to tell him. I've even shown him the recording once or twice, but he just doesn't seem to process the words. He just goes silent and smiles blankly until I change the subject. He doesn't seem to understand that he doesn't. That isn't the worst part, though. Richard. Why? What else happened? Alice. I told you I hear those voices every night, and I mean that. But I haven't been purposefully going down to the basement every night, Mr. Ellison. I just keep waking up there, as if I've been sleepwalking. I seem to wake up right before something dreadful will happen, because the voices keep sounding frustrated whenever I do. Once I even swore I saw something down there with me, and I still can't get it out of my head. Richard, tell me what you saw. Alice. It was hard to see in the dark, but it was short, maybe about four feet tall. It looked human in outline, more or less, but the proportions were all wrong. The limbs seemed thinner than they should be, and the head was far too large for its neck. The main thing I could make out were its eyes. These horrible, soulless eyes that reflected the light coming from the open basement door. It seemed to panic when I noticed it. And then suddenly I was back in my bed, with a horrible bruise on my temple. I must have hit my head on my way back to bed. That was only last night. I'm horrified to think what will happen tonight. Anonymous letter sent to the 14 magazine. Unknown phenomena. January 7th, 1993. To the editor. 
I was reading the article about underground coal fires from last February's issue, and I must protest. What happened in Stevensville on July 18, 1987 was not a coal fire. At least, not entirely. I'm no geologist, nor can I say I have much knowledge of the mining industry at large, but there is no doubt in my mind that there was something more going on. I remember waking up that night to the sounds of screams. I ran outside to see what was happening, and was greeted to a scene right out of hell. I saw dozens, maybe hundreds of people marching up towards the McClintock coal mine. Each of them was carrying another person, someone who was struggling to escape. They all marched in unison, staring straight ahead, smiling an inhuman artificial grimace which I hope to god I never see again. The people in their arms were begging to be let go, pleading to be put down. I saw one smiling marcher had both his eyes torn out by the prisoner he was carrying, but all he did was keep smiling and walking like a goddamn robot. You ever see a bunch of ants moving in a straight line? Looking at them was just like that. At some point, a police officer ran up to me and started explaining that there was a coal fire. That I had to get out of there. Smoke was pouring out of the ground and my vision started to get a bit hazy. I asked him why those people were being carried up to the mine and he just looked at me with blank eyes and a mechanical smile and said, Everything is fine. It is all going to be okay. I got the hell out of there as soon as I could. I was worried that if I stayed, I'd get taken away too. I think I woke up too early. I don't think I was meant to see what I saw. I only started to hear sirens and police announcements via megaphone as I was leaving town. The worst part wasn't the strange police officer, or the awful marchers, or hell, even the whole damn town being evacuated. It was the thing I saw following the marchers up the hill. I only caught glimpses, but I swear, I saw something else walking alongside them. Like I said, I didn't get a clear look. It was dark and smoky, and I was half asleep, but I know I saw it. It stood about the height of a child, and dressed in funny clothes. Like the kind of uniform you'd see on one of those science fiction shows. I didn't get a clear look at its head but I could see shiny black eyes and pale white skin. The thing moved wrong, as though it didn't have the same muscles and bones that we had. It vanished into the crowd after I got distracted by the eyeless marcher, but I swear I saw it. I swear it was real. Everyone I've tried to talk to about this just thinks I was hallucinating from the smoke, but I know what I saw was real. I don't care if y'all believe me or not. That is for the readers to decide for themselves, but I'll be damned if I get this swept under the rug. People have got to know. This final document is rather unusual. It is the most coherent entry from a journal kept by an unidentified individual who identified only as 251. 251 was found unconscious and unresponsive near the entrance of a Denver subway station on August 12th 1992. Following her recovery, 251 became homeless, unable to retain a job due to her mental illness. She died under unknown circumstances in a shelter on December 2nd, 1995. The extensive loss of public records owing to devastating earthquake of July 18th, means that it is impossible to verify if 251 is a former resident of Stevensville, but her journal seems to support this conclusion. Most of the journal is unintelligible, consisting of strange symbols, scribbles, doodles, and strings of numbers and letters, but the entry below is relatively readable, if bizarre. Spelling and capitalization errors have been partially corrected for ease of reading. Journal entry of the individual known as W251, date unknown. My name, my name, they took away my name, carved it out and chopped it up and dissected it and put something else in instead. 
Something metal and hard and sharp that I feel slicing my memories like a surgeon's scalpel. 251 is number, designation, identity, differentiation. 251 was unimportant. Only the work I could perform for the sunless ones was important. They are known by many names. Darrow and Kobold and Grey. But to me, they are the sunless ones, for they hide from the sun like skittering, silverish, scuttling away from a dangling light bulb, hiding away in the hollow place. Came up through the mines, first using radio waves and thought particles and whispers in the ear of the owner. His designation became 001, first of the ones they took. They had to leave him mostly intact, on damage, because if others knew what they did, their plan would be for nothing. So they came to him in dreams and visions and sounds, and he dug to them. He went down into the earth and pulled them out from the hollow place like they were coal. The miners they took first needed total compliance, complete control. Sliced out their souls and put in machinery and wires and radio. Partial conversions were the best. The full conversions didn't fool anybody. Sometimes they'd just take out everything for fun and see how long they could last. Nobody cared. Nobody knew. The police were already quiet from the machines they had in their heads. Scars so small you could barely see them unless you were looking. I have one too. It was 7181987. They came up from the ground to complete their quota. Going too slow and they needed builders and guinea pigs. Cut off all the phones and scrambled the radios and dug their way up. Had to be night. The sun burns the pale eggshell skin of the sunless ones. The already converted helped grab the rest. They did not need everybody. Only needed a third. The rest could burn or run, and it did not matter. I was taken down, down, down into the mine by the other converted and processed. Scooped out old memories and put in rules and protocols and small ticking noises that prevented sleep. I worked and worked and worked for days and days and days. The sunless ones poked and prodded and laughed in the horrible, tittering way of the hollow place. Given slurry to eat and drink just enough to keep alive to operate the machines. I could not think. They took that part out and put in a transceiver just above the left eye. It was near one of the machines when I broke. When the transceiver failed. Pressing the right buttons at the right times for hours and hours. A nanosecond delay was not permissible. Punished by pain. Shovel the dead into the machine. But something went wrong and the machine failed. It was so, so old. Ancient prehistoric old. Older than us by infinite magnitudes. A blast of rays and magnetism and the brain in my head was shattered like glass. I was free to scream and cry and think and love and kill. I killed a sunless one. I bashed its bulbous head against the hard cold rock until the warm sour blood spilled like yolk from an egg and its cold black eyes were dead and still. I took the pain box and left to climb the miles high exit shaft into the building light of the upper world. I was free. Now I am broken and unable to be repaired. The right parts are missing miles and miles below the ground. There are entrances in the subways, and the elevators, and the forgotten sub-basements, but I am free, and I will never go back. I just wish I still had my name. Despite requests for its release, 251's autopsy report has not been made available. In addition, the so-called pain box device which 251 obsessively clung to throughout the final years of her life was found to be missing from police evidence. Of the 1,348 former inhabitants of Stevensville, Colorado, 447 remain unaccounted for. The entire town is abandoned and forgotten, 
Save as an actual inclusion on a list of ghost towns. The documents above are all that remains to indicate anything unusual beyond a simple coal fire ever occurred. Perhaps some things truly are better left buried. If you've never lived with a huge body of water at your back, you'll never really get the Great Lakes. People from outside the region think they're just like any of their friendly little local lakes. And they're wrong. They are a sea unto themselves. They are massive living things. You hear old sailors talk about their awe of the ocean. The reverence for its indifferent violence. For its depths. The ocean is our mother, while well, we grew our first lungs and legs to have her. And when we return still thinking of the woman who raised us, we are confronted with a stranger. Part of being human is to forget and then learn all at once again. The cruelty of water. I live on the eastern side of Lake Michigan. My childhood home is right on the water. We get some of the worst rip currents in the lake system. When the wind planes over the water in such a way that the tide sucks you down into it, everybody knows someone who's drowned or almost drowned, mostly kids. For my part, I know a lot of drowners. I hate it here. I truly do. You hear that from most people who get trapped in their hometowns all their lives, but I think I'm more entitled to my resentment than most. I couldn't have been older than six, so I don't remember much of it. But when I was little, I drowned. Most of the time when that happens, it's kids who don't know better, goofing off near a sandbar and getting pulled under. You see, the rip current makes the surface of the water go smooth, and especially on the lake where the water is always choppy, it makes a tempting sight for a child who isn't the strongest swimmer. I wasn't. I liked the water at that age, according to my mother. But what I would really do is go and splash around it with my arm floaters on. I couldn't have ever been prepared. What does stick in my mind was the moment it happened. I was running over to my friend Kathy through what looked like shallow, calm water. And when I went to put my foot down, the lake decided to take me. Currents are stronger the deeper you go. I remember the undertow yanking me down doing somersaults in the dark. I'd scream before going down so my mouth was open to receive every ounce of lake that could fit into me. Obviously they pulled me out and squeezed all the water out of me. I lived, but at a cost. I have chronic pneumonia. I'm physically weaker than any other women my age due to lung and nerve damage. I stayed out of the water for a long time. The first time I knew for sure I had to get out of here, I was 14. Being sick from a young age makes you realize things that don't normally settle in for most people until their 50s. Being born is a death sentence, and my body is falling apart. I tried not to be a downer with other people because I already had enough trouble at school being disabled, but it did give me an early appreciation for psychoactives. I was friends with Henry because his older brother had cheap weed. And he was good for edibles. For obvious reasons, I tried not to smoke. We would walk around town high as hell, go down to the shore and kick litter around in the weeds. Sometimes a group of us, sometimes just me and him. In my memory, it wasn't so much that we were particularly close. Kids just pick people to hang around. I think he liked that I laughed at his stupid jokes. The pot made me giggly. It was dead summer, muggy air, and Michigan mosquitoes. The only place you could go to get away from the heat was by the water where the rolling breeze kept you cool. We had a little spot, a patch of shore where the reeds and yellow grass didn't encroach on the sand. Weeds rippled beneath the waves like tiny grasping hands. It's too goddamn hot, Henry said for the too manyth time. Like, I hadn't heard my dad say the same thing all week. It's the global warming, I replied. He was further down the shore, close to the lapping water. 
I'd sat up on a log with my cane on my lap watching the sand fleas. It was never this hot when we were little. You remember that? I'd remember it getting to be 99 degrees outside. You would, maybe. I can't even remember what I ate this morning. I rolled my eyes at him. Yeah, well, you wouldn't. He grinned back at me over his shoulder, plucking at his sweaty shirt. I was tired in that soft, slow, wispy way, between being high out of my mind and being baked much more literally by the August sun. I remember thinking he was going to ask me to be his girl, that it had been leading up to this. I wouldn't have minded, maybe even wanted it a little. He didn't. Henry pulled off his shirt and threw it at me and said, You sure you don't want to come? I told him yes, I was sure. I bundled up his shirt in my arms. He shrugged and jumped in. The dark water of the shallow splashed like an actual cannonball had fallen in. Henry didn't come back up. Unable to comprehend, I watched the spot for a while. How long could Henry hold his breath? He shouldn't have been able to sink very deep from where we were on the shore. I knew something was wrong, and the longer I sat there staring, the worse it would get. But I couldn't will myself to move. My body was heavy with dread, with the oppressive weight of being stoned. I woke up there. Or, not quite there. I woke up in the water, soaked up to my shoulders by an incoming wave. Henry's shirt was still balled up in my hands, turned from orange to bloody red by the tide. I looked around for him and saw nothing but weedy beach all around. I dropped his shirt and left it there. Even moving my leg hurts, and I needed all my strength to brace the pain. On the walk home, my shoes were heavy with water the whole way. A dark red bruise circled my ankle like a ligature or grasping hand. His parents and the local cops organized a search, and they knew I was probably the last to see him. So I lied and said we'd split up on the way home. I said maybe he went back to the shore. When I remembered that shirt, it felt like a godsend. I got to tell him that he went back for it, and I walked home alone. And they found it right there on our patch of lake. I don't know why. I don't know why I lied. Except that I thought I'd go to jail or something for not helping. Like it would be my fault that I couldn't go in after him. Anyway, they fished him out eventually. It looked like he'd gotten tangled up in seaweed and drowned himself trying to get free. If it gets wrapped around your ankle and you try to tug yourself out, it'll only tie tighter and drag you down. My parents knew something was wrong. For dad, this manifested as concern. Checking up on me, trying to take me to movies on the weekend. You know, dad stuff. For my mother, she became clingy. She was religious. She went out to the lake every morning to pray. She'd been baptized in these waters, and so had I. And Christ would wash away our sins, and blah blah. Getting me to come and pray with her became her mission for the rest of the summer. So she could wash away the unholiness that had settled upon me. I didn't go. My dad was always really supportive. I mean, he got it. He wasn't local like my mother. She lived in the same area basically her whole life. Well, he'd moved around everywhere before settling down with her. We were really close. He took to my physical therapy and piano, and we watched movies together when I was sick. On my side, with my chest and throat coated in Vicks, and him bringing us hot tea and ginger soup. He helped me write my college essays, and when I got a full ride to a university out of state, it doesn't matter anymore where or for what. He couldn't have been prouder. Neither of my parents had gone to college. He kept telling me I was really going to make something of myself. He drove me down there and moved me into my dorm while my mother sulked at home. I remember I was on the edge the whole time in a way I couldn't explain. It was a smell. Landlocked, but the whole time he was helping me take my stuff inside, I could smell brine. I thought something of mine had gotten wet somehow, and gotten mildewed. Dad didn't notice anything. I didn't bring it up to him. Thought he would worry and it would mess this up for both of us. 
It was already so hard to believe. He gathered me up close in the parking lot as I was walking him out and he asked me, You feel ready, Junebug? I said I did. He went home and that wet smell went with him. Maybe it was in the car or in his clothes, I thought. He was a strong swimmer. He loved the water. He never would have done something as stupid as jumping into the lake in the middle of the night. I got the call three weeks into my first semester, telling me that he'd washed ashore a little ways down the coast. I had to drop out. My mother was inconsolable and needy, and it was soon enough in the semester to cancel without any penalties. Next year, I promised myself, I had plenty of time. Next year turned into the year after that, then I was halfway through my 20s. It was never the right time, my mother always needed me, financially or emotionally. I got a job in town, of course, got a cheap car like a token attempt at independence. She couldn't make me go to church or wake up at sunrise any more than she could when I was a child, but even if she gave up on my soul, she wouldn't give up on my wallet. My life was a dim, algae creeping malaise before I met Mitch. I worked at the back office of a gardening supply company, and he was our mail guy every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. He came by the office window in the afternoons and chatted me up while I got the overnight shipping together for him. I'd forgotten how it felt to meet someone, not just exist in their proximity, but to be with them. Work chats became shared lunch breaks, Sunday coffee dates, movies, driving out to the city to find a nice restaurant. Mitch was a gentleman. He liked fishing and chick flicks. He didn't look at me like a lame dog in the road when I went out with crutches. Both of us together couldn't afford a place of our own, and he couldn't get me on the lease with his roommates even if I had wanted him to. When we got married, he said to me once, We'd have our own place if he had to build it himself. That was his way of proposing, lobbing it up in the air for me to take as I might. I said I'd hold the nails for him, but there was still the issue of water between us. The first time he stayed at my mother's house, at my house, it was on the verge of a summer storm. A hurricane had come down on the east coast and we were bound to feel the ripples of it. How many storms had I lived through until now? I just had a feeling about this one. This dread. This briny smell in my nose all day as the clouds stifled the sky. Like an idiot, I asked Mitch to stay the night. He met my mother. She hated him. He dragged my queen bed out of the wall so we could climb on it and left the window cracked. For tornadoes, he said. For the air pressure. With the window open even a little, the storm's wailing came right inside. Rain and wind rattling the trees and the pier. Looks like it's getting bad out there. Could be the big one, he teased. I told him I didn't find it funny. I didn't want to think about what might happen. He kissed my head and apologized. Sleep stole my memories. I don't know how I got to rest at all with the storm howling the way it did. Knowing the lake was right outside and leaping up to meet me. I remember a lot of things from that night so perfectly, but I don't remember my dream. It was only as I was surfacing from the dark that I heard his voice. He whispered to me, just on the verge of awareness. You sure you don't want to come? I woke up with something wrapped around my ankle. It was too cold to be a tongue. I couldn't process it so soon after waking and just pulled my foot away by instinct, still half asleep. The cold, wet thing dragged over my foot and off my skin. There was a noise then. Some kind of... I don't know. A hiss or a sigh. It was quick and quiet and sounded like the air between gritted teeth or the squeak of a window being shut fast. It jolted me awake. Pulse speeding up, I stared around. In the dark... Scattered with cloud-choked moonlight, nothing seemed real. No more noises. Total silence. I rubbed my ankle and shivered. My skin was cold to the touch. 
Was it always so dark at night? I braced a foot on the floor, anxious to hit the light, and yanked my leg back up, cursing, fuck, wet rug. I tried again and stood up, head swimming. The floor was soaking. Were we flooding somehow? Had the storm raised the lake to my doorstep to swallow me? I stumbled across the floor, splashing through a thin puddle on the hardwood until I get to the light switch. Skidding, I slammed into the wall and fumbled for the light. There was still nothing but the dark and wet. My vision went sideways and I hit the ground. My head whistled past the bedside drawer and barely missed cracking my skull open in the dark. I was yelling for Mitch, groping around for the silhouette of the bed and struggling just to get to my feet. I found the sheets and they were squishy, waterlogged. I couldn't tell the difference at first between them and his skin. That's when I started screaming. I'm so grateful that I could see him because he felt like I could tear through his skin like a swollen pepper. My mother found me scrambling around blind for my inhaler. The crying had choked me until instinct kicked in. She pointed a flashlight in my face. Behind the beam of light, she was a faceless god putting me on trial. She grabbed my arm and shook me. You went to bed alone, she kept saying. You went out to the pier to fish before the storm came in. Do you understand? You went to bed early waiting for him to come inside. Are you listening to me? I was listening. I didn't know why she was coaching me. I was suffocating on my own fluids and she wouldn't let me use my inhaler. The interrogation finally stopped and the light moved on. She left me curled up in the dark to take my medicine. His body thumped when it hit the carpet, and again I thought about rotten vegetables. The sound an overripe melon makes when it liquefies and splits. Lucky for her, my bedroom was on the ground floor to spare me the stairs. I coughed myself sideways and laid there for God knows how long before she came back. She dragged me to the couch and told me to stay there while she took care of things. She always took care of things. The police took one look at me when they came around, my feeble little body and swollen, wet face, and they said, well, ain't it a tragedy? I hated her. She hovered around in the doorway watching for any sign of betrayal, and I knew it was her. She had taken Mitch and Dad, and somehow she had taken Henry. She had taken me, too small to understand, and trapped in this body I hated, and this town I despised. I knew it. I knew her. I wish the lake would take her. And then it did. 7 a.m., visiting with the water as per routine. I looked up when I heard her yelp, like she'd been bitten. She was already on her side in the sand. A dark, shiny thing had her leg in its grip. Her eyes only had a second to bulge at me hateful. Then she slid into the water with barely a splash. I didn't quit my job. I didn't talk to anybody. I threw a handful of clothes in my back seat and left. I felt like the girl from Psycho, you know, at the beginning of the movie. Guilty runner, nowhere to run to. And then, fuck, at the southern edge of Illinois, the rain started back up again. I pulled over to a motel and stayed the night. The sound of the shower woke me up. The drum beat of water on the tile, like sheets of rain. I lay frozen in bed, heaped with cheap hotel duvets, staring at the bathroom door. It had been left open a crack, golden light pouring into my dark room. I could see wisps of steam curling in the sliver of light, making the air taste wet. More than anything, I wanted to go back to sleep. Of course I was afraid, but it was a numb fear, the kind that comes over you without even the decency of giving you a shot of adrenaline. What else could I do? I'd already run away, and it had found me here. Might as well roll over and get some sleep. I forced myself upright, trying not to creak the bed or rustle the sheets too loudly. The shitty carpet squished wetly between my toes. Flooded. Yes, now I could see the water pouring slowly out from under the bathroom door, sloshing out from an overflowing tub. 
the lake was there. I couldn't make out anything distinct behind the bubble glass of the shower door and the steam fog gathered on it. Just a dark shape, rendered deep LG green by the barren fluorescent lights, rising and falling with breaths drowned out by the patter of the shower water. It hadn't taken me. I was here, and it hadn't taken me. It never had, no matter how much I wanted it to. Hello? I said stupidly, not sure what else to say. It rumbled a bit before it spoke. You feel ready, Junebug? It asked with my dad's voice. With my mother's, it asked. Do you understand? I was. I did. We came to an agreement, the lake and I. I still remember catching the faintest traces of an off smell when we first stepped foot in the new house. It wasn't particularly of note at the time, mostly blending into the base notes of ancient wood, dry, chipped paint, and a general old house aroma. And the scent wasn't just for show either, as the house had been built in the early 1900s. Its completion arising just a couple of years before America was struck in the backhand by the Great Depression. Those little history tidbits were the main things on my mind as Sharon and I looked over the living space from the open front door on that first day at the house in May. Yet, I still took note of the off smell, packing the memory away for a later date, even if for the briefest of moments. It would be a long time before I would recall that first instance, that half second where I felt something was off, felt unease. It would be longer still before I would come to know the origin of the scent, and pray to God every night thereafter that I could erase it from my mind, along with the memories it conjures. But it's a hard miracle to truly erase the smell of death. Our new home used to be a farmhouse, set up in one of West Virginia's rural valleys straddling the edge of the Appalachians. I'd received a new job opportunity with a much higher pay rate, and in addition, it would be a remote position allowing me to work from anywhere I wanted. Of course it ended up being where Sharon wanted, which was up east where her family was situated. That didn't bother me. I can't stand my family, so the further away from them, the better. All that being said, the main reason for taking the job wasn't the freedom I'd gain, or the scenic views, but rather was primarily due to us being due. Our first child was well on the way, and we found out only a couple of weeks before the job offer made its way to me. Seemed a smart decision to get a pay raise and be able to pick whatever environment I wanted to raise a kid in. What kid wouldn't want to grow up on a farm? Granted, this place wasn't really a farm. Not anymore. A lot of the farmland had been sectioned off and sold as separate properties since the plot's heyday, leaving a space that was more of a glorified backyard than anything. But I still had to admit that it was pretty cool to be right on the edge of the valley, planted at the base of one of the larger peaks surrounding the nearby town. Dreary. The locals called it Mount Echo, but most maps don't name it, and the place has apparently had its share of folklore attributed it, though I'm not much one for reading folklore, much less believing in it. We settled in pretty fast, Sharon, Steve, and I, and it didn't even take too long to accumulate to the altitude. Steve, our orange tabby, threw up once or twice in the first couple days but he has a tendency to overeat, so it could have just been that. Having moved in towards the beginning of summer, the weather was pretty much all you could ask for, and nothing like the humid, southwestern heat I was accustomed to. It was due in part to the warmer weather that it would be some time before I'd start to notice the stranger things about the house again, that my memory of the off smell would arise, and I would be made uneasy again. Sharon was due in January, and was showing strong by mid-fall. It had started to get cold outside, especially at night, 
and like the summer's mild temperatures, this chill was not what I was accustomed to. The last thing I wanted was for my wife and onboard child to freeze to death, but as it turned out, the home didn't have the most functional modern heating system. I would have to go into town and purchase firewood, as the primary heater source in the one-story home was the fireplace situated in the main living room. It was an odd fireplace, which didn't occur to me in full until I stood before it, an armful of oak in my grasp. Firstly, the fireplace wasn't against a wall, but rather jutted out from the center of the floor. It was like a brick and mortar support column in the middle of the room, that just so happened to have a stove at the bottom. In fact, the chamber was odd enough in and of itself. For one, it was much smaller than most fireplaces I'd seen, especially for the time period it was built. But for two, it was generally crude in make the more so when compared to the craftsmanship of the rest of the house. Not to say that the place was a mansion, or to say that either the fireplace or the house were inherently terrible looking when accounting for their age. It was more that they just felt different, incompatible, and if some other home had lost a fire pit and misplaced it in this one, not that this would stop me from burning the oak logs. The faintest beginnings of the weird, tingling feeling of unease creeping in as I lowered myself towards it. That was another thing. The lowering. The fireplace was rather small and close to the ground, requiring me to lean over in order to open the door to the chamber. Doing so resulted in a metallic creak, which I couldn't be sure if I should attribute to my back or the chamber door. That thought subsided quickly as I froze. The off smell shot through my nose clear as day, clearer than on that first day when the other sense masked it so effectively. It was like I'd opened the floodgates, and I came to the quick realization that it was not a pleasant smell. I dropped one of the logs, trying to reach up and cover part of my nose with a mitten-wrapped hand. The odor had taken me by surprise, and I couldn't place what it was. It didn't smell like any wood or ash I'd ever seen burned. Sitting the oak pile off to the side, I leaned forwards to the open door. Although it was a small space, I could just barely fit part of my head inside the chamber. The smell was the strongest I'd ever noticed it in here. It was then that I noticed a much more bizarre oddity of the fireplace. It wasn't on the ground. The base of the chamber wasn't concrete, or steel, or iron, but rather some sort of shaft. It was covered by a metal grate with holes big enough to stick a finger through, but sturdy enough to hold a pile of logs. The chimney in our house went down, down into darkness. My instinct would have been if it was some sort of tray or disposal for the ashes from the fire, but that was far too deep for that to make sense. Reaching into the pile, I snapped off a wood chip, chopping it down through one of the holes in the grate, and for a moment in the void, I heard it hit the bottom. The shaft had to be almost 15 feet down. I jerked back at the much louder sound coming from below, smacking the back of my head on the edge of the chamber as I stumbled back onto the ground next to my firewood. I just laid there for a moment allowing my head to spin. Maybe there was an old basement down there or something. Maybe a squirrel had fallen down there or something. Maybe. Maybe I didn't want to think about any more somethings that could be down there. I packed up my oak and tossed it onto the grate from a safe distance and flicked a match over it. The fire did its job. By the time night rolled around, Sharon and I were nice and warm. Caressed by the heat as we watched some low-budget thriller before Ben, Steve taking turns between our laps. When time came to retire for the evening, I'd mostly forgotten about the strange sound and bottomless fireplace. Even when the hints of that off smell mingled with the puff of smoke spawned from putting out the fire, I still felt uneasy when I laid in bed across from Sharon that night but I chalked it up to cheap pizza and the fact we'd just watched a two-hour movie about some guy who ate people. 
The next morning I'd toss out the old wood, toss in the new, and I would even stick my sore head into the chamber for a whiff. At least, that was my plan. It wasn't quite how things actually went. Since it was a weekend, I wasn't too concerned with waking up early, so it was nearly 10 before I slunk out of bed, making my way into the living room. I put on a pot of coffee one of Sharon's aunts had gifted me for my birthday the month before, then shuffled towards the fireplace, hoping I'd have the caffeine ready by the time I was done disposing of the oak. I leaned down, rubbing my eyes with one hand as I reached out mid-yawn to open the chamber door with the other, but after the yawn completed, my mouth still hung slightly ajar. The fireplace was empty, no wood to be seen. Just a thin layer of white ash dusting the top of the grate. Certainly Sharon hadn't gotten up and taken it out. I seriously doubted she'd be able to lean down in order to reach in and remove the log at her current size. And yet, it was gone. After staring a moment, I stuck my hand into the chamber, gripped the grate by my fingers, and pulled up slightly. It popped cleanly out of place. Rather than being secured in any meaningful way, the iron simply rested on a quarter-inch protrusion of brick running around the edge of the chimney. Surely it didn't dislodge itself as the burnt logs cracked and broke, did it? I couldn't imagine the grate having come loose enough to both allow the oak to slip through without the grate itself shuttering down the chamber as well. Not to mention that the crash would have awoken at least one of us, and maybe the cat. The tendrils of the off smell hit me and I quickly put the grate back onto the ledge and stepped away. At least the coffee smelled good. I didn't say anything to Sharon about the fireplace or the wood disappearing, as she was typically more spooked by stuff like that than I would be. Better not to let her know, especially with the stress of the baby. She was all in on the panic mode preparations throughout the fall when I'd wake up in the middle of the night with bad dreams about the endless chasm beneath our new house, and the hints of rotten off-smell penetrating our bedroom door. She was awoken with nightmares about strollers, diapers, and what color to paint the baby's room. I chalked my own nerves up to the fears associated with being a new father. I was using my unease about the house to mask my confrontation with what I was actually afraid of. Becoming like my parents. It was something I needed to face, and it had hit me at random times, so I'd use random things to mask it. I convinced myself of the sounds in the fireplace on at least two other occasions. Maybe it was in my head, maybe it wasn't. I still didn't tell Sharon. A couple of weeks went by and we were browsing for the baby's room at a hardware store, trying to find the right lighting. I discreetly threw some bolt screws and new driver for them in with the rest of the hall. When Sharon was out of the house grabbing dinner, I moved to the fireplace, drilling the grate down into the ledge. I tested it with my fingers, and the hold was solid. If there was something down there, squirrel, raccoon, bird, you name it, that thing was staying down there, along with my fears about parenthood. Sealed up, locked away, key discarded. Around Christmas was when we lost Steve. That changed things. We just couldn't find him, and we spent two days searching the property with no traces, which was odd. Steve wasn't a wandering cat. He was getting on up there in age, and his favorite activities primarily consisted of sitting, sleeping, and laying in the sun. Sharon was pretty broken up about it, which I didn't need. It was her who had insisted on adopting the old geezer while we were dating, and she was all worried that it was a reflection on how well we'd do in January. And imagine if that happened with the baby and blah blah blah. I needed her to zip up that wound fast because my stitches weren't going to hold long under the scrutiny of her emotional response. I needed to find the cat dead or alive, give her some kind of closure, otherwise... I'd have to admit I was scared shitless about being a dad, too. That was what led me back to the chimney. Once the thought cropped up, I just had to know. Had to be sure. 
I knelt down by the chamber door and swung it open. There was nothing there, of course, save ash. But as I began to swing the door shut, I noticed the bolts had been removed from the grate. I reached in and pulled it out, staring down into the abyss, before shifting my eyes upward to the patch of dark red stain on the sides of the brick. Right below where the grate sat, dried blood. No question about it. I pulled back and stood in front of the fireplace, grate still in my grip. Nothing could convince me the blood stain wasn't from Steve. I wanted to say he somehow found a way to get through on his own. Slipped, maybe. An accident, but no, I knew that wasn't it. There was no way past the grate. Then I noticed. On the mantle above the chamber, there were the four screws, lined up like little soldiers in a neat row. Threads stripped smooth, bits of torn metal hanging loose from their sides, but nowhere on the top outside of from the initial installation. They hadn't been removed by a tool, they had been ripped out by hand. The hand that took Steve, but it was Christmas, and the baby would be here in a month. I still didn't tell Sharon about the chimney. Some collected fur scraps from Steve's old bed, and a bit of rehydrated blood that I found out back was convincing enough. We put a little cross in the yard for him, a grave with no body. Our family of two celebrated Christmas alone. Without Sharon's knowledge, I gave the real estate office a call, inquiring about some curiosities with our floor plan. My hope was to learn a little bit about the history of the place primarily the chimney, and I got more than I initially bargained for. During the Depression, a family of three lived in the house. At the time, it was a two-story occupied by a father, mother, and their daughter, who was only a toddler. Near the end of the 20s, a landslide occurred on the valley side of Mount Echo, one of the worst in state history. The first floor of the house was completely engulfed and almost collapsed, buried under rock, dirt, and wood. It took over a week before the terrain was safe enough to get to the house from town. It took longer before anybody even started looking. Most people assumed the family was inside, at least that's what people said. There was no way to get into the first floor save blowing a hole in the second, and anybody down there would have been dead by the time any fool had bothered to check on them. No bodies were ever recovered, but the family wasn't seen or heard from again after that. Eventually the land got bought, and the caved-in stairwell was sealed up. The chimney opened up on the second floor and given a fireplace, and the house was renovated and sold. Supposedly the property had some history with the town folklore after that point, but the real estate agent was clear on the details. I'd heard enough, so I went home. Wishing I'd heard less, and consigned to try and forget most of it. In January, I became a father. Only two days off schedule, a beautiful baby girl. We named Astrid after one of Sharon's relatives who helped us out financially early on. She was one of the few, as my parents were too busy disapproving of my life. It was hard to look in Astrid's eyes, imagining she could think the same thing about me one day, if I wasn't careful. After all, I was already picking up my own father's habits of lies and secrecy. The chimney, the fireplace, the grate, the cat, the folklore, all of it was weighing on my shoulders like this load I couldn't shake. None of it had I told Sharon, and yet she was starting to notice anyway. Noticed that something was wrong with me, in the way I'd turn away, or half smile, or go these long periods without talking. She probably thought after the baby came it'd go away, that it was just nerves, but no, it was worse. I didn't feel as much joy as I should have from taking care of Astrid. I was filled only with dread. Dread that in the night that dark black hand would reach out from the chasm beneath the chimney and snatch me up, pulling me into the depths, only to find that the monster was myself. 
The failed father I was destined to become. It was just genetics. Inevitability. Eventually, a few weeks after we took Astrid home, Sharon decided it would be a good time to talk to me about it. Granted, she didn't actually know what it was she was trying to talk to me about at first, but I'm sure she had her suspicions. I thought I'd be able to play it off, keep her off the trail of my fears, but then she just had to fracture the thin veil that was keeping me at bay, reaching out to place a hand on my shoulder which I promptly refused. David, come on. You don't. You aren't going to be like them. I broke. How do you know? We fought, went to bed on opposite sides, quiet and indignant. I couldn't keep myself under control. The black hand of dread had already snatched me up, and it had done so long before. When I wasn't paying attention, now I was stuck. Toying with the hooks it had set in me, ripping flesh out with them, I cried silently and alone as Sharon slept. Eventually I sat up in bed, unable to sleep with myself, or with the knowledge that I was bringing the very fear of dysfunction that had kept me up in nights past to life, simply though the worry of their existence. I nearly vomited into the floor, sick to my stomach needed to calm my nerves, but then I realized it wasn't the nerves that were bringing on my nausea. I stood beside the bed frame, suddenly alert. It wasn't the nerves at all. It was the smell. I wasn't sure why, but I instinctively grabbed the only firearm we owned, a Mossberg 59081, pump shotgun and marched towards Astrid's room. The off smell grew in intensity the closer I got. My entire body froze a few paces away. The smell was stronger than I'd ever encountered it to be, and I could barely keep my senses in order. But that wasn't what stopped me. I could hear Astrid giggling, and there was something else. A second voice, or something like a voice. It was low, hard to make out, and indecipherable. I pumped the shotgun. Taking short, careful steps, I narrowed the gap between myself and the shut bedroom door. I found myself filled with fear, the black hand of my future self gripping me by the throat. I reached out, ready to take a peek through the door. She was probably just in her crib, maybe hungry. What would Sharon think if she saw me here with this gun? Maybe she'd think I really was like my dad. Maybe she always thought that and just never said it. I turned the door handle. Before I could think, the door slammed open towards me, busting off its hinges. Hit square in the face, I was thrown back onto the ground, my head banging into the hardwood as the splintered door fell against the opposite wall. My mind was spinning, warm blood gushing out of my nose. The taste of iron filling my mouth as the stream dipped between my lips and teeth. Opening my eyes, I saw one of the hinge screws roll across the floor a few inches from my face. The threads were stripped. I bolted up straight just in time to see it. Thin, blackened, dirty, and long. I only caught a glimpse of the thing's legs as it turned the hallway corner into the living room. The giggling went with it. It was like a man on all fours, but it was not a man. I stood, dizzy, and ran as best as I could towards the living room. My knees were hurting. I looked down to see a thin piece of wood from the door jutting out of my lower thigh. No time. I turned the corner into the living room to see the iron grate fly across the room and into the couch. My head flicked in the direction of the chimney. The black hands of dread were pulling my daughter into the fireplace. She was enjoying the ride, but she was just a baby. I drew the gun as she reached for me. There wasn't a shot. I'd hit her. Astrid and the creature disappeared over the ledge, vanishing in the chasm beneath the fireplace. Astrid! I screamed in anguish, head still pounding from being hit by a door. What was I supposed to do? The door to the master bedroom slammed open. 
Sharon walked out half asleep. David? David, what are you doing? Why do you have the gun? I wanted to sit and explain it to her like I should have before. I should have told her everything. The chimney, the grate, the cat, the dread. She deserved to know about the fear, about the destiny, and I decided right then and there that she would. But first, I needed to make sure that destiny didn't come true. Aiming at the floor, I began blowing holes in the hardwood with the Mossberg. This prompted Sharon to scream. She begged me to stop, but I wasn't thinking straight. I was thinking straight for the first time in a while. Stopping my volley, I turned to face her. Honey, I need you to trust me. Then the floor caved in, and I fell into the dark. I landed awkwardly, rolling onto my back and struggling to stand as Sharon called my name through the holes in the ceiling. There was flashlight on the end of the Mossberg, which I clicked to life. Broken boards, shattered glass, piles of dirt, rocks, and debris. I was standing on the building's original first floor. The walls splintered, caving inwards. It was barely navigatable. Behind me came a sound that could only be Astrid's. I moved through the debris, making my way through the broken home towards the sounds. Rounding a corner, I found myself in what must have been the original master bedroom, except the bed was now rotten and covered in muck. Inadvertently, I choked, and found that stomach acid was spilling from my mouth and onto the ground. I threw up. The off smell was dizzying in this room. It was like nothing I'd ever smelled. As I wiped the spit and vomit from my lips, I pulled up the Mossberg to realize where the origin of the smell was. Embedded deep within the rotting and stained fibers of the bed sheets were the remains of two people, nearly unrecognizable as something that could have been human. What clothes were left on them were clearly from another time period and decayed beyond belief. The bodies themselves had practically melted, though far meatier than one would expect bodies from the 20s to be, likely due to lack of airflow. But more than all that, there were chunks missing, some as though they'd been almost surgically cut off, others as if they were bitten. My jaw was agape when I heard the noise again. The one that sounded something like a man, but wasn't. It came from the direction of what I assumed was once a closet. Pumping the shotgun, no longer certain of how many shots I had left, I approached the closet doorway. There would be no hesitation this time. I spun around the corner to see that the room had been hollowed out. It was much bigger now than it ever had been as a closet. Something had clawed away at the walls hollowing out an enclave in the dirt behind it, almost like a small cave or a tunnel. Astrid giggled. I aimed down to see her laying there in the floor. Relief flushed through me, as she appeared to be all right. Dropping down instantly and setting aside the shotgun, I scooped her up, tears welling. I wasn't going to lose her. I wasn't going to be any less than the father I always wanted. I could be more than my dread. For her and for Sharon, I had to be. Pulling her close to my chest with one arm, I grabbed the Mossberg in the other and stood. And that's when I heard that sound again. I pointed the barrel up to see a half glimpse of its face before I pulled the trigger. It was monstrously thin with broken teeth, frayed hair, and eyes like little black dots sunken abysmally far into its head. And on top, a decayed piece of clothing. Almost. The blast erupted from the shotgun, throwing my arm back. The creature hissed and hollered in searing pain. Reeling from the kickback of firing a shotgun single-handed while holding a baby, my grip slipped and I lost the gun in the shadows. Astrid stopped giggling as I ran. She must not have liked the sound of a Mossberg going off a few inches from her face. Her cries rang through the collapsed building as I attempted to navigate through the dark. I had to get her out. At some point, 
I started to realize I was no longer on the first floor. The creature had dug tunnels out of the house, clawing a whole system into the dirt beneath the property. I prayed to God that there was a way out. Then I prayed that the man-thing not catch up to us before we found it. My mind wandered as my legs grew tired. I'd forgotten about the piece of door still jutting from one of them. I remembered a photo the real estate agent had shown me in an old newspaper clipping of the family that died. I started to limp. I could hear water running up ahead. Was the daughter wearing a bonnet? I couldn't catch my breath. Could we end up like them? I needed to make it to the water. We won't end up like them. We burst into the moonlight, straddling up to the edge of a creek where the tunnel let out. The thing from the chimney must have used it as a water source. It was still pretty dark, and my legs were all but useless, but I walked anyway. By the time we got back to the house, it was almost dawn. It felt like ages since I dropped through the floor, but in actuality, it was barely 20 minutes. Sharon had called the police, but they hadn't arrived yet. She was pissed, threatening to divorce me, to turn me in, but it was just nerves. I sat her down and I cried and I tore the veil. I told her everything. The chimney, the grate, the cat, the real estate agent, the tunnels, and the bonnet. Half of it she believed, half of it she didn't. But she knew that I didn't try to hurt Astrid. She knew that I believed it, and she knew my dread was real even if the monster in our basement wasn't. When the police did pull up to the house, we told them I'd just fallen through a bit of structurally on sound floor, but that I got out on my own and everything was okay now. They thought that was odd, but they shrugged and helped me patch up my leg. One asked about the de-hinged door on the way out. I told him we were doing renovations. Sharon and I talked for a long time that day, about things that we hadn't openly discussed in a long time. We talked a lot the next day too, and many times in the weeks that would come. We started taking steps towards the parents we wanted to be. One of those steps was renting an apartment in Dreary, well, we renovated the floor and sold the farmhouse. We needed a second fresh start, one not driven by a desire to run away from the past, but rather by the desire to forge a better future. And maybe a house that didn't have any secret rooms or basements. I guess I started to believe in a bit of folklore after all, mainly because there is some truth to most legends. It's just that what they don't tell you is that the true parts are the ones you make true for yourself. I know that now. I am more than my dread. Most of us are. Hey, I'm not sure if this story is interesting, but I wanted to share. I'm a 35-year-old woman who works comfortably in an office job. I have a nice home, I hang out with friends, I work out, and I make up excuses to why I can't work out today, but definitely will tomorrow. I'm mostly normal, average even. I'm not fishing for compliments, I just know what I am. But I can't keep a guy around. I didn't even know how to start meeting good guys until a few years ago with the boom of the dating apps. Just in case this is being read years in the future, or the past, who knows what's going to happen. But in the mid-2010s, it became totally normal to meet people online for all various levels of intimacy. You want a simple date? There's an app. You want a full-on relationship? There's an app. You want to just hook up? No worries. There's an app all up and down the line. And most of the time it was alright. Occasionally you'd find someone who was looking for more or less than you, but most of the time it was just fine. The worst, of course, were the liars and the lunatics. I had to deal with a lot of five foot six guys telling me they were six feet tall. A lot of guys using photos from their high school years when the hair was bountiful and the chins were singular. Not that I have an issue with any of these, just don't try to hide it. Now, just so you know about me, 
I'm a normal looking girl. I'm not going to turn heads, and I'm not going to make you divert your eyes in disgust. Like most women, I wish I was taller, thinner, and had better boobs and a bigger ass, etc. But I also love to eat and not work out, so, you know, what can I expect? See, I'm honest. After striking out a few times, I'd even had some friends look at my profiles. They'd try to jazz it up, but I wanted people to know what they were getting. I'm an average girl with an appetite for life who doesn't want to be alone anymore. Then, of course, you had the straight up lunatics. I've had several dates where guys were mostly interested in seeing my toes. One was interested in putting my toes in his ears. One man asked if I could record myself snoring. A few really just wanted to have sex in the bathroom. One wanted to have sex on the bar. I said no to all of those things. I'm not here to shame anyone. It's just that it's a lot for a first date with a stranger. And I don't mind the random one-offs, but those can be costly. Too many of those can weigh you down, you know? The whole dating experience wasn't all awful. I had a few great ones. First, there was Sam. He was so sweet. We went out and immediately hit it off. He took me bowling, which was surprisingly fun. He was kind and cute. I took him back to my place and had my way with him. He was amazing and really showed me how great these apps can be. But that lasted about a week. Then he was just gone. And I was alone again. Which brings me to Bill. Bill was a rough one. On our date, he took me to Honest to Goodness Rodeo Bar. We drank too much and tried the mechanical bull. The thing launched my ass almost immediately. Bill lasted for a while and then went down hard. He fractured his arm right there, but he didn't want the night to end. We went back to my place for dessert, but just like Sam, in a few weeks he was gone. These were two of several success stories, but that's not why you're here. You want me to go back to the lunatics, so here's the worst one. John. John was your average liar and lunatic. His profile said he had an explosive personality. His photo said he had lots of hair and a beard and muscles. All false. We went out to eat at an average restaurant. He ordered a forgettable meal and drank table water with it. He essentially looked and acted like a Lego person. Just a blank, nothing with some stray hairs around the top. The date was going nowhere fast. He didn't ask any questions and all of mine received one word answers. He walked me to my car and I quickly slipped in, saying bye as I drove off. That was supposed to be the end of the date. I went home, drank half a bottle of wine, and passed out in my bed with my vibrator. I woke up hours later to the sounds of pans clanging in my kitchen. I shot up out of bed and went downstairs. The house was dark and I could feel my skin crawling. Like I knew something was wrong before I knew what was wrong. The kitchen light was on, and it smelled like... bacon. My kitchen is small. You walk in, and there's an island in the middle with cabinets underneath. On the other side is the stove slash oven, the fridge, and John cooking something. John was wearing only my apron and cooking bacon. His lower half was covered by my kitchen island, but I could tell there was nothing else on him. Uh, hello? I muttered. I should have screamed something more threatening, but the whole situation was so surreal. Honey, you're awake. He turned a smile, ear to ear. I was about to wake you, sleepyhead. I wouldn't want you missing today. His smile never broke, even when he shouted as he went back to cooking. I felt like I was dreaming. It's two in the morning, John. What are you doing here? Wait, how do you know where I live? I wish that I had a weapon, my vibrator, a bra on, anything. <laughs> Honey, you're killing me. What am I doing here? This is my house. Where else would I be? Would you like some juice? Sure enough, there was a glass that resembled orange juice on the island. I didn't keep juice in the house. Funny joke. Please leave now or I'll... 
I started to approach him when slam. He whacked my skillet onto the counter so hard he cracked the tile. I work so hard for this family. Here I am making you breakfast on our 35th wedding anniversary, and you can't even sit and drink your juice? He shouted. His face was turning red, but his smile never faded. I can't believe you made me raise my voice like that. He then returned to his usual tone, especially in front of Tiffany. Who the hell is Tiffany? I shouted. Honey, you're a riot. Don't tell me you forgot today was our daughter's birthday. John took his hand off the pan and reached down. He pulled up the body of a woman. She was very pretty and around my age. She was clearly drugged as he flung her onto the kitchen island. She let out a soft groan. Now, now, Tiffany. Surely mommy is kidding. She knows today is a special day. He took out a knife and held it to Tiffany's neck. Mommy knows today is special, and trying to leave the house today will make daddy very unhappy. His smile never faded. Now, mommy, drink your juice. I did not want this woman to die in my kitchen. I also didn't want to drink that definitely not juice. I walked up my kitchen island. The bacon was burning at this point. I quickly tried to assess my situation. John was naked with my apron on. He had at least a knife. Tiffany was dressed and alive but not completely with us. She was bound at the wrists and ankles. I was armed with my knowledge of my own home and abilities. That juice was definitely not juice. I walked up to the cup. My hands were honestly trembling, so my dropping it looked fairly natural. He froze and turned slowly. Rage in his eyes, smile plastered to his face. Sweetie! I cooed trying to get ahead of the situation. Can you stop cooking bacon? I don't like my food overcooked. His look softened. He looked at the near, cremated scraps in my pan. He smacked his forehead playfully as if he forgot. Duh! He chuckled. Of course, honey. Let me pour you a new drink. I walked around the island so I was next to him. He was fully erect under the apron. He went to get another glass. I'll get the broom for the glass. I shouted as I started to turn away. You'll sit the fuck down and do what you're told. He shouted. Tiffany groaned. You hear that, honey? Tiffany doesn't like it when mom tries to leave daddy. He placed the knife again on her neck. And we don't want her to cry, do we? I sat down at the island. No, sweetie, we don't want that. He relaxed and went back to the oven. You know, I can always go to... Go? John shouted. Why do you women always have to go? I'm trying to make a beautiful Christmas dinner, and everyone always wants to go. He threw the replacement glass against the wall. Honey, it is a mess in here. Pick up the glass with your fingers while you still have them. I froze in shock. Now! He shouted. I jumped and started to pick up the tiny shards of glass. I started to cry. Not because of the pricks I got from the glass, but because I hated feeling this helpless. By the time I was done, John was standing over me. I tried to change the story. Wow, sweetie, you really are such a big, strong man. You do such a great job providing for me, and... Fuck. I forgot her name. Tiffany! He screamed. How do you forget your own daughter's name? All of you bitches are so self-centered. Here I am, a nice guy who works hard and I get nothing. He was now groping Tiffany with one hand while lightly scraping the knife along her back. I'm glad she was barely conscious for this. You have me? I screamed again, trying to play along. I didn't want anyone to die in my kitchen. You have me and this beautiful house that you built? He stopped with the knife and took his hand off her. He never stopped smiling. It's time for my present. He hissed. For our anniversary? No, it's my birthday. John again shouted. He went into a brief rage and sliced Tiffany's cheek. 
She started to wake up a bit. I can't believe how awful of a wife you are. Do you know how many other women have died because they weren't special like you? So many. His face was blood red, but he never stopped smiling. But you're just like the others, and I need to teach you a lesson. I need to give you my present. He grabbed Tiffany by the hair and dragged her. He grabbed my hair and did the same. He opened the door to my pantry and slammed it shut. He dragged us into the living room, but a car drove by, illuminating the room for a moment. No, not in here, he muttered. Where can a man do some thinking around here? He shouted. He started to rub his still hard junk on Tiffany's face through my apron. The basement, sweetie. At the end of the hall. I stammered. I know where my own goddamn basement is. He shouted back. He dragged me and Tiffany into my basement. He had trouble opening the heavy door, but he managed. I knew the game was almost up with him, and if something didn't happen soon, I would be dead. He kept muttering to himself about how underappreciated he is. After decades of hard work trying to build a family, this is how you treat me? I had one last move to pull. Sweetie, we were just kidding. Tiffany and I didn't forget about your birthday. Your present is in your man cave. I indicated the door to the basement. He stopped holding the knife to Tiffany, who was starting to come around. It is? He was puzzled, but then remembered his own sick fantasy and corrected himself. Of course it is, he said pleasantly. He dragged us over to the door. And this present better be everything I want. He caressed himself and licked the knife. You'll see. I don't want to ruin the surprise. I spat out. Hmm. Let's go. As a family. He dragged us to the door. I want to always remember this perfect moment. He stopped talking when he opened the door and the light automatically turned on. What the hell? He let go of Tiffany and me and started to dry heave. The cold air of my walk-in freezer wafted over us, as did the smell. I took this opportunity to lunge, mouth open, and took a bite out of his throat. I gulped it down and he looked at me in shock. I grabbed what little hair he had left and yanked him back like a Pez dispenser. I took two more big bites out of his neck and let him fall to my floor. Like I said, I don't like my food overcooked. John clearly was not expecting to see the bodies of my previous dates. There were a few in there. Most of them have been eaten down to the bone, but I recognized Billy by his broken arm. As John convulsed, gurgling blood, I took another bite out of his neck. I'm an emotional eater. I now had two problems. The first was that my freezer was getting full from these dates, and I hate to see some food wasted. The second was, Tiffany, well the poor girl should not have been dragged into this. She not only saw my pantry full of dead men, but saw me eat a guy. As a feminist, I've never eaten a woman before, so I don't know what to do. Tiffany, who was now fully back with us, started to talk. Okay, Tiffany muttered. Now I understand why you didn't call the cops. I chuckled in acknowledgement. I just want to go home. Tiffany said as she undid her bindings. I didn't see anything. I don't know you. I don't know where I am, and I just want to leave. My name isn't Tiffany. You don't know me. We are strangers. I just worked with that guy. He used to leer at me every day. We had a company hour, and he drugged me. He threw me in a trunk and called me Tiffany. I don't care what you do with him. She started to stand up. Just let me leave. I'll never come back. Swallow him whole if you can. No one will miss him. I remained silent, contemplating the ifs. She started to back away and then turned to run. She was still a little drugged, or she might have been faster. She made it to the stairs before I got her. I took her down swiftly and aggressively. I immediately bit her ankle tendon to keep her from running. I then dug into her midsection teeth first. 
I was so stuffed when she finally stopped squirming that I had to undo the drawstring on my PJs. I didn't want her to die in my kitchen. I didn't mind if she died in my basement. She knew John. Even if she didn't tell anyone right away, there's too much of a connection. And well, he was eaten is a tough story to sell to law enforcement. If he gets reported missing and they reach out to people in the office, and if someone saw John and Tiffany leave and only one comes back, it could be enough to crack her. I would have to move, and how many houses have a storage freezer in their soundproof basement? In this economy, it would be a whole thing. Eating Tiffany just made things easier. Sorry, Tiffany, but you had to be dessert. I woke up the next morning in a haze. I was in a food coma and bloated as hell. Thankfully, it was a Saturday, so I had the whole weekend to meal prep. While cooking John, I rummaged through his wallet. I found a business card indicating that he worked in an office park across town. I drove his shitty car there, walked a few blocks, and then ordered a cab home. I'm sure John and Tiffany will be reporting, but there's nothing to connect them back to me, just like my other dates. I then spent the rest of the weekend cleaning and eating. John might have been the worst, but he tasted amazing. Even though I like to spread out my dates, every time I thought of what John did to me, I would eat more of him. Even if I was already stuffed. Like I said, too many one night stands can really weigh you down. Tomorrow, I'm definitely going to work out. I also updated my online dating profile. I am now fully open to meeting up with women. Tiffany was delicious and the way I figure it is that as a feminist, I'm an equal opportunity eater, and couples, you know, for cheat days. Sure, I may be different, but at least I'm not a liar. Daddy, did you hear the man last night? My eight-year-old son asked. I was in the middle of making a light breakfast on an early Saturday morning. Buttered toast and a small plate of scrambled eggs to go with him. I turned around to face him, a spatula in hand. What man? I asked. In the back of my mind, he was obviously telling me about a dream. Or had overheard me from my bedroom talking to my wife, who happened to be on a business trip. He was screaming very loudly. He was outside my window. He said, big blue eyes staring up at me curiously. My stomach pitted as if it were emptying out onto the ground. A cold dread began to fill it like sludge. It wasn't only the idea of him hearing a man, but the fact that the man had been screaming outside my son's window, which happened to be multiple feet off the ground. I started running through the list, trying to find a reason why my son would possibly lie to me. What was he saying? I asked. I put the spatula down and sat next to him. It was the least I could do to humor myself. He was screaming at me and asking me to help him. He kept telling me to help him over and over again. It was scary. My son replied. I'm sure it was. And I rubbed his arm softly. But he disappeared after. My son finished and he took a big bite of his cereal bar. Where do you think he went? I don't know, but his screams kind of just faded away. It took a while for it to stop. I could still hear it from far away. I bit my lip thinking. Out of all the things he'd said, that one got to me the most. The screams. Fading. Granted, my son does have quite the imagination. But to add the fact that the man's screams faded away, slowly, added a disturbing detail to an otherwise banal lie. Well, I said standing up, I hope he doesn't come back, or else I'll knock his block off. I tussled his hair and went back to making my breakfast. Oh, I don't think he'll be coming back, my son replied. I stopped, turning back to him. 
I tried to look for a hint of smile. I waited for him to say, gotcha, with a big grin spreading across his innocent face. But all I found was my eight-year-old son, biting aimlessly on his cereal bar, staring out the kitchen window, oddly enough. I took a deep breath, trying to push it to the back of my mind, but it kept coming back to me throughout the morning, and by late evening, it was all I could think about. So, I did what any father might do. For a brief moment, I considered what my son said to be true, and went to the garage and grabbed a ladder. Where are you going, Daddy? My son asked from the fence gate. I'm going to look for that man outside your window. I replied, hoisting the ladder against the side of the house. You won't find him there. Why not? Because he isn't anywhere. He's gone. I laughed and told him to go inside, and eventually he did. A trickle of discomfort passed through me. Kids, I thought. They can be really creepy sometimes. At first, I wasn't looking for anything. In the back of my mind, I still believed that all of this was a lie. Some nightmare my son had conjured and relayed to me as if it were reality. I climbed up the steps on the ladder. The brick wall climbed up and up and up with me until I was at my son's window. I cut my hands to my eyes, blocking the sun, and looking through the window. It was easy enough to see almost everything. I could see his bed clearly, and I imagined him sleeping there, peacefully in the dark. I imagined the man peering in through the same window. His face turned into a grotesque caricature, screaming at my son. A chill passed down my back and through my body. I assured myself that it was a dream, but a part of me still wanted to make sure. I scanned the ledge of the window for marks. Any kind. I ran my hand across it, seeing if hair would stick to my hand, or if any belongings might have dropped there, but I found nothing. I started to laugh. In spite of myself, I knew when I got back inside, my son would be laughing hysterically. I began my descent down the ladder, and that was when I found the skid marks. At first they looked like black streaks, something that would be mistaken for filthy runoff water. Staining the wall, but... This was not the case. The skid marks were in line, one after another, no doubt the marks of shoes climbing. I climbed back up the ladder slowly, following the marks up to the window once again where they stopped. I checked around the ledge once again, but this time I took it a step further, examining the inside near the screen over the window. That's when I saw the scratch marks, tons of them, jagged and torn across the flimsy metal. Blood had dried across it, crusty and black. That was when I realized. Something in the back of my throat rose, but I swallowed it down. The skid marks on the wall, the scratches on the screen. The man was crying for help. This was certain. Something had been trying to take him, dragging him down as he climbed up. He'd been hanging on for life, begging my son, pleading, helpless. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. I leaned my head back and looked at the sky, the clouds, the mass expanse of blue wonder. My eyes fell from the sky down to the roof, to the brick wall. I stopped. Above the window, only a few feet away from my shutters, was a black stripe. Not just one, but many. A row of them. Skid marks. Shoe marks. I followed them down and down all the way to my son's window, and further down until they met the ones that led up to the window. A single line of marks, made from the shoes of a man desperate for life. My eyes looked back toward the top of the house. Tracing back the steps, I followed the marks again to the window. More blood, but this time, it was at the top of the window falling up and splattered over ever so slightly across the bricks, turning the cement between the edges a dark brown. The blood continued on up, disappearing completely beyond the roof, just as the shoe marks had. With my legs shaking, I began my descent down the ladder, keeping my eyes glued to the brick wall, noticing the small smudges of brown between the bricks. 
I finally reached the ground, throwing up in a pile of bushes near the corner of the house. My knees kept shaking, a cold shudder making its way through me. I stepped back a ways from the house to gain a full picture. Skid marks, blood on the bricks, leading up and up to the window. Scratches and more blood on the screen, leading up and up to the top of the house and disappearing forever. Of course he wasn't being dragged down, I thought, because he hadn't been going down at all. My son appeared in front of the window then, and he stared out across the backyard and spotted me and waved. I didn't wave back. I stood out there for God knows how long, studying the picture before me. I pictured the man, maybe the color of his eyes or his hair. How old had he been? My age? What had he been doing out so late at night? How had he found himself in my backyard? How had he found himself being dragged up the side of my house, screaming, crying, his fingernails being whittled away by the bricks, the blood streaming across him as he pleaded for his life? How had he found himself in front of my son's window, screaming at a helpless child for what it lacked in return, as if he might save him? And as the sun faded in the distance, the sky turning from orange to purple to black, the moon covered by an array of clouds, casting not even a shadow upon my house, I wondered. I wondered where the man had been dragged up to. I wondered as the clouds parted, the moon shining its terrible lights upon my house, what had dragged him up there? What had dragged him up to those endless depths? where silence lay steadily across the bottomless pit of stale darkness. And for a moment, I wonder if I'll be able to see it. Can you? Right there. Can you see it? Welcome viewers, or listeners. This is a message recorded by Michael Rubin, the head of IPO. Regarding the tape or transcript you are about to view or listen to, this is federal level intelligence, not to be shared elsewhere. Not even by word. Those who view or listen to the following media are legally bound to a non-disclosure agreement. Those who infringe upon this ruling will be pursued in the court of law by IPO and the government of the location of the viewer. This is an automated message. To those who may listen to this audio, be warned that it may cause distress or negative reaction out of individuals. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. This audio has been converted to a transcript for viewing purposes. Activity Log 1. This is Unit 14, Dr. Luis Bryce, recording Day 1's data and research log. I am Luis Bryce, born in Columbus, Ohio. I have a master's degree in marine biology, a bachelor's in biomechanics, alongside experience in working with new species and their discovery. I have been chosen carefully for this mission which will be referred to as Project Sepness. I am currently stationed in a habitat designed to withstand extreme pressure at the bottom of the marina trench. I am currently over 35,000 feet below the surface of the ocean, surrounded completely by darkness. The fall has lightly damaged the interior of my habitat, but will be repairable and habitable nonetheless. This recording will be the end of day one for me. I have been here for over six hours and am excited to explore the depths. The purpose of Project Sepness is to explore and investigate the depths of the trench, hoping to discover new chemical and medical related properties along the way. Tomorrow is the beginning of a new dawn, the first time anyone will ever swim in water this deep. My equipment includes a temperature-powered hyper-bright flashlight, multiple tools for self-protection, as well as a collection of samples and a syntactic foam bodysuit, allowing me to withstand the pressures of the water around me. Updates will continue as follows. Day 2, Week 1, Month 1, 
month two, month three, and so forth, until I feel that my exploration has reached its limits. And communication. Activity Log 2. This is Unit 14, Dr. Luis Bryce recording Day 7's data and research log. The week has been rather eventful and has shown great potential in our discoveries. I explored the area surrounding me, including the hydrothermal vents scattered around my location. The location of the habitat is approximately 40 meters from the true depth of the trench. I am sitting at exactly 35,000. 127 feet of depth, overlooking the maximum depth of 36,201. My area of exploration has proved fruitful to our expectations, verifying multiple hypotheses about the pressure's effect on minerals and organisms alike. I have discovered multiple new species of flora and fauna, which have proved to have extremely interesting ways of adapting to pressure and temperature change. Multiple flora have shown signs of developing defense mechanisms to prevent their own consumption from surrounding fauna. I am yet to receive any transmission for naming anything, but will refer to most flora and fauna by my own made-up and simplistic names for the time being. The most interesting of the flora would have to be what I will call Botres. Botres take on an appearance like that of a sunflower, but with rather flashy colors, including multiple shades of neon variants with its bioluminescence. These flora have extremely short stems, with thick and strong roots clinging to the ocean floor below. None show signs of horizontal growth, gaining some sort of energy by facing the surface exclusively. These flora have an active defense system, working as a stabbing mechanism to any possible approaching predators. I have learnt the hard way upon approaching it and will continue to practice more safe approaches while examining these beings. The first fauna I have come across will be referred to as Warians. These passive, vegetarian faunas tend to stick to the ocean floor, feeding on the bacteria and microorganisms that live on it. These creatures are clearly the bottom feeders in this ecosystem, as I found their remains in multiple locations surrounding the habitat. These creatures have a transparent, membrane-like layer of skin covering basic organs and cartilage-like bones. Their skin is made to specifically avoid reflecting any light, allowing itself to hide from whatever preys on it. Before I end the communication, I'd also like to share my findings of something rather odd. When inspecting the hydro vents, a loud rumbling could be heard closer to the maximum depth and the cliff that overlooks it. I am completely unaware of its origin but it can be heard in consistent pulses when near the edge. I will update the activity log on my findings as I progress through this ecosystem. End communication. Activity Log 3. This is Unit 14. Dr. Luis Bryce recording Day 30's data and research log. I have discovered multiple sets of organisms and am beginning to form a full food chain for the trench. In brief explanations, I have found three different flora and six fauna. The three flora will remain nameless as they perform simple but surprisingly beneficial tasks. The three flora seem to convert nitrogen and sulfur into beneficial bacteria and nutrients through a filter-like function located in what appears to be an aquatic flower. I have gathered multiple samples of these unidentified nutrients, as well as taken seeds from each plant found. The fauna all have basic functions in this ecosystem, mostly playing the role of basic predator and prey. The most notable have been the only two predators found thus far. The first predator will be referred to as the Mary Shark, named after this trench. 
This predator uses its triangular fins to push itself off the ocean floor. The Mary Shark possesses a crimson and gray color. Invulnerable to light and appearing in mixed patches over its thick body. This appearance and behavior are used to corner or attack fauna, using a goblin shark-like jaw to launch its short, barbed teeth at prey. This fauna has been found most commonly around the full length of 9 feet, and appears to be uninterested in my presence. I discovered this fauna as a carcass at first, clearly falling victim to a much bigger predator. The second predator discovered will be referred to as a sea raven. This ray-like predator sends gusts of water towards its prey in order to disorient it. It tends to swim wherever it feels fit, not sticking to a consistent location. This creature has also been seen laying eggs near different flora, not having any specific reproductive parts. To follow up on the pulses near the edge, the rumbling is beginning to grow louder. The depth of the noise itself is causing vibrations on the edge of the cliff, being the reasoning behind a near-death experience. As the rumbling grew louder, the structure below me began to crumble, nearly expelling me into the depth itself. I will continue to explore the cause of the rumbling and communication. Activity Log 4 this is Unit 14, Dr. Luis Bryce recording Day 60's data and research log. I have discovered multiple new flora of minor significance alongside two and a possible third fauna. The rumbling has grown loud enough that I can hear it 30 feet away from the cliff, vibrating the flora around me. The habitat is beginning to grow multiple different species of flora on its exterior, which resulted in a requirement for basic maintenance in order to keep the lights going. Aside from adaptive flora, I have discovered something alarming yet intriguing. Across the cliff, I can see what appears to be a set of lights like mine, as well as a larger light hanging into the depth. The darkness shouldn't allow this, but it's clearly something worth exploring. Alongside the lights, the habitats surrounding are showing signs of possible human contact in the past. Multiple scratches and patterns can be found along the walls of the trench, showing odd signals and what could possibly be lettering. The two fauna discovered are both of a neutral hostility class, being omnivores as well as one showing the signs of mammal birthing patterns. This first new species of aquatic life could very well mean a source of cloning or reproductive revelations. And the creature is beautiful. The creature will be referred to as Hamas. With a tough height of scales, Hamas have a rather intimidating appearance, complete with short fangs and claw-like appendages and random numbers sprouting from the abdomen. The most appendages seen on an adult Hamas were what I have counted to be 13. These creatures can grow up to 26 feet long and are completely passive to my presence. The second fauna has... My apologies. It sounded as if something were knocking on the habitat. I'll just skip to the possible third fauna. This creature was spotted swimming directly above the habitat upon returning from more exploration. It seemed to be directly hostile to anything around it, tearing the carcass of a sea raven to pieces. It made odd squeaking and rattle-like noises while eating. Being larger than the habitat itself, for reference, the habitat is approximately 10 feet tall, with two rooms dedicated to my living and experiments. The creature sat on the experimental habitat, draping what appeared to be a thick tail over the window of the room. It had black coloring with spots of white along its hide, and could very well be over 80 feet long. I slowly approached the habitat, unaware of what could possibly happen upon being noticed. In regards to the lights across the cliff, they stand in the same location, still without any features. 
The rumbling has slowed its pace slightly, however, now sending visible ripples into the water above it. End communication. Activity Log 5. This is Unit 14. Dr. Luis Bryce recording Day 93's data and research log. It has been a rather eventful past month, with multiple happenings that could very well affect my own safety. Soon after recording last month's log, the habitat was blocked in by the creature I'd seen before. I have now seen its face, and can now confirm that this creature has to be the apex predator of this trench. After approaching the habitat, I hid from the view of the window and washed through my hiding spot as it appeared to investigate my location. The creature's face has a sloped, cylinder-like connection to its body, like that of an eel. Its face is composed of a massive mouth that extends in a humanoid way across the face, containing god knows how many teeth. The creature also showed some form of unorthodox senses appearing to be listening or smelling with a large flap of skin extending around the base of its face, folding out into a direct sphere to possibly intimidate prey. Next to the two black eyes it possesses are two bioluminescent spots, appearing to even project an actual light into its surroundings. Needless to say, the creature poses a threat to my location and my own safety. I have limited some exploration due to this circumstance, but have done further discoveries on bacteria and other organisms. Upon taking fauna into the habitat, their forms have changed drastically. I have sent pictures through transmission and have received proper instruction on how to proceed with sampling. I have discovered some of the fauna to be edible, and some to even contain psychedelic effects on the human mind. Some of these effects are audible and visual hallucination, extreme visualization of surrounding audio, and basic disorientation. After consuming worryans, these effects have been present in myself. They wear off after about 7 hours, but leave for a hungover stay, including headaches and body pain. The most common hallucinations experienced were lights passing through the windows, as well as knocking on the habitat. I am requesting immediate dismissal after I send my next transmission. End communication. Activity Log 6. This is Unit 14. Dr. Luis Bryce recording Day 94's data and research log. I have finished my exploration and am requesting extraction and dismissal from my post here. I have not received transmissions from IPO in over two weeks, and am unaware of the reasoning behind the lack of communication, but worry for my safety. I will be sending two more activity logs to ensure my extraction is in progress. Activity Log 7. This is Unit 14. Dr. Luis Bryce recording Day 95's data and research log. I still await extraction, but will continue to inform you of the happenings. I left the habitat soon after the last log, and discovered something odd. Two of the lights on the other side are now completely non-existent, only having the presence of the middle one left. Alongside this, the sudden intensity of the growling, knocking on habitat can be heard in distance. What the hell is that? I'm not just hearing things, am I? I could have sworn I heard some knocking from behind me. Regardless, the rumbling is now growing in intensity, and is beginning to show signs of a possible intelligent life form providing the source of it. The growling has been forming full words with Morse code, none having any significance to my location. I will send another activity log tomorrow, with a full record of the Morse code. E. Growling Morse code translating to Abandoned and Communication. Activity Log 8. This is Unit 14. Dr. Luis Bryce recording Day 96 data and Research Log. I yet again await extraction, but will continue to inform you of the happenings. The third light is now missing from across the depth, 
I am completely unaware of its whereabouts, but am beginning to grow paranoid about its connection to the growl. As I discovered the light going out, the Morse code began to become even faster. Upon the first day, I was able to record the following words and numbers. Grass needs 13 deceased market. I am completely unaware of the meaning behind the words, but more has been said and show meaning. Abandoned light deep, 13, 13, 13. The number 13 was repeated three times, alongside the numbers 1 through 14 being repeated four times. Two of these words apply to the current situation, guaranteeing intelligent life forms creating these noises. Those words being light and deep. I will update you once more tomorrow, but that is if you're on your way. End communication. Activity Log 9. This is Unit 14, and I'm starting to get really pissed off. Where the hell are you guys? You told me this was a two-way mission, and I'm starting to think it was a load of bullshit. Look, I'm sorry to be rude here, but my safety is at risk. The lights are back again, but I'm not sure how. This time they are appearing far closer, almost as if they're floating over the cliff. They're fully visible from the window of the habitat, shining over the edge of the full depth. The growling has completely paused for some reason, and... Oh my god. What in the hell? The lights are gone again. They keep randomly disappearing without control. I'm in no mood to investigate, but I'll watch. Knocking can be heard from different spots of the habitat. Since this is an audio recording, you can't see what I'm seeing, but it's really weird. The lights are flickering in the habitat, but in a really weird way. Oh no. End communication. Activity Log 10. This is Unit 14 requesting immediate help and extraction. It's staring through the window and hasn't moved all day. I've kept the lights off after the flickering and can only see because of the bioluminescence. Please come get me, I'm begging. Please send someone, please. Please, I'll do anything. I have a family. I just want to see my wife again. Help me. I just want to go home. Its lights went out and I don't know why. Please come help. The growling morse code translates to left us, 13 abandoned, and communication. Activity log 11. This is unit 14. It's now day 99. The creature is still in its same spot, waiting for me to do something. It knows I'm here. You rich assholes just send us in to do your dirty work. Tell us you'll bring us back out once we're done, but you lied. This was doomed from the beginning. You don't care about your workers. You leave us to die. I was supposed to help the world and share my findings. To revolutionize medicine. You goddamn liars. You lied to me. I'm gonna die down here. It heard me. I'm dead. It moved away from the habitat, but it's coming back. There's no doubt in my mind. The growling's back. It's saying something. It's saying, 13 of us. What on earth does that mean? 13 of us. It's saying something else. Hold on. It said, number 14. Number 14. Unit 14? Wait, 13 of us? It all makes sense now. I'm the 14th poor bastard you've sent down here, aren't I? Do you just wait for us to die and move on to the next candidate? You bunch of assholes think you run everything, don't you? I'm never getting out of here. Please just kill me. Come back already. I can't take it anymore. I've had it. What is that damned knocking noise? I'm going to the window. Oh my god. There are carcasses stacked outside of the habitat. That's what the knocking has been. Body parts. Human body parts. Unit 7, Unit 3, they're all here. It's come back. 
And then all that can be heard is crashing and screaming. Transcript ended. Please remove the disc. Transcript ended. Please remove the disc. I can't make any of this up. None of my friends or family will believe me. They think I'm dreaming. You'll believe me, right? I'm scared. Shocked. Guilty. Confused. Three nights ago, I went to the psych ward with a group of camp members to volunteer in visiting the kids that were there and to give them some money that we raised. When we arrived, the nurse assigned me room 93. Inside, there was a girl that was very lonely. She told me that the girl was horribly ill, and they couldn't do anything to save her. So they left her to her fate, and didn't bother visiting often as it was pointless. I felt bad and I went in. Room 93 was very vacant. No nightstand, no rug, no comfort. Just grey walls, a small window with a boring view of the rooftop next door, a chair in the corner of the room, and a hospital bed with many machines and heart monitors. And in the bed, there she was. I didn't know her name, but we talked. Even if I was too afraid to at first, she told me things like how when nobody was with her, nothing mattered. But when I was there, something did. She also hated being alone, how she was a prisoner to this ward and her fate, how she wished she was free. She told me about how when people visit, it's not often she will see them again, and how heart-wrenching it is to see them walk out the door while she just lays there. And that's how her abandonment issues started. She begged me to please not leave, even after visiting hours. I couldn't say anything. I didn't know what to say. I felt as if I was too afraid to speak. So I only nodded at her request and sat in the chair that was provided at the corner of the room. For many hours until it was time to go. There were very few moments where I would stand and go to her. At one point, she would talk about how loneliness got to her and how she was always afraid of people visiting because she knew they'd leave. Once again, she begged me not to leave and that she didn't want to die alone. I could only nod again. I felt horrible for her. A young teenager, so ill to the point no nurse nor doctor would go in and check on her. Her fate was actually sealed. There was no way out. Even if there was a tiny chance, it was impossible. The only thing for her to progress was to die. I stayed for four to five more hours, until I understood why the other visitors had left and how the girl fell. My entire camp had left me there in this hospital. I guess they forgot about me. I'd have to walk home. I was getting sick and bored of staying here and every time I walked up to the girl, she would only ask me to not leave, and I'd nod. It was a loop and sometimes it felt like I was the one being abandoned in my deathbed and not her. I didn't want to leave her, but I couldn't stay here forever. Another hour had passed until I finally got up and went to the door, and she immediately called to me, asking where I was going, and begged me to stay. It was too much. I couldn't say anything to her. I didn't want to. Cold sweat ran down my face as I grabbed for the handle and she continued to beg me not to leave. She mentioned not wanting to die alone again, and I only heard a slight, I'll miss you as I left. But those were the last words I heard from her before I left the room. When I came outside, the lights of the entire hospital were still on. My eyes flashed with colors as I had been sitting in a nearly dark room for hours. Newly adjusting to the brightness, I noticed two of the nurses giving me looks of pity and unreadable discomfort. But they immediately walked away once I looked back at them. I was too tired to question it. So, I just went for the front door, and walked home until my feet felt like they were about to fall off. That night, when I finally returned home, everything hit me at once. 
The guilt for leaving the girl there to her fate as if she already wasn't dying. The thought of her having no one. The thought of her just being in that empty room. The opportunities she would have had if she never got sick. I decided I'd return to her the next day. Part of me wanted to get her out of there, but that part of me instantly shattered when I realized that just wasn't possible. I could barely sleep that night. All I could think of was the guilt and shame I had of leaving her. It was overwhelming. And if she was going to die alone because I couldn't tolerate just falling asleep in a chair and staying until morning, I would be absolutely furious with myself. I managed to get a few hours of sleep, but at 6 in the morning I woke up and rushed to the ward again. The receptionist only gave me a weird, disgusted look at why I was in such a panic. I explained to her I needed to go to room 93 as soon as possible, and that I would be visiting every day from now on. The receptionist stared at me as if I was a bug, and I wanted to rush her even more until she told me something I'll never forget. Sir? There is no room 93 here. All throughout Canada, a sizable handful of older folks claim to have seen a show titled The Big Room. At least, that's the most common title people use. Other people remember it being called In The Big Room or A Big Room, or some variation of those titles. Here are the accounts I've collected from people who've talked about it. Supposedly, the first known record of this show was in Toronto in the early 1950s and the last known record was in Vancouver in the early 1980s. It never aired on any one specific TV station, but would instead air on random stations depending on the date, and would only be broadcast on one or a few specific TVs at a time. Every single episode of the show was in black and white, even after the majority of the country had switched to color. What was the show about? Most testimonies agree it consisted of a large cast of characters getting into silly antics in a large room. No two episodes would have the exact same characters, but supposedly the cast consisted of a mix of puppets and people in costumes. Reports of the cast themselves vary, but the most consistent descriptions include a woman with a cartoonishly large nose, a person in a rubber cow mask who spoke entirely in mooing, a monkey puppet with gross human teeth, a person in an unsettling white rabbit costume, a man whose face was a smooth white mask with two black eyes and a smiling black mouth, a bird-like puppet with messy feathers, and the disembodied talking head of a teenage girl mounted on the wall like a stuffed deer. Due to the presence of Japanese text in some episodes, some speculated the show was of Japanese origin, though this was never confirmed. It's also worth noting that the show had only been viewed by children, and never by adults or teens. None of the reported viewers had been over the age of 12 when they had watched it. But what makes this show so infamous, and why so many people talk about it despite there being no footage or evidence of it existing? is the ending of each episode. At the end of each episode, the cast would all turn to the camera and thank the viewers, and then they would name drop the specific person watching right now. If there was more than one person in the room, the cast would mention all of their names too. Some children were frightened by this. Others found it flattering, and didn't realize the horror of the situation until they had grown up. I first heard about this show from my mother when she was telling me about some of the shows she watched back when she was a child in the 70s. I didn't think too much of The Big Room at the time. Sure, it was a little weird that the show somehow knew the name of my mom and her brother, but it must have just been a weird coincidence, or the result of distorted memories. It wasn't until I decided to look the show up out of curiosity that I started to become weirded out. There was no IMDB or Wikipedia page for the show, and CBC had no mention of it on any of their sites. 
I did, however, find a very compelling forum thread about it, so I immediately clicked. The thread was mostly filled with younger people closer to my age who had heard about the show from their older relatives, though there were a few older users who claimed to have seen it themselves. The more I read through the thread and learned about the show, the more interested I became. That was half a year ago. And ever since then, I've been asking around, both online and in person, see if I can find anyone else who's seen the show, or knows someone who's seen it. A lot of people I spoke to insisted this show wasn't real, and that it was the result of a bunch of collective false memories, or maybe even an elaborate ARG. But I still believed in it. Even if there was no evidence of this show anywhere, surely there were too many eyewitness testimonies out there to write it off as a hoax, right? I've always had a thing for lost media, and this was one of the most fascinating examples I knew of. My biggest breakthrough came when I spoke to Aaron, one of my closest friends about it. We were chatting over at our local coffee shop, and I decided to tell her about my search for the big room. As I described what I heard about the show to her, she just kind of casually nodded for the most part, but as soon as I mentioned the part with the cow mask, Aaron's eyes flew open, and her lower jaw dropped. Holy shit, Aaron said. My dad mentioned having an aunt who wore a cow mask and worked on a kid's show, and I completely forgot about it until now. We didn't hesitate. Aaron drove me right over to her parents' house to speak to her father, Paul. Aaron told her father that I wanted to know more about that aunt who wore the cow mask. He wondered why I was so curious about that weird old memory, but decided it wouldn't hurt to ask about it anyway. Paul explained that he knew very little about this aunt of his, and didn't even remember her name. He heard she worked on a kid's show, but didn't know what the show was called, and never saw any episodes of it. The aunt very rarely came over to their house, never more than once a year, but when she did, she was always insistent on wearing that cow mask, so he had no idea what her face looked like, and she never, ever spoke, instead making mooing sounds. He always thought she was weird, but usually didn't think much about her between each visit. Paul then told me his aunt passed away in the early 80s, which I realized conveniently lined up with when the big room was last seen. After she died, Paul's family was given the aunt's cow mask by the coroners, and they've kept it in a box in the closet ever since. I began to quiver with excitement. My friend's family actually had a prop from the long-lost kids show I was looking for. I politely asked if I could see it. He said yes. In fact, I could keep it. He had no use for that old cow mask anymore. I couldn't thank Paul enough. As soon as he handed me the box, I grabbed it from him and continued to thank him even after I walked out the front door. On the drive home, Erin congratulated me on my find, then told me that she had an appointment today, and unfortunately wouldn't be there to open the box with me. However, she said I could send her photos. Since she was just as curious to see it as I was, I promised I would. Before thanking her, she dropped me off at my house and drove away. In my bedroom, I opened up the box and pulled out the item inside, an ordinary looking rubber cow mask that was in surprisingly good condition for something that had apparently been created back in the 50s. I turned the mask over in my hands a few times as my excitement slowly waned. I couldn't help but wonder if this prop was legit or not. There was nothing to confirm it wasn't just a generic cow mask bought from a local store recently. Maybe Aaron and her father were just playing some kind of prank on me. If it was a prank, then it was an unbelievably elaborate one, given that Aaron didn't even seem to know about the show before I told her, and there would have been no way for her to tell her father in the time she drove me to the house. I took a few photos of the mask from different angles, promising myself to send them to Aaron and post them online soon. 
I then decided maybe a photo or two of myself wearing the mask would also be fun to see. I put it on, surprised by how comfortable it was for something so old and cheap looking. After taking a few selfies from both the front and side, I reached up to pull the mask off my face, but it wouldn't budge. For some reason, the mask felt a lot tighter on my skin and a lot warmer than when I had first put it on. The harder I tugged with both hands, the more it hurt, as if I was pulling on my own skin instead of a rubber covering. I began to panic and hyperventilate as the mask heated up more and more until it felt like I had a fever. The room began to sway as I felt dizzy and nauseous. I wanted to vomit before realizing that would make things worse. Sweat formed on my skin and my face began to itch like crazy, but the mask prevented me from scratching or wiping the sweat away. I grabbed my phone and desperately began to text Aaron for help. However, the phone began to ring while I was in the middle of typing the message. It said the call was from the big room, even though I didn't have that number anywhere in my contacts. I answered it anyway, just out of curiosity. Hi, Kelly, said a male voice that sounded pre-recorded. My hands trembled and I felt like puking again. How did this man know my name? The voice continued. We're really happy to have you as part of the big room. We unfortunately had to end the show a long time ago after one of our favorite cast members, Miss Moo the Cow Lady, passed away. However, now that you've agreed to become the new Miss Moo, we can safely say that our show will now be resuming production very soon. And don't worry about your friend Erin. We'll find a part for her as well. We'll be coming over tonight to pick you up. Until then, moo your heart away, Kelly. As soon as the message ended, the caller hung up. I was terrified and confused. I had a million questions dancing through my brain. What the hell is going on? I screamed out loud to no one in particular. At least, that's what I tried to say. All that came out was a loud mooing sound. There's nothing more terrifying than the feeling of being watched, at least with horrible monsters. You know the extent of the horror based on their image. There is, however, a deep-seated fear within us all. Fear of the unknown, the mysterious, the unfathomable, unseen horror that lurks just beyond where you cannot see with your eyes. The presence of cameras should come as a comfort against that horror. They show you hopefully for the better, what the thing is lurking around the corner. They show you areas you cannot see, thus there shouldn't be any fear of being seen by something you cannot see. This is all to say, cameras take away that fear. What is that fear replaced by then, when the cameras begin watching you? I'm working this summer as an intern in an office, not a cubicle farm by any means. The offices are separated from one another down one hallway. The hallway has two glass doors at either end. Both lead outside. There's also a large conference room towards one end of the office, right next to one of the doors leading outside. Most of the time, me and my fellow intern are alone in the office. Ever since working from home became a big thing, other coworkers don't show up nearly as often. Well, the two of us are required to come in, while this was a little aggravating at first, it's actually been great. There's no one to come in and tell us what to do. We can work at our own pace, and we can generally do whatever we want. This is within reason, of course. We're still expected to do our work. Usually, this translates to working hard for a bit, goofing off for a bit, but still meeting the deadlines the company has set out for us. I usually come in in the morning at 8 a.m., this gives me some time to get coffee and get settled in before starting work. The office has also gotten into setting up cameras around the place. There was already one pointing at the parking lot out the back door of the building, just to see if someone tries to break in. 
It also served the purpose of finding out who didn't lock the door when they were the last ones out of the building. It's mostly used for the latter, tracking them down and telling them about the importance of keeping the office space locked. Other than that camera though, there are cameras sitting around the office space. The company is only testing them out for now. Instead of drilling holes in the walls to mount them, they decided it would be better to set them up and see if they work well before actually putting them up. The cameras are sitting on top of buckets, and they are pointed around various angles. As you enter through the back door, you are immediately in a hallway that leads to the front door. The back door leads out to the parking lot behind the building. If you turn immediately left, there's a short hall, about 20 feet long and 15 feet wide. That leads to another door. I don't ever go in there. It's a rental space that the company rents out to another company. I don't know the details. Going forward, the hallway that leads from the back to the front is about 100 feet long and similarly about 15 feet wide. The office space has dotted along either side of the wall's doors into office spaces for different people. On the left wall, the walls are as follows from the first door to the last door. Storage room, break room, hallway that leads to restrooms and warehouse, office. Similarly, the right side is as follows. Manager's office, 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 conference room. It's also worth mentioning that the hallway where the restrooms are down is about 5 feet wide and 15 feet long. It ends in another door with a small window in it that leads to another office space connected to a warehouse. There's usually only one guy that works in there, and he pops over every so often. The conference room is where me and my fellow intern, we'll call him John, do most of our work. We have company provided laptops that we do our work on, and we just sit at the big table, our screens away from the door. John usually gets into the office at 9am, an hour after I arrive. Now, about the cameras. Let me tell you where all of them are. The first camera was up to the left of the back door, down the hallway as you enter, aimed at the back door. The second was further in the center hallway, aimed from the outside of the second office towards the front door. You could see the hallway leading to the restrooms and the front door. The third was settled across from the second, at the corner of the office leading to the restrooms. It could see the three offices on the right side of the office, and the storage room and break room on the other side. It also had a good view of the back door. This one I could see from where we sat in the conference room. The last one was situated outside the conference room and aimed at the front door. All of these cameras had a small camera feed in the storage room that could be connected via USB. They were constantly recording, and all of the data was saved to the cloud on a daily basis. Anyone could look at the camera feed by plugging in a device to it, so it was pretty handy to people inside the office. The first day this happened was a day like any other day of the week. It was a Wednesday, John and I had been working on an application for the company for the past couple of weeks, and we were just chatting. I was about to break from my laptop to go get lunch, and when I looked up from where I sat, and out into the hallway, I saw the camera. The camera had been sitting atop the bucket of paint, like normal, except the camera had been turned to face down the hallway towards the other office's door. I stared at it for a few moments, a chill running down my spine. I looked over at John. I had been sitting next to him since 9am, but asked anyway, Did you move that? I pointed at the camera. John looked up and over at the office camera. No, I didn't. We both stared dumbfounded at the camera that had seemingly moved by itself. My mind fired off explanations for this occurrence, but was struggling to come up with anything coherent. Eventually, I landed on the idea that the other guy from the next office dropped by and bumped the bucket. He doesn't park in the same parking lot, so it would make sense why we wouldn't know he was there. I glanced up and down the hallway. Nobody was by the front door, and nobody was by the back door. All of the offices were closed and locked. 
No cars were seen in the parking lot, save for mine and John's. We were alone like normal, but it didn't feel like it anymore. I went over to the camera. It was just sitting there, turned to face the wrong way. I reached down with my hand and spun it back to face the proper direction. I walked down the hall to the break room and got my lunch ready. After that, nothing happened for a little while. The next couple of days were pretty normal. The next thing happened after the weekend on Monday. I was in at 8am again and I was alone. John hadn't arrived yet and I was sitting in the conference room, nursing a cup of coffee and trying to get a little work done. It was about 8.45 when I heard a noise. It sounded like a light scraping. When I looked, I was so startled to see the camera again. Except time, instead of pointing down the hall to the restrooms, it was pointed directly at me. I stared into its beady little red dot and it stared right back at me. This time, it was even more hair raising. I was certain I was alone and John was not here to move it. I didn't hear the other office door open or close either. I stood up and walked down to the door of the conference room. I glanced up and down the office again, but no one was there. I reached down, spun the camera back into position, and kept looking over my shoulder as I walked back into the conference room. If this was some kind of prank, it was elaborate and well done. I thought it would be a good idea to go check the camera feed to see if I could tell who was moving the camera. I brought my company laptop into the storage room, set it up, and plugged it in via a USB cord. The camera feed was live. It was aimed properly down the hallway after I moved it. When I started my internship, they walked us through how to operate the cameras and told us there were a few seconds of delay between real life and the live feed. I clicked through the application to find the saved recordings. I found the date that matched today and clicked on it. It popped open a new window in front of the live camera feed with a 50 minute video. I clicked through the hour and watched the camera feed of the problem camera. I could see myself in the start entering, dropping off my lunch, heading to the conference room, etc. From there it was silence until around 45 minutes in. I heard the same scrape I had when I was in the office but through the camera feed. There I was, sitting in the conference room. I looked up at the same time the scrape stopped and the camera feed cut over. I saw myself get up, walk over to the camera, and turn it back to normal. Then I saw myself walk into the storage room with my laptop where the video ended assumedly because I accessed the feed. I stood back dumbfounded. There was nothing else in the feed, but something had to have moved the camera. I remembered last week when the same thing happened, and closed the window to see if I could look at last Wednesday's recording. The first thing I noticed was that the lights around the office were blinking in the live feed. They were beginning to fade then jumped back to life repeatedly within a few seconds of one another. Then I noticed something else. There was something on the live feed. I looked down the hallway, just outside of the room I was in, and there was a person peeking around the corner that led to the other office space by the back door. It wasn't a natural kind of peeking, as natural as that can be. Their head was perpendicular to the wall they were peeking around at a strange 90 degree angle. Where the head was was unnaturally tall, seven feet above the ground. The thing had long black hair that dropped down to the floor, longer than seven feet. It made almost a pool of black tangled mess. The most terrifying thing of all, however, is that it couldn't be mistaken for a human. The thing didn't have a face. In place of a face, eyes, nose, a mouth, it had the large black lens of a dome camera instead. In the center blazed a large red LED light, blinking on and off, staring down the long hallway towards the room I was in. Even in broad daylight, it was hard to tell what it was with the blinking lights. The lights above made it almost disappear when they went out save for the red light which still blinked out of rhythm with the ones above. 
I recoiled from the laptop. It was all I could do to just stand there and watch. I was too afraid to leave. Too afraid to run. Too afraid to even move. I looked back at the door, then back at the screen. Its head began to move. The red light disappeared as it creaked back behind the corner, its long mess of hair dragging on the floor behind it. It disappeared, the light stopped blinking and it was quiet. I stepped over to the door, peeked out, and nothing peeked back. I slid along the wall and peeked around the corner, the thing I saw was standing. Nothing. I was well, and thoroughly freaked out at this point. I started whipping my head around to see if there were any other people. I was still alone in the office space. I went back into the storage room and accessed the camera again. This time looking at the other camera it had to be standing in front of while it was peeking. Nothing. No person peeking around the corner. Not a car driving in the parking lot. Absolutely nothing. I abandoned my laptop where it sat and walked back out into the hallway, checking around once more. The cameras were all pointed properly, all on and recording. I froze in my tracks and heard the back door open. I yelled out loud as I looked. You alright man? It was John and it was 9am. I took comfort in having another human being there and I eventually calmed back down. After explaining everything, John tried to reassure me there was nothing inside the building, and that there must be some reasonable explanation. It worked to calm me for a while, but after moving the cameras back into position, it didn't stop me from checking. I moved the camera feed as well, from inside the storage room to inside the conference room. I did this just in case I needed to quickly check. Every so often, I would just hook it up to my phone and cycle through all the cameras to see if something moved. Constantly streaming the camera feed was hell on my battery life, but it was worth it to make sure. Then the end of the day came. John usually arrives later and leaves earlier than me. He has a second job he usually runs to at around 2pm, but we were happy for such flexibility in an internship. This usually means that I'm alone again after that time between 2 and 5. It's when the sun gets a little lower. The quiet gets a little more eerie, like being in a liminal space. Maybe in the morning you're just too tired to care about how alone you are. At night your senses tend to think a bit for themselves. You become hyper aware of sounds and draw macabre conclusions about the circumstances. Then you write it off as just being paranoid. There's something different about a place when you feel like you shouldn't be there. Something deeply unsettling. By the end of the day, it was raining. Darkness ate the light outside and you could hear the clap of thunder after a brief flash of bolts across the sky. Rain should be comforting when you work. A relaxing patter ran across the windows of the conference room as I typed away. I was paranoid now, however, that comfort for me was damaged by an incessant need to look up towards the door. That paranoia had its own curiosity though. I remembered last Wednesday, the first time I noticed the cameras moved. I accessed the cloud recordings of the day on my phone, and looked at that first day when the camera was turned towards the other office. As lightning flashed, the feed pulled up. A dull rumble went through the room as I swiped my finger over the time, looking for something, anything, found what I was looking for. There was someone in the small window leading into the other office. The lights began to blink in the office space beyond the door, as they did over here the first time I saw the creature. In between the pulses, there was a single red light visible in the window. When the lights came back on, it was there. The thing with the camera face. It peeked through the small window connecting the two offices. The lights continued to pulse in the office. It just stood there for a short while. Finally, it moved. Between one of the pulses, I saw its head move through the door. Its body was half stuck in between the two offices. As it began pulling itself through without the door being opened. And then my phone died. The battery had run out. 
chills ran all around me, and I suddenly had the unnerving feeling of being watched. The lights outside the conference room began to pulse again. They sounded like they had when I saw the thing the first time. I glanced up at the camera outside the conference room just as a lightning bolt streaked behind me, bathing the room in a fading, eerie glow. Then the low rumble of thunder shook my core. I looked to see the camera pointed at me again. The lights in the office pulsed. This time it was all of them in the building, from the hallway to the room I was in. I quickly pulled the cord from my phone and jammed it into the laptop, not taking my eyes off the camera. The rumble of the thunder finally stopping. The live feed showed me tinkering on my laptop. With a few seconds of delay between my movements and the feed, then I saw it. The thing peeking around the corner and in the other office. Right outside the door. It was just out of my view, standing on the left of the frame around the corner of the door. The head of the creature was cut off of the upper side of the frame, but its long black hair still trailed across the floor. At that moment, its body was visible. It looked like a long gown, ragged and tattered. The skin was sickly and pale, as though coated in a sheen of white paint. The limbs were the worst part. Long, lanky, unnatural. At the end of its hands were sharp, jagged pieces of what looked to be a film reel. I saw its legs beginning to bend. The knees bent inwards. I heard a sickening crack from outside the door. Its legs shook and faltered as it lowered its head into the frame. The dome head of the camera lens came into view, staring into the camera, staring at me. The next pulse of the lights made the hall go dark. When the feed had returned, the creature was standing upright again. I saw it lean forward, its hair dragged across the floor. It was unnatural with no muscle, just sinewy movement that cracked and churned. Its head started moving towards the door, to look at me. I looked up at the door, watching, waiting for the thing to come into view. The lights continued to pulse. I stood up and stepped away from the laptop. I started considering my options. Run up and close the door. I was on the right side for it. There wasn't any way that could work, though, if it was right next to the door. Jump through the window. I was on the ground floor, but I'd need to somehow get enough force to ram into it. Smash the window. Smashing the window was my only option. The lights went dark, no longer pulsing. Off. I grabbed a chair and threw it at the window. Not a crack. I heard a sharp sound from behind me. It sounded like someone saying, Psst. When I turned around, I couldn't see the door. It was dark outside, raining, and the lights were all off. It was so quiet, so silent you could hear every drop of rain. I saw a red light in the doorway, blinking, staring at me. Then the lightning flashed illuminating the room for a moment, and that was all it needed. I saw it, in the doorway. It was crawling underneath the door frame, bending down to walk under it. The head tilted at me as the flash erupted. I thought I heard its neck crack as it did. It looked emaciated, thin, lanky, but with enough control to pounce. It creaked deeper into the room as the lightning faded. I was once again plunged into darkness, its red light simmering on me. I felt like screaming but was frozen with fear. It didn't move for a few moments. The only other way out was through the door it was standing in front of. It just stared at me, taking me in. It stood there for as long as the thunder rumbled. We stared at each other perhaps waiting for one to make a move. Lightning fast. Another lightning flash coated its body. It clambered onto the table in front of me on all fours. I saw a deep, gaping maw appear on its face. The dome camera split in half. When it opened this god-awful, mechanical mouth, I could see hundreds and hundreds of human eyes within, writhing, watching me, staring at me. 
Its maw extended deep into an unseen void that descended forever. I was gazing into a valley of stars, though it was just glints of light off the iris of the eyes. Blinking, watching, recording, they all gazed upwards to a light that would never be reached. Move, my mind screamed. As its head gnashed towards mine, I ducked my head, scraping it against the creature's chin. I heard the crash of glass as its face reconnected at the center of the seam. I dove underneath the conference room table, rolled to the other side, and sprinted into the hallway. Then towards my car, I could hear the thing fumbling behind me. The table sounded to be thrown across the room. I heard the scrape of metal on metal as it let out a howl so menacing it cut me to my soul. It sounded like a deep, metallic scream of a man in pain. I shouldn't have looked back as I sprinted towards the back door. When I did, I saw the red light gaining quickly. Lightning flashed again. Its arms were stretched outwards towards me, its mouth agape. The jagged film reel fingers reached out towards me trying to claw at my back. I sprinted harder and eventually crashed the door leading outside. I felt the rain coating my face, and I stumbled down into a puddle at the front of the door. I crawled the rest of the way out into the parking lot. When I looked back, the lights in the office were blinking again. The creature stood at the door, staring out at me, in between pulses, seemingly without moving its body. I got further away from the door. I saw it moving back a few paces, move back a few more on the next pulse. Then it went into the storage room, its head peeking out of the door. Finally, on the last pulse, it disappeared from view. The light stayed on after that, solid, bright, powerful, and safe if you didn't know what lurked inside. I ran to my car and got the hell out. I never went back to the office. Part of me wondered if there was another reason why work from home was so popular amongst our co-workers. I told John to not go in the office if he could help it. I didn't bother answering calls from the company and did everything I could to find something else. I don't know what that thing was, and to this day, I have a striking fear of dome cameras. I stare and wait for them to split open, to devour me whole. Don't talk. Don't move. Don't leave your bed. Three very simple rules. Three rules I should have listened to. You see, the house I live in is strange. Items are never in the same place twice. A certain chill resonates down your spine. And a woman comes around at 12 a.m. every single night. My parents recently bought this house. Nothing would seem out of the ordinary. The neighbors are all very nice people. The house is spacious enough. And it was practically a steal. My parents jumped on the buy as soon as it went up for sale. Now I know why it was on sale in the first place. The previous owners seemed spooked, for lack of better words. They were in a rush to move and sold it almost immediately to my parents. They wouldn't say much about the house when I was around, but just when no one thought I was listening, they would talk. They shared every last detail in a seriousness I've never heard before. Now, I wouldn't say my family are big believers in the unexplained, but this seemed to hit them like a sack of bricks. I thought they were crazy, that they just liked to tell stories for the fun of it. But then, they never looked like they were joking. It never looked made up. And so, the new rules were implemented on me. I didn't take them too seriously. Why would I? I go to bed at 10 p.m. anyway, and besides, what would an old woman do anyways? I laughed at the thought. But to appease my parents, I never left my bed at night. The days were fine. I went to school as usual, made friends, and hung out at the corner between Billy's Auto and Cliffy's Shoe. 
I made friends fast because summer was barreling down on me fast and I was determined to not be labeled as the lonely kid. The neighborhood was fairly safe, so me and a few friends would always take our bikes and any pocket money we had and ride down to the corner and play cards. The one that stuck out to me the most was Philip. In the short two months I've lived here, he was the one that stuck to me fastest. Mostly because we were interested in the same things. Girls, cards, and who could get laid first. Needless to say, we were best friends. My bike tire treaded along the fade in, split pavement as Philip and Julia jammered on about something or another. Do you two ever shut up? I joked. Julia gave me the finger. Oh, lay off. She deadpanned. Philip did a bunny hop with his bike. Jack, you got any gum? I took one hand off the handle bar of my dark blue BMX and patted down my pockets. Nah, but I've got leftover wintergreen. Philip scrunched his face up and shot me a weird look. No thanks. I still can't believe you chew that stuff. It'll ruin your teeth, you know. Yeah, then you'll definitely scare people away with your missing teeth and wonder why you're still a virgin at 45. Julia chimed in, laughing as she took both hands off her handlebars to balance no hand in. I scoffed and stood up to pedal faster. Screw both of you. I gotta spend my card money on something. I grumbled. Soon the alley came into view and the three of us stopped, our tires hissing at us. We didn't bother to use kickstands as we rushed deeper into the alley where two other kids were waiting. A boy and a girl. Good, you're here. I can finally kick your asses now. The girl said. Right, like, your win streak isn't totally crushed into the dark, Kayla. I said. She opened her mouth to retort, but the boy sitting next to her, Michael, cleared his throat. Just sit down and throw your money in. We each threw about 5 to $10 in the middle of the circle we formed and waited for our cards to be dealt. What game are we playing today? Philip asked. Michael furrowed a brow as he focused on shuffling. 31. Ever play it? We all gave approving hums and joked around until the brown-haired dealer was done. We each had three cards dealt to us and three plays facing up in the middle of all of us to see. Julia, being on the right of Michael, started us by swapping all three of her cards out. I looked at my cards, a jack of hearts, an eight of hearts, and a three of spades. 18 isn't a great start, and I definitely need that winning money for a new bike. Soon it was my turn, and I looked at the three cards down in front. I instantly eyed the king of hearts just waiting for me to take, so I did. Great 28 is a good enough score. So Jack, I've heard rumors about your house that it's haunted. Is it true? Kayla asked. I laughed and watched Philip take his turn, ending the round. If you want an honest answer, yes it is. It's not like anything you see on TV, no. Things just get moved around and it always feels like someone is right next to you, walking with you. We all flipped our cards to reveal our scores. Michael let out a string of curses as he realized he lost with a score of 21. Shit, I was counting on that money, he exclaimed, taking all the cards to be shuffled again. Huffing as he did so, we laughed at him as he grumbled like a child forced to eat their vegetables. Julia humored me and raised a brow. What about the woman that comes around during the night? Didn't the previous owners move out because of her? I snorted as I picked up the freshly dealt cards. Apparently, but I haven't seen her, and I guess I'm not supposed to. My parents said that I'm awake when she comes around to stay quiet. Don't move. And don't leave my bun. Philip chuckled and swapped out a six of diamonds for a ten of spades. Sounds like a bunch of BS. It is. I said taking a king of clovers in replacement of a seven of hearts. That's when Michael, who was sitting off to the side as to not get in the way of the game, perked up and grinned. Why don't you get proof? I mean, you say she's not real, but what if she is? I thought about it, 
and uneasy started to pit in my stomach. I don't know why, but I didn't like it. I don't know, guys. My parents aren't too fond of that woman. Philip laughed. Have your parents even seen her? Well, no, but... Exactly. Michael's right. We could get proof of her and debunk her down to just an old hag. Or are you actually scared? Like a wuss. I sighed. I still had a boiling uneasy, but I didn't want them to think I'm scared of someone who's probably not real. I jabbed Philip in the side. Fine, but you're coming with me. Perfect. He grinned. Philip and I walked into my house, which instantly gave me the chills. Mom, I'm home. My mom came out of the kitchen with a rag draped over her shoulder. She had a soft smile and caring eyes. Oh, sweetheart, you brought a friend? Y yeah, his name's Philip. Can he stay the night? I asked, crossing my fingers for luck. My mom went stiff as her breath caught. She walked over to us, her eyes still somewhat soft. Do your parents know, honey? She asked him. He nodded with a smile. Yep, I'm greenlit for the night. She exhaled and ushered him towards the dining table. Then she looked at him with a hand on my shoulder. She squeezed it tight. Do not stay up past 12, do you hear me? I felt the yawnies rush back up my throat. I don't know if it was her grip or the momentous glare behind her usual soft greens. But my palms became sweaty and a lump formed in my esophagus. I swallowed thickly and plastered on an easy smile. Mom, you can trust me, okay? She let go of my shoulder and sighed, rubbing her temple. Yes, of course I am. I'm just being paranoid. I mean, who even knows if she's real, right? She chuffed a laugh and walked back into the kitchen. I joined Philip and waited with him. Soon, my dad joined us and the four of us ate dinner and talked about mundane things. I grumbled about losing at cards while Philip laughed at my expense. Both of us ate dinner pretty quick, so we would have time to mess around before that night. After our plates were whisked away, we dashed to my room. Do you know the history on the woman? Philip asked, sitting down at the foot of my bed. I shrugged, sitting down on a red bean bag I had in the corner of my room. Only that she's been around a while and scared away all the tenants that lived here. I took off my jacket and stretched out over the bean bag. I guess she comes around pleading for help and if you so much as breathe too loud she comes for you. Philip seemed to mull over the information as his brow furrowed in thought. So what if we record her? Like, just prove she's a deranged old woman and get her sent away. I mean, what is she going to do? She'd pop a hip trying to get us. I laughed at the thought and nodded. Doesn't sound like a bad idea, actually. I sat up and popped my back. So, wanna play on my console or something? Philip stretched his arms out above his head. Yeah, started up. We gamed for a few hours until it was about 10 p.m., my dad knocked on the door and opened it a crack. Boys? Yeah, dad? He stepped in. You might want to head to bed soon. He said, giving me a hard look. I groaned. We will, dad. No need to stroke out. He huffed and crossed his arms. Don't give me that. Just go to bed soon, alright? Okay. Alright. Good night, both of you. We said our good nights, and I could feel the anticipation in my veins. I was still heavily uneasy, but that's normal, right? A chill ran down my spine, shaking me to my core. It felt different. Nothing physically changed, but an atmosphere was thickly lying down on us. Philip, you feel that? Philip craned his neck over in my direction. Feel what? You're going crazy. I blew it off as I shook my head. Nothing. Forget it. What's the time? He reached in his pocket to fish out his phone. 10.36. We've got some time. Wanna hop back on the game? No, let's just chill. One hour and a half was all it took. Just one hour and a half. My heart was thumping so loud I was sure Philip could hear it. 
Midnight struck as Philip pulled out his phone to record the woman. It was dark, the only light being my phone flashlight. My stomach was to my knees as almost instantly a woman came out of nowhere. But she didn't look normal. She was hunched over, had black where her eye whites should go, scraggly gray hair, and her skin. God, her skin. What was left of it was a discolored gray. It was falling off in chunks as her talon-like fingernails beat on my window. She wore no clothes, and her bones were visible in spotty blotches. Help. Help me. He's coming. She screamed. Her voice was otherworldly. It was as if someone distorted a dying dog's yelp. Me and Philip were frozen. My heart thumped in my ears as the blood rushed to my head. Philip's long-forgotten phone clattered to the ground as we stood shocked. What the hell? I stammered, unable to breathe. Philip seemed to regain his senses because he clenched his fist. Hey, woman, get the hell out of here. You hear me? Leave. He yelled, his voice bouncing off the walls in a panicked rasp. The woman stopped beating on the window and grinned maliciously. She took a talon and put it up to her lips in the universal shush motion. Shh. She blew out. And instantly, Philip's mouth was forcibly closed and he started choking. His face went beet red as he clawed at his throat, trying to cough or scream or something. He wouldn't say a thing. He fell to his knees, choking. The veins in his neck popped out and his face was terribly red. I tried to scream or move, but I couldn't. The invisible force was holding me still. My eyes flickered to the woman as she laughed so maniacally. Her distortion rang through the surrounding trees as she doubled over. Tears freely flowed like a broken faucet. I couldn't speak. I tried to thrash around and move something, anything. But no matter my efforts, I wouldn't budge. Then Philip dropped. No more struggle, no more coughing, no more of anything. He was dead. I wanted to scream, cry, and vomit as I looked at the sadistic woman smiling. Then she winked at me and snapped her finger. It went impossibly dark. When I was able to see again, it was broad daylight. I was laying on my bed and I had a raging headache. I sat and wondered for a second. I could almost pass everything off as a horrible nightmare. Almost. I saw the shine of a phone on the floor. I got up and picked it up to inspect it. Philip. It was undoubtedly his phone as the lock screen displayed me and him. Events of the night before rushed back in on caring spirits as tears sprung me again. I couldn't breathe. Everything was in a haze as my blood started to pump again. I ran out of my room, stumbling out on the hallway wall. Mom. Dad. Mom. Mom, please. I begged, breaths ripping in and out. My mom and dad rushed into the hallway and gasped at me. Jack. Jack, honey, what's wrong? My mom asked, putting her arms onto my shoulders. My dad stood next to her, worried eyes trailing me up and down. I heaved for air, saliva running down my chin. I I'm sorry. Mom, please. I'm sorry. I cried into her chest. Sorry for what? What did you do? My dad asked. Me and Philip looked at the woman and now... Now he's dead. My mom pulled away from me to look me in the eyes. Honey? Who's Philip? I sniffled. Snot shooting back up my nose. What? My parents shared Ani's glances. Jack, who's Philip? My mom said again. My head twisted as confusion bubbled up. You met him last night. He's my best friend. No, Jack. We know no one by that name. Are you feeling alright? My dad put his hand to my forehead. I jerked away, looking between them. My vision spun as nothing was making sense. You guys are crazy. 
I yelled, running back into my room, slamming the door locked. I fell to my knees and cried. My throat burned and my eyes felt stiff and sore. Philip was real. Philip is real. He had to be. But then where did he go? He just vanished with that... that thing. Whatever that thing was, she wasn't human. I pulled out my phone and sent rapid texts to all my friends asking about Philip. All of them giving me similar answers. Who the hell is Philip? Every. Single. One. Of them asked. I threw my phone against the wall in a fit of rage. How had they suddenly just forgotten my best friend? I was slumped against the walls, exhausted. My head fell to my knees as I fell asleep. That leads me to now. It's been two days since that incident. I haven't slept or left my room at all. I'm holding out hope that Philip will reappear, but every time the woman comes, she just sits and laughs for hours. Then as quickly as she comes, she leaves even faster. Whatever she did to Philip was grotesque and one day I'll know. But for now, I wish to say to all of you, never look at the woman in the window. I swear it all started out innocently enough. My wife, Carol, and I had fallen on hard times due to the pandemic. She'd gotten laid off from her position and my hours have been cut due to our clients tightening up their purses the last couple of years. We had a toddler, Marcia, and a cat to feed as well as ourselves. It was eating up our savings. We didn't want to be out of home. We were terrified. One night while we were sitting at home, she had, at least I thought, jokingly talked about creating an OnlyFans. We toyed with the idea a bit, and eventually her face got more serious, and she started talking numbers. I loved Carol. I trusted her, and honestly, we could use the money. We talked for a while longer about it, what our boundaries were on. We agreed that it wouldn't be anything outright lewd or erotic, and she suggested the idea of eating in front of a camera. Apparently it's a thing. Whatever, I guess. I agreed. It seemed harmless enough. It started out harmless. We set up a camera in our spare office facing the desk. Every other night, we would order takeout and eat in there while filming. She would post it wherever online. Things carried on normally like this for a couple of months. She'd order her own food, stuff herself in the other room while we ate at the dining table. I'll admit, the money was good. Good enough that it actually surpassed what she would have been making working a normal job. Carol bumped up to filming once a day. One day at lunch, and the other day at dinner. Of course she gained some weight, but hell, I'm no prime example of vigorous health. As the weeks went on, she spent more and more time filming these eating videos. We paid off the remainders of our auto loan. We put down a good chunk on our mortgage. We were able to start a college fund for Marcia. Our savings account was looking healthier than ever. Her health, however, wasn't looking too hot. She'd begun to lose breath quicker than usual. Eventually, she stopped coming on our family walks in the park. It wasn't a big deal. Just a couple times a week, we would go to stretch our legs. After a while, she said she would prefer to stay home for the time being. At this point, I started to get a bit more concerned. No amount of money is worth throwing away your health. Even if our insurance would cover whatever came up. I remember talking to her about it. That maybe she should slow down with her project. And maybe even cut it off entirely. She was furious with me. She cried. She asked if I still loved her. Of course I told her I do. I did. She was the love of my life. She'd given us our beautiful daughter. I caved in and just pleaded with her to be careful. As a few more months passed, we saw her less and less. She moved a television into the office. 
She got a larger, more comfortable chair to sit in. She'd gained so much weight in half a year, I didn't think it was possible, and I knew sure as hell that it wasn't healthy. She was having trouble standing without aid, and it seemed like she almost wouldn't fit through the door to the office if she tried. I confronted Carol once more about it, and I swear I have never seen my wife get so furious. She was red in the face as she waved her hand around the house. Keep your goddamn nose out of my business. This entire house and you are being paid for by my work. If you don't support me here, then I will find someone who does. Our daughter had peeked in and began crying. It was horrible to see her like that. I couldn't argue with her. She did support us at this point. I began to take her meals in to her at her demand. She would take the food and glare at me until I left the room again. Any further attempts I made at making her see sense was met with threats of divorce, of taking the kids, of destroying my life. I guess I justified myself in being part of this. At least the rest of us were comfortable. Money wasn't an issue to us anymore, and that particular nightmare is not one I ever want to revisit. I used to think financial troubles were the worst kind of nightmare I'd ever face. And honestly, they're still up there. A year passed, her mood got worse and worse, and Carol got more and more obsessed with her followers. I never thought I would describe my wife as looking monstrous, but it almost seemed as if her limbs had begun to shrink. Her arms and legs looked more spindly, useless attachments to her mass. Her neck had fattened to the point that it looked like her head was attached directly to her massive torso. Her mouth seemed much wider than before and she was almost always sweating. She began to scream at me for more food, always more. She would sob if she didn't get in. I had to. I didn't want her to suffer. I never wanted her to suffer. Our cat disappeared one month ago. It happened on a night when I had taken Marcia out to the playground. Carol had texted me. I am hungry. Bring me something now. I texted back that we were at the park. We wouldn't be back for another half hour or so. I am starving. We got back with a couple large pizzas for her. Our cat is a bit shy, so I didn't notice until much later in the day he was gone. God, I just assumed we'd left a window open or something. I swore I was crazy. Carol's limbs actually looked like they were getting shorter, retreating within her. She did not look like my wife. Maybe it wasn't my wife. The next week, I was looking through our accounts for the first time in a while. Her deposits had stopped a month ago. She didn't listen to anything I say. I told her she needed to see a doctor. She couldn't stand up. I began to cut back on how much food I would bring into her. But it didn't seem to halt her growth, which was noticeable on the daily now. All it did was enrage her. She would get red, her face contorted into a snarl, spittle flying from her wide mouth. She would point a shriveled, atrophied arm and scream curses, her eyes beady and full of fury, recessed into her massive head. Her hair had begun to fall out. I was so terrified. I couldn't go in and feed her that last day. I could hear screaming. Then she called for our daughter. Marcia went in. Marcia did not come out. I got worried. I opened the door. I saw Marcia's foot laying at the base of the monster that used to be my wife. She ate my daughter. God, she ate my daughter. When I saw it, I couldn't move for what felt like hours, but I know it wasn't. The monster saw my look of horror. I don't know what happened. I saw the monster move for the first time since it consumed my wife, I don't know how many months ago. It heaved itself off its perch. It almost seemed to slither, drag itself over towards the door. The door frame of the office began to creak horribly and bulge outwards before I came to. I ran. I got in the car. I drove. I'm out now. My god. My daughter. What happened to my wife? What have I done?
I drink quite heavily these days. I drink until I feel, then I keep drinking until I stop feeling. My days are such horribly depressing messes that seem to drag endlessly. I don't know how I'll get out of this mess. Let me tell you how it got to this point, I guess. Quite recently, my father died. I hadn't spoken to him in several years prior to his death. We weren't on good terms. He had apparently shot himself in the head with his hunting rifle. Which, as much as I disliked him, I couldn't help but feel sad about. I'd also struggled with depression and alcoholism for a long time, part of the reason why I grew so distant from my father. To my surprise, he did leave something for me in his will. It was a bar that he owned. That's when I knew that he really did still hate me. As a kid, I was completely terrified of that bar. It was an old place, must have been at least a hundred years old, built out of wood. It used to scare me so much because the place was so quiet, so dimly lit and barely any customers showed up. Cleaning up after closing hours was such a nightmare. It barely helped that my older brothers used to tell me scary stories about that place. So there was this serial killer that owned this place a long time ago. I remember my older brother Jack telling me, During the day, he worked the counter, then at night he'd bring back women to it and kill them with an axe, then he'd bury them underneath the floorboards. They say that if you're there by yourself, you can hear his victims crying. So many nights filled with horrible dreams about that place. I chuckled. My father must have had a dark sense of humor. I decided that I had moved to my hometown. My life wasn't going anywhere at the moment anyway, and this might have been the break that I needed. A few weeks later, I'd moved. The building had a room with a bed behind the counter so I could just sleep there. Business went fine for a while. It wasn't a very big town, so there weren't many bars in the area. A lot of people came to mine. For a few months, it was a comfortable existence. Not perfect, but I could live like this. Of course, it didn't last. One night, after closing, I was up cleaning the bar. The place had so much dust everywhere that some of these things must not have been cleaned in at least a decade. As I was cleaning, I pulled the rug that was behind the counter to wash the floor, and that's when I first saw it. It was an old wooden latch. Nothing remarkable about it. The handles on it were incredibly rusted. It had been there for a really long time. Despite all the time I'd spent in that bar as a kid, I never knew about this. I figured that it must have been a cellar, or maybe a crawl space underneath there. The memory of Jack's story flooded my mind again as my hands touched and grabbed the handles. I shook my head and I pried it open. The handles also felt incredibly rusted. Underneath the hatch, there was a long dark hole with a circle of bricks surrounding it. It was a well. It must have been older than the bar, and they'd just built over it without covering it. But that didn't explain why there was a hatch over it. I looked down into the darkness of the well, cold air rising up. That's when I knew something wasn't right. Cold air shouldn't still rise up like that, yet I could feel the entire room get chillier. I probably should have just closed it then and there, but I turned on my phone's flashlight to see if I could make out the water. At the very bottom of the well, there was a dead body floating in the water. It was a naked woman with long black hair, her skin the color of paper. It didn't look like the body had been there for long. Holy fuck. I muttered to myself as I backed away from the hole. How did that get in there? My father had died months ago. That body didn't look like it could have been older than a few days. I had to call the cops. As I was about to dial the number, I heard it. It was an ever so soft whispering sound. At first, I thought I imagined hearing it, but it kept going. The story from my childhood flooded my mind again. I leaned over the well and, indeed, that's where the sound was coming from. I'm so cold. 
A soft, broken voice echoed from the well. So, so cold. I recoiled backwards in horror. That voice was not human. It almost sounded human, but not quite. I didn't know how to react. It wasn't right. I shone my phone's flashlight down there again, and it was indeed the woman that was talking. So cold. So much pain. Can you come down here, please? She said. I shut the hatch open after that. I sat down on one of the wooden chairs of the bar. I didn't really know what to do. I was in shock and denial over the entire ordeal. I turned to the only thing I knew, which was alcohol. So I picked up a bottle of whiskey and took a few shots. The whimpering sounds continued for the entire time. I woke up the next day with a headache. I didn't even remember falling asleep. I opened up the bar and went about business as usual. What had happened the previous night was troubling me the entire time, but I just didn't show it. After closing, I braced myself and I opened up the hatch again. The whimpering noises started the moment I opened it. I sat down by the mouth of the well for a while, just listening to that woman tell me how cold it was down there, and how she wanted me to come there with her. I must have sat there for a few hours at least, mesmerized by the situation. The tone of her voice went from several kinds of pain to sadness to apathy and so on, trying every tactic possible to get me down there. There was something so incredibly hypnotizing about the entire thing. In spite of how terrifying it was, the voice was attracting me. Despite the fact that this couldn't have been happening in the first place, I was still thinking logically at least. I had to do something about this. Things like these should not exist in our world. Who knows what would have happened if I did go down there. But I wasn't going to find out. I closed the hatch again that night and drank myself to sleep again. The next day after closing, I opened the hatch yet again. As expected, the soft whimpering started once more. I was starting to get sick of this entire situation. I wasn't going to let this take over my life, bring me down into that place of depression and misery again. What the hell are you? I asked, looking down into the well, my speech ever so slightly slurred from drinking. So cold. Why don't you climb down here with me? She painfully managed to say. That voice, ever so slightly not human. It wasn't something that was of this world. Whatever it was, I was going to send it back to wherever it came from. I was going to pour gasoline down the well and set it on fire. There was an ever so slight change in her tone as I got up from the floor. Scott, the voice started. That startled me. What? I muttered, turning around in my tracks. Scott, do you remember me? Your mother died in a car accident when you were 12, she said. I wanted to throw up when I heard that. How do you know? I asked, leaning over the well. How did it know? That was such a devastating event in my life. How could it mention it so casually? So cold. So cold. It started again. I repeated my question, but it kept pretending like it couldn't hear me. I drank some more. That night, I fell asleep with my ear to the floor, listening to that thing talk to me. Even in my dreams, I could still hear that voice. The next few days came and went just like that. I would go through my miserable day. Then after closing, I would open the hatch and listen. The woman would mostly just repeat how cold it was, but then other times, it would randomly mention traumatic events from my life. My high school girlfriend getting hit by a bus. My older brother Jack overdosing. That time I tried not being here anymore. It would say it all with an ever so slight hint that it was enjoying tormenting me. That thing isn't just not human. It was never human. It's not a murder victim like I originally thought. 
It knows things that it couldn't know. After a while, it seemed to have grown bored of our usual game, and it started telling me about the dark urges in my mind, telling me I should act out on them. Why don't you kill a woman with an axe, Scott? It said once. Scott, why don't you... Don't you want revenge? It said another time. Over time, it kept getting more deranged in what it was asking me to do. Things that should never be said. That go beyond just violent fantasies and into the realm of knowledge that disturbs your very being. And that is how my life has been since then. I think it's getting worse. And what it's telling me, at least. There's no point in ignoring it. Even when I try to go to sleep in my room in the back, I can hear it crying in pain all night. And during my dreams, I can still hear the voice. I haven't even opened the bar in about two weeks. All I do is drink all day and lay down on the floor. I haven't even eaten in a few days. It's just me and that thing in here, talking to me every waking moment. I should just leave, but there's something to it that keeps drawing me in, keeps making me want to listen. No matter how much it's hurting me, I've been in some pretty severe depressions in my life before. But all of that is nothing compared to this. I really don't know what to do anymore. Ten years ago, I dropped out of college. I was 19 and had barely made it through the first semester when I realized that it just wasn't for me. I didn't like being away from home and the prices were just too high. In a pinch, I decided to become a police officer. All that required was a GED and I figured hell, I can do this for a while to pay the bills. I ended up loving the job. I've been with it ever since and never regretted the decision of leaving college. However, it's not really the most high-paying job in the world. Life is expensive and my bills aren't exactly going down. I talked to some of my co-workers and quickly learned just how much I could be making with a college degree. It wasn't exactly a monumental difference, but it was enough to make life more comfortable for sure. I got some advice to enroll in the local community college and decided to go for it. I had planned to start in the spring semester, but my schedule wasn't very flexible. I ended up working some things out with the chief and enrolled myself in three summer classes. Lucky for me, two of them were online. However, the online statistics class was full and the only availability was Tuesdays and Thursdays from 6 to 9. Now, I'm sure you're wondering why the hell I decided to take a nighttime statistics class in the summer. Why not wait until the fall to see if online opens up? Well, I'm required to get a math credit for my criminal justice degree. That seemed like the most obvious choice, but I absolutely hate math. I figured I'd get it out of the way early so that I could enjoy the better classes later on. The summer courses are also only eight weeks long. So at least I'd be done quickly. This brings me to Thursday. It's my fifth week of classes and, yeah, they're exactly as awful as you'd think. The class is in the basement level of the downtown campus at the opposite end of the parking garage. This sucks even more because the last thing I want to do before sitting in a dark room for a three hour math lecture is walk all the way across the building through the maze of cinder block windowless halls, a supremely depressing entrance to a supremely depressing class. Well, I drag my feet through the hallways and sit in my regular seat, a hard plastic blue chair in front of a tiny desk. It reminds me of those old desks from elementary school where I used to hide trading cards and gum. Except now I'm pushing 30, and the only thing I'm hiding is how uncomfortable this chair is. And I'm not hiding it well. The only thing that makes the class a little better is the pretty girl I sit next to. I've never had the guts to actually talk to her, but she gives me a lovely smile every time I go to sit down. She has long red hair and bright green eyes, 
and I learn through the attendance call that her name is Mary. She greets me as usual when I sit down, and I get distracted by the glimmer in her eyes. The professor, an old, balding man, walks in and takes his position at the front of the class. The lights go down and he illuminates his slides with a projector. He's a wrinkly small man, but today he almost looked older. It was as if gravity was pulling him straight into the grave. His skin sagged. His knees buckled. He somehow looked even shorter. I began to count the days until my 30th birthday. I have never been fond of the idea of getting old. He began droning on about something or another, starting with a Z. Z tables, maybe. Look, I know I should be taking my classes more seriously, but it was a long day and I was sincerely beat. I began to zone out thinking of Mary. I did this a lot. It didn't help that she was always in my line of sight. I thought maybe today would be the day that I talked to her. Maybe I'd ask her to grab coffee. I had to do it at some point. I'd never forgive myself if I chickened out for eight weeks straight. I dozed off into my own little dreamland and by the time I snapped out, Jesus. It was already 9.05. I might as well have skipped at that point because I clearly didn't learn a thing. Oh well. I'll just read over the post-it notes sometime over the weekend. But it was time to go home. And yet the professor was still droning on. I raised my hand to let him know class was over. I was more than ready to leave. He glanced at me for a split second, and yet didn't even acknowledge me. Professor Smith? I spoke to no avail. Professor Smith? It's five past. He glared at me. I will ask that you please do not interrupt the lecture. If you need to speak, you may raise your hand. Yeah, screw this. I don't know who pissed that guy off today, but I was over it. I grabbed my notebook and packed it into my bag before getting up and leaving the stale, cold room. If he has a problem with me walking out, then he should quit talking at the regular time. I walked back through the halls to the building's exit. The hallways were a maze, but I knew the walk well at this point. Left, right, right, left, right, out. On the prison-esque walls surrounding me were various art pieces I assumed were done by the students. I passed one that I hadn't seen before. It must have been new, but it caught my eye immediately. It was some abstract version of a face, I think. It looked like some sinister Picasso. The mouth fell below the chin in a twisted grin. The cheeks were tinged a strange purple hue. The eyes looked foggy white and clouded over. It gave me the creeps, and yet I couldn't stop looking at it. I must have been staring at it for ten minutes before I snapped out and realized I needed to go home. No one had passed by me yet. Had he really not let class out yet? I turned my last right and headed towards the door under the glowing exit sign. I pushed it open, expecting the dimly lit street, but instead I walked straight into my classroom again. I shook my head in confusion and looked at the clock on the far wall. 6.05, it ran. You're late. The old man sneered at me. Kindly take your seat. He began lecturing again and instinctively, I took my place at my seat again. I was confused, but once again Mary turned and smiled in acknowledgement of my arrival. I turned to her for the first time, beginning to ask what was going on. But as soon as I opened my mouth, she turned her head in some unnatural and slow way towards me, bones popping in the process, and put a single finger to her lips before returning to listen to the lecture. Nope. I don't know what's going on, but I was going home. I abruptly sat up from my seat and walked out again. No one acknowledged me. I returned to the hallway. Left, right, right, left, right, out, but not out straight back into the classroom. The professor reprimanded me again. I sat down again, I mindlessly repeated the loop, and sat back out again. Back in the classroom, reprimanded by the professor, acknowledged by Mary, and out again. I don't know how many times I repeated this loop, over and over again. 
dozens, maybe hundreds of times. I lost count quickly. Left, right, right. Or was it left, left, right? Left, right, left? I was getting dizzy. I couldn't tell how much time had passed. I decided to open the door to another classroom. Maybe by some miracle there would be a window in there and I would climb out. I entered the room. Of course, I was back in my classroom. What the hell was happening? I backed out of the doorway. As I returned to the hallway, my eyes caught the painting again. This time I swear it was in a different place. Before, it was on a wall surrounded by other paintings and collages. Now, it was on its own. I know it sounds strange. Hell, all of this does. But the smile seemed larger. The face more sinister. I began to stare transfixed once again. The longer I looked, the more my heart started to race and chills crept up along my arms and spine. It was like it was alive. Alive and staring straight at me. This time, I ran to the exit. But to no avail, I still ended up in that horrible classroom. This time, it was different. I walked back through the door, but no one acknowledged me. I looked to the clock. 6.05. The professor had already begun lecturing and everyone's heads were turned towards him. It was as if I wasn't there. I walked up to the professor, waved my hand in front of his face. Nothing. I turned to look at Mary, and my whole body went cold. Her face was contorted, her mouth twisted into a sinister smile, her cheeks were flushed a deep purple, and her eyes, once green and glittering, were pale, white, clouded over. As I looked around the room, I saw the same horrible expression on everyone's face. I felt sick to my stomach. I turned as quickly as I could and walked back out the doorway into the hall. There it was. The painting. Directly outside the door in front of me. I instinctively backed away back into the classroom. W what the fuck? Was all I could utter. At the sound of my voice, every head in the class turned to face me. Their sinister smiles and foggy eyes trained on me. I turned tail and ran. Sprinted as fast as I could down the hallway, not paying any attention to which direction I was going. All I could do was run. As I left, I could hear the scooting of the legs on the plastic seats. Bodies shuffling out of the room. I think it's been three days, but there's really no way of telling. Maybe it's been hours. Maybe weeks. As I maneuver the maze that is the basement, I sometimes hear them. I hear giggling footsteps, knocks, sometimes from far away, sometimes from what sounds like right around the corner. I know deep inside of me that I have to keep moving. I can't sleep. What if they find me? I'm getting weak, dizzy from the twisting halls. I don't know how much longer I can do this. I want to go home. I want out. Please, dear God, let me out. The police hide many things from the public. As an officer myself, I have been made to hide some truly horrifying stuff away from the public. I will take them all to my grave, but this is a secret I just can't keep. You may have heard a rumor that the police have a special paranormal division for events that require skills outside the normal scope of policing. I heard this rumor too before I joined the force and asked around to no avail. Nobody knew about it, not even some of the senior officers, so I eventually dropped it, but still felt like there was an element of truth to it. There was a quote I once heard as a boy, Be hospitable to rumors, for however grotesque they are, they always have some reason for existence. It was a normal day on the force and I was called in to investigate a break-in at a local residential home on the north side of town. The house was along a quiet residential street. As we drove, lights began to switch on as night approached. 
eventually reaching the destination and getting out of the car we saw in a large, classic 1900s American house receded from the main path. Back in the day, I'm sure it looked beautiful with its huge porch fit for a family, large bay windows to let plenty of light in, and light blue wooden paneling contrasting beautifully with a dark tiled roof. Now it's just a shadow of what it was. Boarding on the windows, holes on the roof, part of the porch roof has caved in making it unwalkable, and the garden leading up to the house is completely overgrown with nettles and weeds. The path leading up to the house is barely walkable as the path has deep cracks making the surface unbalanced, and weeds have begun to grow onto the path. We decided to flip a coin to see who would talk to the neighbors and who would survey the house. I chose heads which meant I had to talk to the neighbors. I saw my partner turn on his torch and walk the path. Little did I know that would be the last time I saw him. The first neighbor I spoke to was a sweet old lady. She said that the house had been abandoned for years and was falling apart. Her bedroom window faces the house and she has seen lights on, figures walking around, and loud noises like crying and screaming. She said that the house has a long history of quite disturbing events, one of which was a story about a mother that was found guilty of killing her husband, and their maid with a kitchen knife. The husband was stabbed over a hundred times or so, she claimed. Another and more recent incident was how a feral dog had broken in through a window in the living room, killing the babysitter and the two children she was looking after. She insisted that the house must be haunted due to all these tragic events, and even claims to have seen the very woman that killed the husband and maid in the windows pacing up and down the halls. I thanked her for the information, which was rather helpful and moved on. As I walk to the next house, my radio comes to life and nearly makes me shit my pants. Partner, you there? I've been knocking on the front door, no reply. I see movement inside. I'm going around the back to try there. Over. I responded. Copy that. Over. And moved on. I spoke to a few more neighbors. A delightful couple, and a few not-so-friendly neighbors. It's a mixed bag these days. It's either a nice hello or a spit in the eye. As I make my way back, my radio springs back to life with a frantic voice on the other end. Need backup immediately. Got a suspect wielding a knife. I've entered through the back door, and I'm currently positioned in the kitchen. In front of me in the living room appears to be a tall female, dressed in a white gown dancing from what looks like it. He said this as if he couldn't believe what he was watching. She is in possession of a large, blood-stained kitchen knife. As I listened to this, it sent chills up my spine. What the hell is going on? 10-4. Approaching now. Over. I ran up the walkway to the house. As I battled my way through the nettles, my radio sprang to life with a reply. She's moved position, walked out of the living room and into the dining room, moving to get visuals. Over. As I approached the front door, I jumped at the sound of a manly scream of terror, followed by three loud gunshots which lit up the living room window. In brief orange light, all I could hear after was wet smacking sounds, repeatedly followed by a weird crunching noise I did not know it then, but after it turns out my partner had been stabbed nearly over a hundred times with the same knife he reported. The sounds were the knife butchering his body like it was some type of pin cushion. As I approached the front door, to my surprise it was slightly ajar. I pulled out my gun and spoke into my radio. Control, this is Unit 4. An officer's gun has been discharged. We need immediate backup at our location. I waited for confirmation before entering. This is Control. Backup is on standby. Please clear the area before we make the dispatch. What they basically meant is that units are spread thin at the moment. Please confirm what we're up against so we can send the appropriate force like SWAT or K-9 units. I enter the building. Torch and gun in hand, trembling with fear. 
Police, come out now with your hands up. Otherwise, I will shoot. The first thing I notice when I walk through the large wooden door is that it is bone-chilling cold, making me not want to move. When I breathed, I could see the mist depart my lips. It was a huge contrast to the warm, midsummer temperatures outside. I started to move throughout the house, scouring the rooms. It's just as I thought. Old 50s furniture, dusty with cobwebs, bare wooden floors and ripped up, drooping wallpaper along the walls. It was the perfect scene for a horror movie. As I walked into the living room, I saw what I feared. It was my partner's boots. His body was lying out of sight in the kitchen, and as I moved closer, the body got dragged by something fully into the kitchen. I moved forward, shouting at the top of my lungs, Show yourself now. I received from behind me a sinister, childlike laugh causing me to spin around, but nothing was behind me. That was it. I had seen enough and wanted out. I charged for the front door, and when I reached it, I pulled on the handle with all my strength. I felt as if my soul had left my body. The door was jammed shut. I remember my partner saying he got in through a back door, so I run back to the kitchen, and there he was. He was on his back, and his face was looking up at the ceiling. Blood was pooling all around him, and his face had this look of sheer fear. It was like a face I'd never seen before. In fact, I didn't know faces could do that. I tried the back door, but no, I couldn't get out. It was also jammed. My head was racing. I should have made the call there and then, but I just wanted to get out and be safe again. I thought it can't get worse than this, but I was so wrong. Hell was about to open its gates. As I walked back into the living room, I was greeted by the sound of a low, guttural snarl. My eyes traced the room trying to find the source, and there it was. Glowing yellow eyes in the far corner near the window. The part where it was darkest. All I could see were those eyes for a few seconds. Yellow eyes with black slits as pupils. It was followed by a nasty wide row of sharp pointy teeth pulling off some sort of demonic smile in between them, a long tongue, drooling with saliva all over the floor. It was at that moment I noticed what it was. A huge, black dog, and it started to walk towards me. I looked at my options of escape around me. The front and the back door were locked, and the windows had wood panels covering them, stopping my escape through them. I had no choice. I would have to chance running upstairs and to find cover. I bolted with everything I had and so did this demonic dog, barking, growling, gnashing as it tried to snap at my heels. I braced for it to sink its huge teeth into my legs, but to my fortune, they did not. I flew upstairs as fast as I could, pulling most of my muscles in my legs. Finally, I ran down the long corridor and dashed into a nearby bedroom, slamming the door behind me, and then throwing my body onto the door. Normally, I moan about being fat, but this time, I was actually grateful as my weight was just enough to hold it off. I stayed against the door a while before I heard the banging end. I saw it as my chance to move some large objects by the door, and did so quickly and without noise. I took a look at the room I was currently in. A small crib was in the corner, rocking slowly back and forth like someone was pushing it. At this point, I had seen a lot worse than a crib moving on its own. What was worse was the dolls that were in the room. There must have been at least 30. A few on the floor covered in cobwebs. Some of the faces had been smashed in, and their clothes ripped and savaged. The rest were on the shelves. Their faces were sad and dead, but their eyes, even though they didn't move, always appeared to be looking straight at you. At this point, I decided to call it in and hope for some backup. Control, this is Unit 4. Control, I repeat, this is Unit 4. A few minutes passed, and at that moment, I felt completely alone. Fear and adrenaline taking over again, even though I was exhausted then. Finally... A response. 
first, it came out extremely distorted and broken up, so I placed my ear closer to the speaker. This is Control. Get out of my house. A womanly voice interrupts the speaker. It was like a whisper, but clear enough to be heard. I dropped the radio, nearly breaking it, and stepped back. But then, I got a much clearer. This is Control. I grabbed the radio again reluctantly and explained to them what just happened. They then asked me a question that made everything seem surreal like I knew nothing about the world. It was then I knew God was not real and there was so much more to this world than most of us know. Would the situation be classed as paranormal? In my stunned dazed state, I asked them to repeat, Would you say the things you have seen are unexplainable? I then said without thinking, Yes, over. They responded, Copy that. A paranormal team will be sent to your location shortly. Please remain calm. She said this with ease like this was a normal occurrence for them. When I explained to her, I thought she would think I'd gone crazy. But no. She knew from what I had said that it was a paranormal situation. Making the rumor true. That the team is real. I stayed in that room curled up in a ball against the corner like a child would do when their parents are fighting, praying for it to end soon. Minutes more passed and I could hear banging on the bedroom door again. Suddenly shouting erupted from downstairs. How could you do this to our baby, you monster? It was a woman and a distraught, manic one at that. She howled with sheer anger to which a man replied, Darling, it was the maid's fault. She should have been watching her. He sounded very prim and proper. You were fornicating with her again. I know you were. You left our baby all alone upstairs. Left to suffocate in her cot all because you couldn't help yourself. You selfish, stupid man. The voice was maddening at this point, just purely primal and hysterical tones. Darling, put that down. You don't want to do that. I know you love me. We can work this out. Crashing, banging, and smashing is all I heard for a minute straight, even with my hands up to my ears to block out the noise. When it all stopped, a sound came from downstairs. The woman was humming. London Bridge is falling down. A pain radiated from the sound, affecting anything nearby with its emotion. And for the first time in years, I cried uncontrollably. The humming slowly got closer to me. I could hear her walking up the stairs, the creaks of the floorboards giving away her location. I held my breath as I knew she had reached the bedroom door, still humming. The door handle was being tried, but there was no way it could get through, surely. Even with the certainty, I shut my eyes, not wanting to look anymore, and retreated to the darkness of my brain. Silence fell for a while, and then to my utter horror, a hushed voice spoke close to my ear, its cold breath lathering my neck, causing the hairs to stand. My fair lady. I cried even harder in pure hysterical fear. I felt her bony cold hands on my face brushing up and down, wiping off the tears though I still dare not open my eyes for who knew what I was to see. Then, like the gates of heaven had opened to accept me as one of their own, the door downstairs crashed open, followed by shouts of, Police! Police! Running pounded up the stairs, and the thing next to me whispered in my ears, Don't worry, little one. Mommy will be with you. Mommy will always love you. The door to the bedroom smashed open, and people with flashlights, Large guns and priests with sage burning in their hands entered the room allowing me to finally open my eyes. My mind went blank after that and I woke up in a hospital a few days later. Apparently my body put me into a short coma due to extreme induced shock. It should have no effect on my body, but shock like that will almost certainly leave PTSD. Not long after... I was awake, I was approached by some very shady characters flashing me an FBI badge. They said what I had seen can never be spoken about again for my family's sake, and that the team that you heard about does not exist. I had to sign an NDA, 
and was told to move on as if nothing happened, but every time I try to sleep, I hear her, feel her, sense her, and when I wake up in a cold sweat, her final voice rattles my brain. Don't worry, little one. Mommy will be with you. Mommy will always love you. I live in the American Northwest, somewhat close to the Cascade Range. I have always adored Amy and all kinds of nature, but I have a particular love for the climate of this region. I moved here years ago, after spending my latter years as a teenager, romanticizing the idea of living amongst the vast forests of snow-tipped pines and the hemlock. I spend as much time as I can in nature. I can tell you what bird calls belong to which bird, which berries are edible and which ones aren't, how to start a fire, and so forth. I make it a point to learn as much as I can about nature. I don't say any of this to gloat or to brag about my knowledge. I'm telling you this because it's relevant to what happened to me. When I get full weeks off from my job, I spend at least part of the week alone, deep in a forest somewhere. A lot of people would call what I do bushcraft, but I like to call it enjoying nature. Having said that, after my most recent excursion, I'm not sure if I'll ever go through the wilds again. Not alone, at least. I got a week off for Christmas and New Year's, and after celebrating Christmas with my family, I had planned to spend four days in the Mount Baker, Snoqualmie National Forest, close to the border of Canada. I'd been in this area before during a summer, and wanted to visit the same spot during the winter, so I had some vague familiarity with everything there. Now... If you aren't familiar with the hobby, bushcraft is essentially surviving by yourself in nature, far, far away from any campsites maintained by other people, and you usually bring a good array of man-made tools to help you. When you get to your site, you might dig up some earth, cut a few small trees, and gather up a lot of branches with leaves on them. All depending on your circumstances, of course, but the goal is to build a shelter with the materials you find in nature. And after that, just live out there for a few days before returning to the madness of society. So for my trip, I packed an array of items, including a compass, a portable wood stove, a sleeping bag, many changes of clothes, a shovel, a few smaller hand tools including an axe for wood chopping, and most importantly, a lot of matches and different types of fire starters packed in plastic baggies so they can't get ruined by any moisture. Matches are one of the most important things you can bring to a survival trip. I packed multiple bags, and one small bag I'd keep in my personal pack on my person at all times, just in case. I also brought some snowshoes, as I knew the terrain would be covered in a blanket of snow. There is a lot of other stuff I packed, too, but these are all the really important items. The first day was pretty uneventful. I left from a campground pretty early in the morning, around 5 a.m., and walked west for what I think was between 5 to 10 miles. I'm not really sure how fast I was walking, but it couldn't have been too brisk a pace because I had to don the snowshoes about halfway through the trip which slowed me down considerably. But the trip was at least a couple hours because the sun was still rising when I arrived at my destination. And before you get worried, there's a very long road which runs into the campground from the south, and out of it roughly to the north. So as long as I just walk straight back east, I'd be able to find the campground pretty easily once I find the road. Anyways... I started shoveling snow out of the way and making a clearing for my shelter. This involved shoveling a lot of soft earth and making a small indent on the ground, where eventually my sleeping area would exist under the comfort of a simple wooden roof. I spent much of the day gathering wood for the wood stove, branches with leaves on them for my roof, and basically just getting a lot of wood. Close to sunset, 
I had very little left to do for my shelter. It wasn't very big, just large enough that I could sit comfortably inside, and long enough to fit my sleeping bag and the wood stove. I built a little porch too, which I plan to spend a lot of my time sitting in the lawn chair there, reading, drinking coffee, and thinking about God knows what. After I finished the shelter, I ate dinner, read a little bit inside the shelter, and went to sleep. Again, pretty uneventful. I woke up well before sunrise the next morning and made some coffee. Then I donned some hefty winter clothing and just sat outside on the porch for a while, staring out into the twilt forest. With just my coffee and my thoughts, Above, I could just barely see the Milky Way against the violet blackness of space, and of course, millions of stars accompanying the image. I looked for a while and watched them dragged helplessly along their course through the sky. I was lost in the beautiful image before me, until I heard, well, at that point, I didn't really know what I had just heard. I also almost thought it was two trees rubbing against each other in the wind, making that creaking noise, but the sound I heard was much more... organic. Like it was coming from a throat. On top of that, there was the presence of a kind of low static humming which was intertwined with the creaking. Like what you'd hear from a TV tuned to a station with no broadcast, but a much lower tone. This is a poor description because I don't even know if my ears were built to hear such a thing. My gut reaction was to just stay put and see if I could hear it again. The naturalist in me wanted to see if my ears could discern what kind of animal it came from upon hearing it another time. But then I thought it over. Aside from moose, or maybe some other small fauna, I couldn't think of anything that would wander the snowy mountainside this time of year let alone making any noises while the sun's not up. Plus, I knew what all those animals sounded like. After having this thought, my instinct was telling me to get inside immediately. Not that my wooden shelter would have done much to protect me, but still. I darted inside and didn't even fold up my chair to bring it back in. I'll be honest, the more I thought about it in those moments, the more it scared me. Through the few small patches in my roof between the leaves, I continued watching the stars pass overhead until the sun came up. I didn't hear the sound again that morning. Still, I was shaken up by it. I considered the notion of packing up and heading back that day. Something about it didn't sit right with me. Ultimately, I convinced myself that it was indeed probably a semi-fallen tree rubbing against another tree and that the static I heard was just the wind flowing through the pine needles far above. So I opted to stay. In the afternoon, I put on my snowshoes and meandered around the area, telling myself I was looking for more wood to stock up for the wood stove. But what I was honestly doing was trying to find a tree that was leaning against another tree, or some other indication of whatever made the otherworldly noise. I would walk one direction until there was no more space between my left arm and my body for more fallen branches, then bring the firewood back and find another direction. After the fourth or fifth trip, something caught my eye, a vanta black figure, partly concealed behind the lower branches of a hemlock tree, in broad daylight, mind you, but what was standing there was definitely a person. Or, it had the shape of one, at least. Startled, partly by the abrupt presence of another person this far out in nature, and partly because of what happened that morning, I called out, partially to myself, Hey, what the fuck? No response. My fight or flight was being triggered in that moment. Time slowed down. Still half believing it to be a person, my gut reaction was to get closer and ask. Probably aggressively, how they got out here. I tried to get a better look. It still just looked like a silhouette, but it looked like they had no heavy winter gear. And though I couldn't see their feet or the bottom of their legs, 
The way they were standing made me think they didn't have the gear to be walking through the heavy snow in this area. I almost started to feel bad for them, and I hoped they were okay. Despite that, I was still deeply afraid of the image before me. All this in a split second. I took a step forward, which didn't help me get a better look. The figure was largely still obscured behind the needle leaves of the tree. I yelled out, Hey! Again, no response. As I took another step forward, the figure was no longer there. I don't remember if I blinked before it was gone, or if it simply disappeared before my eyes. I stood there in disbelief for a second, then approached the tree to investigate. There was nobody behind it, and no footprints where the figure had clearly been standing, and, more amazingly, no footprints at all except my own. Anywhere. I thought maybe they ran off the moment I had blinked, or something to that effect, but no evidence of the thing was there at all. I thought for a second, then the events that had just occurred really hit me. I felt nothing but pure terror. Despite the comforting warmth of the sun and the presence of light everywhere, the light made me feel watched. I actually wished it was night so I could sneak away out of sight. But I dropped all the wood I'd gathered and hustled back to my shelter as fast as I could through the snow. On my way back, I considered walking back to the campground, but based on the position of the sun, I felt like I wouldn't have time in the day to safely do so. The walk would take at least a couple hours, then I'd have to hike another mile or so back to my car. I decided it would be best to hunker down for one more night, and then bolt the moment the sun came up. Then I heard the noise from this morning again, louder and closer to me. It sounded similar to what I heard that morning, but more drawn out. At the end of it, I remember a fast breeze passing through. Though breeze is hardly the right word for it because the air was hot. I still had no idea what to make of any of it. All I knew was that I was scared for my life. I wish I could tell you more, but all I did at that point was continue walking back. What else could I do? The loud clamor occurring twice that day, and the figure behind the tree, I knew deep down that they were related somehow. As I approached my shelter, I remember feeling dread at the very bottom of my stomach. Looking at the wooden structure from a distance, I couldn't see anything outwardly wrong with it, but something inside of me was telling that the safety of the shelter was compromised. I walked for a couple more seconds before seeing what was wrong, was that all of the leaves on the roof were absent. All of the branches and twigs were still in place, but the leaves were not. I stopped and looked around. A part of me was horrified at the prospect of seeing the figure anywhere near what was supposed to be my little safe space in nature. The other part of me was telling me to hurry up and get inside. There was nothing notable around, just the endless pine forest and sunlit snow. I looked back at the sky and considered again the prospect of leaving the forest right that moment. I weighed the idea of walking through the snow with no sunlight. I knew that I could probably make it back, but it was really risky. I was afraid that my mind would be too focused on whatever was out there with me. That I would lose the attention to my compass and get lost. In hindsight, none of this really sounds reasonable. I should have left that morning after all. I'm just trying to convey what was going through my head. So, I opted to go inside and get the wood stove started, then go out and get more leaves to cover the roof back up. I walked down into the small living area and put some wood in the stove. The sun pierced through the roof and I felt vulnerable. I reached into one of my bags to grab some matches to get the fire started. I knew exactly where I left them, so I didn't look as I reached in. When my hand reached the pocket that one of the bags of matches was stored in, I felt something wet. When I pulled out the Ziploc bag, it had been filled with a translucent liquid that had a deep purple hue. It was very vicious. 
I quickly looked for my other bags of matches and fire starters. They had all been drenched. I started to panic for a moment. But I remembered the small backup bag that I keep in my pouch. I never had to use them in the past, so they didn't come to my thoughts immediately. But I reached in, and again, the bag was filled with the horrid sludge. So I had no means of starting a fire. The recent snowfall meant that most of the woods was damp, and even though I knew how to start a fire without matches, I doubted that I could because I admittedly did not practice the skill as much as I should have, especially with the wood not being of optimal quality. I looked up through the grid roof of branches. The sun was halfway to the horizon. If I packed then and left, I'd only be walking in the dark for maybe an hour. I really had no choice at that point. So I started packing as quickly as I could. I took the wood out of the wood stove and threw it on the ground outside and folded it up into its compact state. I rolled up my sleeping bag and tucked it into my large travel pack. Most of everything else was already packed as there had been no need to take any of it out. I finished packing and decided to leave the bags of matches there in the shelter. The liquid inside must have been very dense because they added a lot of weight to my pack. I had thought about taking them home, but it was as if whenever I put one bag in my pack, I no longer had the strength to carry it on my back. I stepped outside, and I once again heard the dreaded yawn from deep in the forest. Then I felt the warm breeze. The hot air pushed eastward quickly. I didn't notice at first, but I soon realized that none of the surrounding trees had any leaves on them. In the distance behind them, I could see that the pines still had their needles, but the ones in my immediate vicinity were stripped bare. The landscape looked as though there had been a forest fire. It was as though the bare pines themselves were a threat. Even still, I didn't hesitate to start walking east immediately, passing under some of the trees. With every step, I feared that I would look up and see the silhouette figure again. But I tried to keep most of my attention on my compass, so I didn't walk in the wrong direction. I also just wanted to stop thinking about everything that had happened. I didn't even know what to make of the match bags, or how I would explain any of it to my family when I got back. I wondered if I should even try telling them, or anyone. It all sounded so unreal. I heard another of the noises followed again by an intensely hot breeze which pushed against my back. It was going the same direction that I was. It was at that point that I realized the snow in my path had melted enough to take off my snowshoes. So I did, and I picked up the pace. I continued to walk for what had to be 45 minutes to an hour. The sun was about to set. The path took me to a small incline where I was able to look back and see the tops of trees where I had been walking. In the distance, the sun hid behind a mountain, and the shadow of the mountain struck the landscape. I tried to look for the bare pines around the area I had stayed in. I looked hard and it took me a few moments to locate them, but I did see them. It was difficult to tell from such a distance, but it seemed like the leafless trees formed a circle in the middle of the forest. I pondered that thought for a second, but something caught my eye above the discolored spot in the forest. I am sad to say that that is all I can tell you. I wish I could describe what I saw, but all I know is that something was suddenly there on top of the dead trees. Whatever it was, had simultaneously been moving erratically, yet also kept itself very still. It was both moving and not. I tried to get a better look out of sheer curiosity, but something came over me, and I immediately turned around and kept walking. It was as though my instincts and fear overrode my rational thinking in that moment, which was probably for the best. The further from the shelter I got, the better I felt. The rest of the walk was uneventful after that. I reached the campground a little after sunset, and when I got to my car, it was around 5.30 p.m. I made it home safely, but I couldn't make sense of anything that happened. While I was extremely unnerved, 
I never felt like I was ever in any actual danger. I've told some close friends about this and they believe me, but they don't really know what to tell me. It's been half a year since all this happened, and I wanted to share this story here, if only to get input from others about the strange occurrences. Maybe someone knows of a reasonable explanation. I've been losing sleep thinking about it. Sometimes as I'm drifting asleep, I'll hear what is actually just some trees rubbing against each other, and a primal fear will surge through me. I also have dreams where I am stranded without equipment, and the Vanta Black figure from the forest stares at me. I still don't know what to make of the purple sludge that invaded my match bags. A part of me wants to go back out to investigate, but I will definitely not be going alone if I do. Going back out this time of year would come with the risk of all the wildlife roaming about, but at the same time I think their presence would comfort me, knowing I'm not the only thing from this planet out there. Anyways, thanks for reading this. If anyone has any ideas or explanations, let me know. I'd love to get past this and move on with my life. I'd dream about Sarah dropping her phone. She'd shatter her screen a few days later. Dream about her firing a co-worker before hearing about it over dinner. Small, insignificant things that I thought just meant we were close. Everyone has weird premonitions about family and loved ones. I have family that are into new age slash supernatural stuff, and suggested we had a soul tie that expressed itself as premonitions. Too bad I couldn't premonition her dumping me. We stayed friends. It was good, but the dreams kept going too. Dreams about crashing her car, breaking her arm, her grandmother passing away. All happened. I decided to write these things out of me instead of constantly stressing and being a toxic person, checking in on her. I probably wrote one dream in my journal 10, 20 times before it manifested. Sarah's watching TV on the couch in her apartment. This living shadow, like a man-shaped tornado of embers and ash, appeared next to her. It pulls the move on her, wrapping its appendage around her and dragging her in tight. She sighs happily, then she starts to fade like fog on a window. I can see more and more of the pattern on the couch behind her. She tries to stand up, but the thing forces her back down. It gets darker and more defined as she fades away. She breaks free and screams for help, but it grabs her. Her eyes erupt in embers and scarlet flames erupt through her translucent form, spilling out of her mouth, burning and cracking her cheeks and lips. She burns, painfully, slowly, blisters forming all over her body, popping into jets of dark red flame. Her skin boils off of her, chunks fall off completely letting her boiling fat ooze out from underneath. Something changes in her stance. The fire flares and she shrinks in, bending at the knees, her elbow retracting, shoulders back. She looks like she's going to fight someone as she dies. The shadow claws playfully at her as my friend burns from the side. It catches her ashes like snowflakes. It rolls in her fluids, rubs the ash on what counts as a face. It starts grasping at her remains faster and faster, overturning furniture and scraping the ash off furniture to get more of the stuff. It sinks to its knees, clawing apart pieces of the rug as Sarah ends. When it has the carpet out of the way, it draws what looks like a magic circle, like Full Metal Alchemist on Doctor Strange or something on the concrete beneath like padding. Then it looks at me. Every other dream, I'm just a bystander, third person, like playing a video game. The demon knows I'm there. It opens what counts for a mouth and spits a tongue of flames at my eyes. I feel heat and wake up grasping for breath. Sometimes I scream. 
Once or twice I cried. It's absolutely ridiculous. And not like the other dreams, so there's obviously no way it's real. But I still felt it in my heart. It meant something. Symbolically, I was right. Five months later, an arsonist torched half her apartment building. She was unaccounted for. A little part of me died when her mom, Karen, called and told me, offered to let me be a pallbearer. Because we had such a beautiful friendship, they let me sit with them in the first pew at the funeral home, right beside her new boyfriend, Sam. He was a manager at a small, family-owned grocery store, and was regularly rude to me when we bump into each other, even before dating my ex. Now, he seems to hate my guts, won't make eye contact, won't speak to me. He snatched Elliot, Sarah's youngest brother in kindergarten, right out of my lap when the kid clambered onto me, crying. The service was beautiful, though. Closed casket. Lilies. Three weeks ago, I dreamt of Sam. It's dark at the cemetery. The moon's new, dark, and a heavy fog is trying its best to choke out the light from the lampposts around the graveyard. Sam glances around before pulling the hood off his jacket before his head as he approaches Sarah's plot. He kneels at the edge, whispering something as he unloads his backpack. He dumps a long knife, a weird oblong triangle with a stick on the end, a black slab of glass that shines brightly despite the darkness a bottle of ash and a bundle of hair onto the grass. The triangle thing turns into a shovel when he pulls the stick on the back and makes sure the head is tight against the extendable pole. It doesn't move past the foot. Fucking cheap Amazon bullshit. After a few minutes of playing with the survival shovel and cutting himself on the serrated edge, Sam gives up and grabs the knife. He cuts a larger slash across his palm and flicks the blood across the grave, whispers something I can't understand, and locks his fingers together. Sarah's plot changes. I don't know what to call it other than quick dirt. It's fluid, but still packed earth, and the sparse grass that's grown over the month she's been buried. You can see it ripple as the wind blows across it. Something moves under the knot water. Sam murmurs again, and the thing shoots out like a dolphin breaching. Sam claps his hands together just before her casket hits the ground, and the quick dirt becomes earth again. He takes the glass, scratches something into it with his knife, and pops open the lid. I want to wake up. I don't want to see her like this. I want to remember her as Sarah, not an arson victim featured on the nightly news but I can't control what I'm watching. So I'm forced to see Sam open her mouth, ignoring the bits of charred skin flaking off her jaw and lips, and stick the black stone between her teeth. He curses to himself, takes back the stone and dumps the bottle of ash on it, mixing it with bits of the hair, chanting again in that strange language. The stone glows brighter. He shoves it back in her mouth, Smears blood across her lips and speaks louder. Birds are screeching in the trees, stray cats and dogs hissing and yowling at the top of their lungs. Then she moves. It's not the shambling, graceless movement we see on TV. Sarah Zombie wobbles like a child, arms limp at her sides, pushing forward with her head having to turn and look in a direction before moving in it. She tumbles out of her coffin, landing hard on her hip, which breaks with a sickening crack. She screams around the stone, which she can't seem to get out of her mouth. Sam pulls her to her feet and pushes her back, clearing his throat and wiping his hands on his pants. He tosses a thin black robe over her then a rain jacket over that. She clambers away, looks more like a lost drunk than a reanimated corpse. My viewpoint turns to watch her leave, but something happens. She shifts, and she's my Sarah again. Healthy, 
alive, crying, scratching manically at black chains on her wrists, coiling up to her chest. They're the same as that stone. Some weird glowy black with little symbols etched on them. She looks at me and runs. The dream shifts. I'm outside my own apartment. She's there, scratching letters into the frame. Sarah moves to the doorknob, turning it slowly, powerfully. The cheap metal creaks as she dents it, attempting to break it off. Something primal goes off in me and I scream. Sarah startles, grips her head, and bites down hard on the stone in her mouth. She runs. I thought it was just an insane dream. Survivor's guilt, combining with my dislike of her boyfriend or something like that. But then the landlord called, absolutely pissed asking who I'm in with. Said he didn't want any trouble in the complex. And if I was running with a gang or a cult or something, I needed to leave now. I didn't get it at first. Reassured him I wasn't part of any social gatherings aside from weekly magic. Then I went to work. Saw the weird runes carved into my door, and the long scratches in the wall leading towards it. Felt the contour of her fingers pressed into the metal of my doorknob. I haven't dreamt of Sam or Sarah since then. I've also not stopped researching since then. Gotta find some way to kill a necromancer. Or protect myself from him and break the soul tie. Or figure out what the hell a soul tie actually is, and then go fight a death wizard. Or kill my door and break a death wizard and fix a soul tie and I can't think straight. I haven't slept in four days. Constantly worried about what's happening to her each night. Driving myself crazy thinking I'll have another dream about her. And maybe find a different apartment. child sprinting down a desolate street to retrieve his rogue ball, a mother beckoning him inside for supper, a father rolling into the driveway and shining, fresh off the lot convertible. It was the first thing we saw after finding the house. Tom's face turned beet red as he looked out the window of our aging sedan. A swig from a whiskey bottle and incoherent mumbling proceeded. They'll regret it all. He snarled after bashing his fist against the steering wheel, accidentally setting off the horn. The mother of the child was the only one who seemed to notice, and with a rapid flash in her expression, she beckoned her son inside hurriedly. Fear. It was clear as day in her eyes, and her son's. I don't want to remember that look. The slam of a door turned my attention to the driver's side of the car which was now bare. Tom was storming towards the house and what I sensed was an embodiment of Hell's wrath. Quickly, I popped out of the car and ran up to him. With quick, shallow breaths, I grabbed his arm to prevent the bloodbath that would ensue if he entered the house. Tommy, I don't want to hear it. You know damn well what they have done. We can't change the past, but I can damn well change the future. He wrenched his arm away from my grasp and continued his parade of death towards that cursed door. The door to the house that had sent our lives into a spiral of excruciating pain and despair. The house which now sheltered our son. Or at least, what's left of him. The day our only child entered under the forsaken roof is one that neither Tom nor I would care to remember. But every living moment the horrid acts we witness loop in our heads. We had just been glad our little Jack had made some friends. The red flags ran rampant, yet we were blinded by our own hands. The sheer fact that not once did we meet the boy he talked about so much. It was just like any other day. Jack skipped our house completely to hang out with the nameless child. We had grown used to this. As all young kids strive for independence, 
Boundaries had been set, but they were followed loosely. We told him to call at least once a day if he was away from home. He would call occasionally, which helped blunt the edge of our worries. Then the calls changed. Rapid, consecutive calls until Tom or I picked up. The radio silence on the other end after doing so. This would happen three or four times a day until Jack would finally talk on the other line. When we questioned about the relentless ghost calls, he claimed to have no recollection of doing such. We chalked it down to a phone malfunction. Finally, the phone didn't stop ringing for hours. Hours and hours of constant ringing with the exception of when we answered it. Strange noises could be heard from the other end, but the call would always disconnect after four or five seconds. As soon as it would end, it began to ring again. We grew worried fairly fast, as it was the first time noises could be heard after the so-called glitch ghost calls. Jack had mentioned the address of his new friend over dinner a couple of days prior to this. It was only a block away and we grew a false sense of assurance as we reside in a fairly nice part of town. Tom and I finally broke after three hours of the forsaken calls. With a panic that sunk in deeper with every mile, we finally arrived at the address Jack had given us. Relief fell upon us as it was one of the nicest houses in the area, with a playground in the back showing signs of kids. Tom had agreed to just roll by, as we didn't want to be the helicopter parents you hear so much about. As we turned around to head back home, I decided to roll down the window for some fresh air. After all, we had decompressed a little. As soon as I did, the car screeched to a stop and we ran towards the house. The screams of our child screaming could not be mistaken. Medical beds, scalpels, sterilized gloves. An IV. Jack looked back at us from across the room, strapped to a table. I blacked out. Tom told me I had run outside and began to simultaneously throw up and weep upon the yard. Men rushed from the upstairs of the house yelling, branching knives of every kind. Jack yelled out to us, begging us to save him. Tom picked me up and ran to the car. We shouldn't have deserted Jack but the sight of a rat tunneling out of the stump that would be bearing a leg and coolers filled to the brim with bloody plastic bags told us all we needed to know. There was no saving our boy. The police had arrived about 30 minutes later. The house was spotless, just like the realtor had left it for the showing. There were no signs of life in the inferno that took our son. Life went on. Tom and I shifted our love to alcohol. We lost our jobs and moved back in with my mother. Our lives had ended right along with Jack's. Mother forced us to attend a dinner party with some new friends she had made from the church. Her house, her rules after all. Begrudgingly, we got ourselves presentable for the first time in months. Formalities and small talk. But Tom and I remained distant from the chatter but I couldn't stop looking at one of the children that had come to the dinner. His eyes. They were almost identical to Jack's eyes. They had the same hazy gray color, with a shifty glance that always looked alert. Tom whispered in my ear and knocked me out of my daze. He directed my attention to the boy's sister, whose nose looked oddly familiar. Their father's hair. The mother's ears. Jack. Our precious Jack. We found out where they lived. I didn't want to go. Tom insisted. I'm writing this in the car, ignoring the cries of agony that are coming from the house. He's not letting them off easy. It seems we are getting Jack back. Piece by piece. Growing up, I was always told I had an active imagination. I spent most of my childhood reading and writing because my mom wanted to foster that imagination. However, as I got older, 
my imagination became less cute. The stories I was writing were less, there's a fairy village in my garden, and more, a man living in my wardrobe. I grew up in a home that celebrated everything, so my family used to sit down once every few weeks and I'd read them one of my stories. It was after one of these readings that my mom asked me if what I wrote was true. Sometimes, other times I rewrite things that people have told me. I had answered. What people? The question extremely offended 11 year old me, as I didn't have that many friends at the time, and it sounded like she was picking on me for that. My friends. She looked at me for a little too long after I said that. Truthfully, I knew why. No 11 year old girl could come up with the stories I wrote, active imagination or not. They came from Elizabeth, as I call her. She liked my writing, but said I needed more help with inspiration, so she'd give me prompts. She'd show up places, point at things, and try to tell me what to write. Obviously, Elizabeth is a spirit. She's been with me for as long as I can remember, keeping me safe in her own ways. But she doesn't haunt me. She's my friend. My protector. Sweetie, are these friends of yours alive? This one question, along with my obvious answer, sparked years and years of lessons from my mom. She believes I inherited my gift from her. However, mine is a lot stronger and affects my everyday life a lot more than hers does. She's taught me how to ignore it, how to rid myself of the spirits that aren't welcome, and how to keep the ones that are at an arm's length. Now, I'll bring you to the present. Ten years later, to be exact. It started about a month ago. I fell into the deepest pit of depression I ever have been in. I spent all the money I'd been saving to move out on drugs, nights out, and endless amounts of online shopping, all in an attempt to bring myself back to me. It started to work until I saw him. A man standing about 100 meters away from me in the middle of a shopping center. The only thing differentiating him from everyone else was his face. In fact, he didn't exactly have one. There was an outline of what could have been, but it wasn't enough of one to make me comfortable. Positive spirits always try to make themselves appear as comforting as physically possible. This guy was not trying to do that. Usually I could brush this off and go on about my day like it was nothing, but seeing this guy mess with me in a way that no other spirit ever has. The feeling he left me with sat in my stomach for days. I tried everything to ease it, but it never left. I think what left me most uneasy about seeing him was that I haven't seen Elizabeth since. I've always felt safe from these kinds of spirits because she always appears right after I see them. To kind of remind me that she's keeping an eye out. I can't even feel her presence anymore. About a week after his first appearance, I finally felt normal again. Physically and mentally. I was getting back to all my normal routines and finally talked to my friends again. It was a nice feeling of finally digging myself out of the hole I'd fallen in. Then, there he was. Closer this time, but still in a public place. I was at dinner with my friends. He also felt the need to join. On the other side of the restaurant, standing with his arms by his side, staring directly at me. Nothing about his expression changed, but he moved this time. Cocked his head to the side as if studying me. He stayed like that through the whole dinner, just watching me. It felt like a threat. I wish I had listened. After that night, he appeared more frequently, never giving me enough time to recover from him before popping back up. It was a week ago that he started making true on his threatening presence. Last Monday, I was in my bedroom watching some sitcom while putting away my laundry when my lights went out. All of them. I have three lamps in my room that stay on day and night because I'm not a huge fan of darkness. When I tried to get the one closest to me back on, nothing happened. I reached for my phone, grabbing the torch, and made my way out of the room. I'd assumed that we'd had a blackout. 
The brightness that met me when I opened my door immediately proved me wrong. I walked out to see my dad sitting in his office. Hey, did we have a power surge or something? The confusion I was met with left an unsettling feeling in my stomach. I told him that something had happened in my room and he sighed before going in to have a look. He came back with his arms full of light bulbs. All blown. I've got a couple spares though. He explained that their death was probably due to me leaving the lights on 24-7, but I did not believe him. As I was helping my dad find new bulbs in the garage, I saw the man again, standing right beside my father, one of his hands resting on a box. Assuming that that was the box containing the light bulbs, I told my dad not to worry, and that I'd sleep in with my little sister that night. Tuesday was eerily calm until I fell asleep. I had possibly the most realistic nightmare I've ever had in my entire life. If you can even call it that. I never truly felt like I was sleeping, just lying there with my eyes closed. The visions, I guess you could call it, contained several moments, each specifically detailing ways that I could die. Most of them involved vehicles, some where I was driving, a passenger crossing the road, etc. He was in every single one, just standing there with his arms by his side, staring at me. In each one, he was the last thing I saw before it went dark. On Wednesday, my friends and I decided to drive to a house one of them has on the beach, because winter never deterred us from a good surf. I drove two of them in my car, mostly because I knew the roads like the back of my hand and I didn't recognize a single road in any of my visions. I also didn't think he'd be obvious enough to give me visions of my possible death the night before I died. I knew he'd hit when I least expected it. The next 24 hours felt like bliss for me. We spent the day at the beach, followed by a fire there that night. He didn't appear once. The next morning after realizing we skimped on groceries, we decided to go to a cafe for breakfast before hitting the beach again. I drove. This time only with one passenger because she had something to tell me about a romantic moment between her and another friend the night before. I was caught up in her story when I realized I'd missed a turn. My heart fell into my stomach when I recognized a road that I had never driven that far down before. I turned a sharp bend and noticed a car stopped in the middle of the road just a moment too late. The impact knocked everything out of me. I immediately turned to see my friend reaching down to grab her phone from underneath her. The relief I felt was short-lived because there he was, standing on the other side of the road, watching me with his arms crossed. Even without a face, I could sense his disappointment. He disappeared almost as soon as he'd appeared. Everyone involved in the accident is fine. I'm the only one who walked away with injuries that will take longer than a week to heal. I haven't seen him since that day. It's been almost a week. I'm terrified. I've left my room only for doctor's appointments, food, and the bathroom. I know what this means. Even if it wasn't his goal, he has me at my weakest now. He could strike at any given moment. And it would work. For once in my life, I have no idea how to save myself from a spirit. I fear I'm going to spend the rest of my life running from death. What if the accident was just luck? What if he succeeds next time? Is he going to stick around until finally? He is the last thing I see before the darkness. I don't know anything, and my biggest fear right now is getting answers. Let me set the stage for you. So this happened three years ago. I was 13 male, currently 16. It was 2 a.m. and it was storming like crazy, and me and my brother, 15, and my dad, 38, decided to chill in the living room and watch the Lord of the Rings trilogy, as it was our rainy day tradition. My mother, 37, was out of town for a business trip, 
and my sister, three, was asleep in her bed. We got about halfway through the second movie before the power inevitably went out. Thinking it was just the rain, my dad decides to check the fuse box in our backyard, so I tag along. We arrive at the fuse box and the big wires have been cut in half. This freaked me out, but my dad just concluded that it was just some asshole neighbor kids. While me and my dad were outside at the fuse box getting drenched, we heard a loud bang and shortly after, my brother runs out of our back door looking panicked. Me and my dad run to his aid, but the only words he could muster were, In the house. There is someone in the house. My dad runs for the door that my brother had just ran out of. But, by all of our surprise, it was locked. This scared the hell out of us, as my three-year-old sister was fast asleep in her bed. My dad runs to the front door, but it was locked too. My dad then received a phone call from a number that said, No caller ID. My dad picks up the phone and we all hear this loud, twisted, sinister laugh that still spooks me to my core every time I think about it. The goofy voice on the other side of the phone then said, How is the rain out there? My dad, stunned by the voice, hollered over the phone, What do you want? The voice said, I'm going to make this really simple for you. I want you to get me $2,800 or I will kill your daughter. Just as he said this to my dad, a photo went through to his phone of my baby sister in her bed with a black 9mm pointed at her. What the hell were we supposed to do? Go to the ATM while there was a crazy man in our house, holding our baby sister at gunpoint? It wasn't an option. We were all standing at our back door where there is also a window and then suddenly... The man draws the curtains and we see him wearing a dark green unibomber jacket, dirty brown pants, and a black ski mask pulled up just enough to reveal his mouth where he was wearing the biggest, scariest smile that haunts me to this day. He closed the curtains and then ended the call with my dad. To this day, my dad and my brother will never know why, but at that moment, we hear a loud door slam from the inside of our house and we saw the man darting down our street, leaving our house, and we haven't seen him since. I have no idea why he left. Did he get cold feet? Did his conscience finally get him? Or did he remember that he left the stove on in his house? I have absolutely no idea. We ran into the house and saw that my sister was still fast asleep. My dad called 911 and quickly told them everything that happened, and 11 minutes later, two officers arrive. We gave them a description of the man, showed them the fuse box where he cut the wires, and my dad answered all of their questions, and then the police officers left. My dad called my mom to tell her about everything that went down, and it wasn't exactly the most pleasant conversation in the world. Since then, we have moved houses. My dad changed his number, and my sister still has no idea what happened on that stormy night three years ago. The smiling man, as he is most commonly referred to as in my house, has ruined so much for me. Whenever I close my eyes, I see him. Whenever I am in silence, I hear that horrific laugh that makes me want to throw up. He even ruined Lord of the Rings for me. I haven't heard anything about that man since that fateful night in 2019 and I have no idea if he was caught or not, but since then, he has been the star of all my nightmares. I know that I'm not the best writer in the world, but I just wanted to tell someone about the man that is ruining my life. My sister has always played with dolls. For an 8 year old, I have never found it weird or strange. Chrissy, my sister, is one of those kids who will join dance or shop at Claire's whenever she goes to the mall. She's just a happy kid. My sister and I were never close. Maybe because I'm 7 years older than her. Maybe it's because she was more bright and outgoing while I prefer to keep to myself. For the most part, Chrissy and I could easily coexist without issue. I mean, it wasn't hard. 
Our mom had always been on conference meetings and work trips, so there was nobody to make us talk to each other. I guess the whole thing started when mom came back from one of her meetings. Usually, mom brings us presents to make up for her being gone for so long. For me, a European brand of shoes, and for Chrissy, five dolls. The dolls looked like regular dolls. The classic Barbie doll figure, and the painted on smile. Some of them had dark brown hair, some of them were blondes, and one was ginger. Some had braids, another had a bun, and the rest had their hair down. They were pretty to say the least, like plastic models, and of course Chrissy loved them. I remember she immediately ran up to them in her dollhouse where all of her Barbies lived. Mom didn't stay long, she had another flight to catch. She was gone before dinner time. I made both me and Chrissy dinner, and we went to sleep. Or tried to, because I was woken up by Chrissy's screams. Being the overprotective sibling I am, I sprinted down the hallway and burst into her room, only to see her crying on her bed. Chrissy, what happened? Why did you scream? My little sister tried to speak in between sobs. The, the dolls, they want to, to, to take me away. I found this very disturbing, but it was late and I was tired. So I put the dolls in a wooden chest and locked it. I gave Chrissy the key so she might feel safe, and then I went back to sleep. I woke up. This time, it was morning, but something was off. My head felt lighter than usual. That's when I realized a large chunk of my hair was missing. I screamed, jumped out of bed, and went to find Chrissy. Chrissy! I yelled, furious at the eight-year-old. I marched to her door and swung it open. Chrissy, what did you do to my hair? She looked up at me innocently. She was holding two of the dolls that she had been so afraid of the previous night. Of course she was. What do you mean? I didn't do anything. She turned back to her dolls, whispering something I couldn't hear. I rolled my eyes at her. Sure, Chrissy. When? I stopped to look at one of the dolls she was grasping. Sally here finds that her hair is gone. Don't blame me. And with that, I walked out. Slamming the door behind me. The day was uneventful, other than me getting a haircut. I ordered pizza for Chrissy and I, but when I called her down to eat, I got no response. Chrissy, get down here! Still, nothing. I climbed the stairs and into the hallway, making my way to my sister's room. The door was slightly open. I was about to open it more when I heard Chrissy speak. Is it finished? The doll? Chrissy's voice sounded different. Yes, I propose we should take them tonight. One of Chrissy's dolls spoke. A third one chimed in. Let me see it. Her voice was scratchy and broken. The first doll then walked towards the wooden box I had locked them in earlier and pulled out another doll. This one was lifeless. It also looked exactly like me. If I hadn't made enough mistakes already, my stupid self decided to make the biggest one. I audibly gasped. All the dolls' heads abruptly turned to see me peeking through the crack. The dolls then fell down as if they were never standing. Chrissy too looked at me before getting up and closing the door. I am now in my room writing this so that maybe someone else can learn and benefit from my story. Maybe someone can contact my mother to tell her what has happened. I can hear the plastic from the doll's body hitting my door and trying to undo the lock. I work for NASA as an astronomer, and there are certain things we keep hidden from the public. No, the Earth isn't flat, and aliens don't control the government. Fuck, I wish those were the case, as the truth is much, much worse. In 1993, the Hubble Space Telescope saw a star disappear. It didn't go supernova or die naturally. It simply went dark over the span of a few minutes. The star was already too faint to see with the naked eye, and ground-based telescopes had trouble picking it out from among the surrounding stars. So the event wasn't widely known to the public. 
At the time, we thought the most likely explanation was that a cloud of interstellar dust had drifted between Earth and the star, occluding it from view. It was noted and mostly forgotten about. In 2007, two more stars vanished. Due to the circumstances of this event, this was much more concerning. The two stars in question were part of a binary system, orbiting each other at a fairly close distance. If a cloud of interstellar dust was the culprit again, they would have both seemed to disappear simultaneously, or very close to it. Instead, both stars faded individually over a period of minutes, separated by a span of about 8 hours. This binary system was also about 15 light years closer to Earth than the star that had previously disappeared in 1993. After carefully reviewing millions of Hubble images, two more stars were identified which had gone out in the years 1995 and 2002. These were all in the same stellar neighborhood, only a handful of light years from each other. The only conclusion we could draw was that some unknown influence traveling close to the speed of light was shrouding, or destroying, these stars. Unfortunately, the Hubble wasn't sensitive enough to tell us any more than that. The James Webb Space Telescope first came online a few months ago. Although official channels will tell you that it's still undergoing testing, we have been actively collecting data since early February. One of the first things we did was to aim the telescope at the regions of space occupied by the vanished stars. If they were being blocked by dust clouds, a hope some of us still held on to, the increased sensitivity of the JWST may have been able to see through them and confirm that the stars were still there. Unfortunately, we had no such luck. The first three stars that had disappeared were still completely dark. Gravitational wave detectors, though, soon found something odd. In all cases, not only were the stellar masses still present, but the amount of mass had actually increased. More sensitive observations had also detected a type of string or web stretching through space connecting these now invisible stars. When we trained the telescope on the binary system that had vanished in 2007, which was the nearest point at which the phenomena had so far been observed, there was finally enough ambient EM spectrum radiation left to try a mass spectrometer reading. If you're not aware, mass spectrometry is an incredibly useful process, whereby measuring the patterns of light wavelengths emitted or reflected by an object, we can learn tons of useful information such as its temperature, speed, and direction of movement, and chemical composition. The readings we got from the binary stars didn't make any sense, though. First of all, they were cold, almost as cold as the surrounding interstellar medium. Whatever had happened to these stars had snuffed them out completely, or somehow prevented their light from escaping. What was truly puzzling, however, were the emission lines returned by the mass spectrometer. Several familiar elements such as hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and magnesium were identified, but these were few and far between. Most of the readings didn't correspond to any known chemical elements, and even seemed to defy what we knew about the physics of light, matter, and chemistry. This massive, star-spanning structure was primarily composed of materials that we didn't even have names for and may not even have been matter as we understand it. Speculation ran rampant. Obviously, such a thing couldn't be a natural phenomenon. Finally, we had proof of extraterrestrial life. But what was this thing we had discovered, and for what purpose was it being built? The leading hypothesis was that we were looking at a series of Dyson shells. Massive solar collectors built to completely envelop stars in order to capture 100% of their energy output. Such a concept has been envisioned in the early 20th century as a potential source of energy for an interstellar civilization. Ever since then, the idea had found its way into popular science fiction. 
the construction of these massive structures had actually been theorized to be the one of the first signs of intelligent extraterrestrial life that we may someday detect. It seemed that day was today. The theory still didn't explain everything though. First of all, there was the impossible speed with which the stars were covered. Constructing a Dyson shell from scratch in a matter of minutes was beyond even the wildest speculations of scientists and sci-fi writers. Then there were the mysterious filaments that connected the shells over distances of light years. No one had any idea what purpose these could serve, or how they could even be built. Everyone at NASA was fascinated by this mystery. In hindsight, we may have been better off if we had never discovered the truth. Less than a month ago, the JWST detected a series of unusual energy bursts emanating from interstellar space. These were occurring at the very edge of a star system approximately 12 light years from the binary system that vanished in 2007. As we focused the telescope on this system, we soon determined that these were not natural phenomena either. The energy signatures, which were still flashing intermittently, mesh what would be expected from thermonuclear and antimatter based explosions, along with several other types of energies that we couldn't identify. These explosions, although still not visible to the naked eye on Earth from that distance, were absolutely tremendous in magnitude, easily billions of times more powerful than any nuke that humanity could conceivably build. After experimenting with the telescope settings, we were able to get a clearer picture of what was going on. The tip of one of the interstellar filaments that linked the Dyson system was passing through the Oort cloud of the distant star system, approaching its sun, and whoever lived there was fighting back. The weapons were able to slow the thing's advance, shattering, breaking off, and vaporizing planet-sized chunks of the object, but it seemed to be rebuilding itself almost as fast as it was being destroyed. After less than a week, the explosion stopped. It seemed that they had run out of ammunition. In the void between stars, we knew that these things traveled at nearly the speed of light, but as we watched it approach the inner star system, its pace slowed as it swelled in size, preparing to devour the system star. We quickly trained the telescope's mirrors on the doomed sun. We were about to watch whatever this thing was blot out another star, but in real time. We all held our breaths as we watched the projected image of the main sequence star, slightly larger than our own sun. At first, nothing seemed to be happening, but soon a small shadow appeared on the edge of the luminous orb, soon followed by another shadow, and then a third. The shadows began to converge, forming a strange yet somehow familiar pattern as they blocked out the star's light. What are those? One of my colleagues gasped. They almost look like... She paused as if afraid to say the next word for fear of ridicule. I, however had no such hesitancy. Leaves, I said, my voice monotone. The situation was far too incredible to express any emotional reaction, even that of pure shock. They look like leaves. We watched as, over a period of minutes, a web of shadowy outlines matching the familiar shapes of oblong leaves and thin vines proceeded to blot out the remaining light from the distant star. By that point, everyone in the room had realized the truth. The phenomena we had been tracking for so many years wasn't some hyper-advanced alien megastructure. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and magnesium. Some of the familiar elements we had detected, they were all components of chlorophyll. It was a plant. An enormous plant that spanned across light years, and, much like terrestrial plants, it sought out light to fuel itself. The filaments connecting the stars across interstellar space were stems and branches. It would grow in the direction of the nearest stars it sensed, completely enveloping them and then moving on. 
any life inhabiting planets orbiting those stars would be left to freeze to death, or perhaps even worse. It was possible that the plant would devour those planets to add to its mass as well. Everyone was silent as the telescope continued to gather data. Eventually, after what seemed like an eternity, a young astronomer spoke up from the far end of the room, addressing our supervisor. Sir, we've begun to detect the formation of another tendril, leaving the system. Its vector is... He gulped. He didn't need to say any more, but he did anyway. It's heading directly for our sun. How much time do we have? The supervisor replied grimly. Judging by the time lag, distance, relative properties, and previously observed speeds of this... thing? I'd estimate no more than 27 years, sir. 27 years. We had just watched this galactic weed overwhelm a civilization that was, at the very least, thousands of years ahead of us technologically, and we had less than three decades. I'll probably be found in silence for posting this, but I don't care. I have to tell someone. I can't keep this a secret any longer. When the sun turns black and the world begins to freeze, at least you'll have some idea of what's going on. Small comfort it may be. I'm a receptionist, but not just any old paper pusher you'd find at your local dentist or doctor. No, I take care of the front desk at our town's local police station. Much more intense. Which one? Yeah, nice try. I don't need anyone else harassing me on top of the regulars we already see on the daily. Plus, you're not going to want to visit after you hear what lurks in these parts. The station was already up to its neck in paperwork on this particular week. You see, multiple bodies had been found in the woods. Every time a new one was discovered, the workload increased. We weren't too worried about these corpses at first. I know it sounds crazy when I put it like that. How can one? let alone the police force, not be concerned about dead people popping up. Well, strange thing was, these bodies were old. Incredibly old. Like, really fucking old. I'm talking ancient people from centuries past. Mummified remains, if you will. Kind of like the ones you see on the Discovery Channel in the early hours of the morning. Granted, history wasn't our forte, we brought in all sorts of experts from around the country. Scientists, archaeologists, an array of carbon-dating academics. They all stopped by to throw in their two cents on who these people once were. Naturally, quite a bit of buzz began to stir around town. Unfortunately, excitement of this caliber always brings the crazies out. Andy! I looked up from my computer to find an elderly lady at the front desk. I didn't recognize her. How did she know my name? Hello, ma'am. It chimed. Can I help you? She leaned forward. Andy? Andy McMillan? She knew my full name. I realized there must be some connection. It was a small town, after all. What this link was, though? I had no clue. I'm sorry, have we met? I asked. It looked like my question caused tears to well up in her eyes. They did look familiar. She struggled to push the next words out. Rose Dawson. I gave her a blank stare. I knew the name. In fact, I knew that name very well. Rose Dawson was the name of the girl with whom I shared my first kiss. Although this was close to ten years ago. I hadn't seen her since school ended, but I knew she was still living nearby. For a brief second, everything seemed to click into place. Oh, are you Rose's grandmother? There were definitely tears this time. I tried again. Um, Rose's mother? The salty water started to stream down her face. It's me, Andy. I'm Rose Dawson. I must have given off the impression that I thought she was nuts. 
The lack of words coming out of my mouth didn't help either. I mean, can you blame me? She sounded completely loony. The Rose Dawson I knew was the same age as me. I knew that as a fact. The old lady doubled down. Listen to me, Andy. You have to get people out of this town. All of these bodies in the woods? I know what happened to them. It happened to me. I saw it. I attempted to defuse the situation. The lady was quickly getting frantic and confused. Ma'am, it's alright. I need you calm so we can help. She put a hand on her head. Stop calling me ma'am. It's me, Rose. I pressed a button beneath my desk to call for some assistance. It looked like we were going to have to get in touch with a nursing home about a runaway patient. My fellow officers arrived and whisked her into the office. I told them to try and track down the real Rose to see if she could come in. There had to be a lead there. The station's entrance was quiet once again. I sat in the silence. It made me sad to think that one day, I could deteriorate to that level of confusion. Ten minutes passed before the phone broke into a shrill ring. I snatched at it. Hello? It was the boys from the office. They hadn't had much success with her either. She was still claiming to be Rose Dawson, and they hadn't managed to track down the real one yet. It sounded like it was going to be a rough afternoon. That being said, she had elaborated on her story a bit more. She claimed there was a creature roaming the outskirts of town. Something about not looking into its eyes. The boys wanted to know if she'd mentioned any other names which they could try to track down. As I went to explain that she somehow knew my name, a voice interrupted. Excuse me? I glanced up from my desk and found another elderly person looking back at me. This time, a man. A very old man. It looked like his skin was vacuum sealed to his face. His skeletal frame was clearly visible. Sorry, just a minute. I blurted. I relayed the little information I had back to my co-workers and hung up. The old man smiled sweetly, waiting patiently. I turned my attention back to him. Sounds like you got quite the pickle there. He chuckled. Yeah, it's been quite the day. Quite the week, actually. I sighed. With a quick shake of the head, I caught myself before I trauma dumped on the civilian and changed topic. Sorry, how can I help you, sir? Oh, don't mention it. I apologize for bothering you. I was just wondering if you could point me in the direction of the main strip. I'm from out of town, you see. Now this was more my speed. I briefly provided clear and direct directions to the town center. He seemed very appreciative, thanking me for my time with kind green eyes. It felt good to see my job was doing something for the world. A nice break from the earlier chaos. Just before the gentleman exited the foyer, he stopped. I hate to pry, my dear boy, but what was this talk on the phone of a creature in the woods? I threw a dismissive wave. Ah, don't worry about that. Just a disturbed citizen. He nodded with a grin. Not some urban folklore I should be aware of? He seemed harmless enough and didn't seem like the type to run around spreading rumors. I decided to tell him. Definitely not one I've heard before. The poor lady thinks there's something in the woods that can age you just by looking at it. He laughed. I wouldn't spend too long looking into that one if I were you. Not worth the little time you have left. I wasn't sure if that was just a friendly comment or a threat at first. He threw up a hand to bid farewell and staggered out. I turned back to my computer only to be faced with a black screen. It must have gone to sleep when I was distracted. Low power mode to save energy. I wished I had some energy after my exhausting week. I felt like I'd aged 60 years. I caught a glimpse of my reflection in the screen's glass and realized I had. We arrived at the venue approximately 30 minutes late. I wasn't expecting much, truthfully. I wasn't a huge fan of the bride and projected those feelings onto the wedding. Secretly, I wanted it to suck. 
but I didn't expect it to go this badly. We checked into our room and Andre and I settled in. I unpacked my makeup in preparation for tomorrow and he cracked open a light beer. Andre was a groomsman and we had two hours before we had to leave for the rehearsal dinner. We spent it watching trash TV while getting trashed on the stockpile of light beer. Basically, we were prepping for a normal weekend. Something didn't feel quite right to me though. I've always been sensitive, but I've never been in the middle of a situation I didn't have control of. I wandered across the hall in search of medicine to settle my nerves. I knew that Rebecca would have some, but she was nowhere to be found. Her boyfriend had last seen her 45 minutes ago, and he assumed she went to her family's lake house that was just down the road. I expected that the beer would have to settle my nerves, and I wandered back to my room. The night before the wedding went off without a hitch throughout the rehearsal and the rehearsal dinner. We all partied until about 2 a.m. and I, for a moment, forgot my overwhelming feeling that something wasn't right. The wedding was beautiful. It was small, in the mountains of New Hampshire, with perfect decorations and delicious food. Rebecca had reappeared just before the ceremony, but she seemed a little off usually impeccably polished. She was tripping over cornhole boards and twirling until she fell in the middle of the dance floor. She hadn't had anything to drink, so I chalked her inhibitions up to drugs. There really was no other explanation at the time, but I'd soon find myself to be very, very wrong. We all went back to the hotel and made our way down to the hotel bar. Most were stumbling there, but were still served regardless. Rebecca loomed in the corner watching us, rising the hair on the back of my neck. I went out onto the deck with Andre and Dave and we smoked. We recounted the events of the night and I decided to head to bed knowing I had chips in the room waiting for me and, truthfully, wanting to get away from Rebecca's gaze, expecting Andre to follow closely behind. I tucked myself in, chips resting on my chest while watching trash TV once again. Suddenly I heard a loud crash outside the room. All my senses urged me to stay in bed with the door locked. My brain screamed that this would be surefire safety, but my curiosity took over and I padded my way to the door, taking care to be as quiet as possible. I first peeked through the peephole, but saw nothing. I undid the lock carefully and opened the door just a crack. Suddenly something slammed into the door, launching me across the room. As my world spun, I recognized Mac, standing in the doorway looking absolutely feral. My brain seized to work and my body took over, launching myself into the bathroom and locking the door. I didn't hear anything. I expected Mac to enter the room, but instead my ears met absolute silence. No footsteps, no breathing. The only thing I could hear was my own rapid heartbeat. Gemma, can I come in? I heard Mac ask. I didn't respond. Still too overcome with fear, my voice simply couldn't work. I kept thinking no, and somehow it seemed like he got the hint. He didn't ask again, and I still heard nothing. He didn't enter. An hour or so passed before I was able to bring myself to exit the bathroom. As soon as I did, my ears were assaulted with noises of what was going on in the rest of the hotel. Screams, the crashing of furniture meeting walls, doors slamming open. It sounded like all hell was breaking loose. None of the sounds seemed close by though, so I assumed the rampage had already made its way through my part of the hotel. I pulled out my phone, but it had been smashed when Mac had thrown me across the room. I've always been one to explore, so I decided to take the chance and venture out of my room against all of my better judgment. As soon as I entered the hall, all I saw was bright red. Blood painted the walls as if they'd lined up an entire battalion and executed them by fire right there in the hallway. To my right there was an exit, and to my left there was almost guaranteed carnage. But Andre still hadn't come back, and I couldn't bring myself to leave without him. I ventured left. I'd only walked about 50 yards when I first heard the hissing. Every time I spun around, it would stop abruptly. 
I knew immediately that I was being hunted, but I still did not know by what. I finally reached the bar where everyone had just been having fun. Right as I entered the room, Mac reappeared again, stepping out from behind me, the door into the doorway and blocking my exit. He was splattered in blood, staring menacingly at me as a chilling grin spread across his face. I scanned for exits and remembered the balcony. Knowing my choices were run or die, I ran. I exploded through the balcony doors, jumping off the edge. No one followed, but I could feel Mac watching me as peeled myself off the ground, adrenaline forcing my muscles to work and turn the corner of the building out of his sight. Right as I turned the corner, I collided with something cold and hard head first. On the ground, clutching my forehead and feeling the blood pool in my hand, I looked up to see Mike staring down at me with the same menacing grin Mac had just been wearing in the bar. I saw no way out, but suddenly I heard snarling. Mike's gaze turned from me to the sound, and before I could even blink, he vanished. Knowing that if even Mike ran from the noise, I should too. I headed back to the hotel. Every hall seemed to be painted in bright, red, fresh blood. The screams had ceased, but the crashing had not. I reimagined when Mac had broken into my room but hadn't breached the doorway. I knew I had to go back there, to safety. I summoned all my strength and hoped to run, but instead hobbled down the hall to the stairway. I climbed the three flights slower than I'd hoped, my vision growing blurrier with each passing moment, but managed to get to my floor. I slowly cracked the door from the stairs to the hall, but was flung back yet again by someone bursting through. With less force this time, Andre was there looking terrified. I knew whatever had gotten to the others had gotten to him. His eyes flitted to me, but instead of coming to me, he ran up the stairs to the next floor. I heard the door bang behind him, and knew I was alone once again. I sat in shock, scanning my brain for the next move. I wanted to follow Andre, but a feeling in my stomach told me that if I did, I'd be dead. So far, I'd ignored my instincts, and I wasn't going to let that happen again. I made my way to my room instead, and when I arrived, I quietly shut the door behind me, hoping that this was just a dream and I'd wake up soon, somehow knowing that wasn't the case. I sat, straining to hear anything, but all had fallen quiet. Eventually, after a few hours had passed, I heard footsteps. As they drew closer, the hissing began to ring within my ears, and I knew I had to move away from the door. Just as I flopped over, the door shot open, and there was the bride covered in blood, snarling, eyes wide and crazy, looking around the room and then directly at me. In the most sickly sweet voice, she said, Gemma, may I come in? I just stared and after a beat simply shook my head to indicate no. Louder, she asked again. I felt something come over me urging me to invite her in, but resisted, knowing that doing so would only spell disaster. I continued to try, and with each ask it became harder and harder to say no. Just as I was finally about to crack and say yes, I noticed a distinct orange light begin to creep across the floor, and when I looked up to the doorway, the bride was gone. I knew I only had a moment to get out. My body didn't want to respond when I urged it to move, but somehow I got up, grabbed the keys, leaving all my belongings behind, and mustered the courage to run toward the stairwell. Just as I exited the room, I felt myself get pushed into the wall. Dazed, I searched for who had hit me, and saw the bride with the same crazed look in her eyes approaching me, stopping just short of the encroaching orange light that was now pouring out of my hotel room door. She turned to close the door and I took the opportunity to get myself into the stairwell, rolling down the stairs in hopes of not getting incapacitated. She seemed to appear right next to me as I reached the bottom floor. She lunged at me and I flailed my legs, kicking the door to the outside open, bathing her in the morning light. She screamed and lunged out of the light, but it was too late. 
Blisters erupted on her skin and as they spread they turned to ash. Within moments, instead of a crazed bride, there was just a blood splattered wedding gown covering a pile of ash on the floor. I rolled out through the door to bask in the growing sunlight. I rested knowing I was safe, before eventually getting in the car and driving off. Head still spinning, not even thinking to check on Andre, somehow knowing that he couldn't come with me and would not have made it through the night. The news chalked the massacre that continued that night to a mass shooting by a disgruntled wedding guest. I moved away from the east coast to find a new life. But some nights I hear a knock on my door and hear Andre's voice pleading for me to let him in. So I'll try to keep this relatively short. My wife and I sold our first house to capitalize on the housing market and used the windfall to pay off our student loans and the car, etc. After a year of renting at an insanely high price per month, we decided we wanted to buy again. We found an old house in the old part of town. When I say old, I mean old. The house was built in 1883, which makes it 140 years old next year. Single story, three bedroom, one bathroom. We were the only bid on the house, which, considering the market right now, was very hard to believe, but regardless, the house was ours, and my wife, myself, and our daughter moved in. The house was covered in crosses all over the main level. Not being Christian, we removed these. At first, it was what it was. An old house comes with old problems, but it was nothing we couldn't handle. It wasn't until we found the door to the basement that everything changed. The basement was hand dug out with poured cement and carpeting and divided into two sections separately by a wall and a door. The first section was carpeted and what I call presentation ready. It's the area you'd show company. From this first area, you could access the hydro panel and have room for storage. The area beyond the door was about as different as you could get. Bare concrete floor, strange writing on the walls, false wall panels, etc. If I had a choice, I'd stay out of there entirely, but it's how you get to the water heater and the furnace, so I went down regularly. While I was downstairs one day working in the first part of the basement, I heard a strange noise from beyond the partition. Thinking it was the furnace, I went to check it out. Entering the second area, I walked past the strange writing on the walls to the furnace when I noticed a strange, small door built into the wall. The only thing we knew about the previous owners was that the family had owned the house for 100 years and were known in the neighborhood as being very strange and kept entirely to themselves. Opening the door, I found a small stone statue of a tall figure wearing tattered robes, a hood covering his face and horrific tentacles coming from under. The noise happened again, and I dropped the statue out of shock, and it broke on the floor. Inside the opening was a bunch of old, yellowed papers and books. I didn't want to touch anything else, so I left and went upstairs. That night, after the sun set, we heard rumbling in the basement and we swore we heard something growling. The next morning, I went downstairs and found the walls covered with a symbol I didn't recognize and I grew afraid. We hired someone to come out and look at it. The hired hand went downstairs and never came back. I don't know how to explain it. The partition door closed behind him, locked, and the noise came again, and when he started screaming, I pried the door open, but he was gone, and the statue was back in place and whole again. We don't know if it was the removal of the crosses that brought them back into our world. We've become devoted servants because we have no choice to keep our family safe. I send offerings down to the beast or whatever it is, and it leaves us alone. I've taken to displaying the statue upstairs, and I've read the books. I know what the sign is, and I know who the statue is, but I cannot write it here. You can come over, and I'd be happy to tell you. It'll have to be at night, when the stars are right, and Carcosa calls, and you can see my basement for yourself. 
But first, I'm curious. Have you seen the yellow sign? I didn't think monsters were real. Until now, that is. It's kind of hard to deny their existence after you've survived an attack by werewolves. How I got myself into this situation? I decided to go on a cruise. I was expecting to meet some strange people, but nothing like this. Long story short, a pack of werewolves was among the passengers, and they decided the rest of us looked pretty tasty, so they started eating the other passengers. Well in human form, they had convinced some passengers to play some game with them. Don't know what. Apparently they were pretty good, and a largest crowd gathered to watch them play. I happened to be a certain distance from the crowd. I was sunbathing, and I happened to doze off when I was suddenly awoken by screams and shrieks. At first, I was annoyed. I thought, what could possibly be so exciting? Then I saw the crowd dispersing and getting attacked. It took a while until it registered what was happening. Finally, I just found myself running in the same direction as everybody else without understanding why. Instinct of self-preservation, I guess. As I was running, I turned and looked back for a moment, and I saw one of the werewolves pouncing on some poor kid. I was horrified, but I couldn't stop. I had to pick up speed. Problem was, there were a lot of panicked people around, running frenetically in all directions. I managed together with some of the other passengers to enter the dining hall and block the door as well as we could. Now, the interesting part was, these weren't your Hollywood-type werewolves. They weren't active only at night, but, as I already mentioned, also by day. In fact, I suspect, they could change at will. But I wasn't able to confirm or disprove this idea of mine, as once they turn into wolf form, they didn't change back. They look a bit like Hollywood werewolves, though. They were anthropomorphic looking wolves. Actually, they looked like a skinny bear standing on two legs. We were able to hear howling and scratching from behind the door. Luckily, our makeshift barricade held, at least for now, that I had time to evaluate my situation. I panicked even more. I started to hyperventilate. I was seriously considering the possibility that I was not going to make it. Not only that, but I thought of my parents and how devastated they would be. I even imagined my mom wailing and mourning me. As I was their only child, they would never have any grandchildren. They wouldn't have anything to remember me by. Just a few clothes and a few empty bottles of gin I had forgotten to throw away. Not only that, but since I'd gotten myself eaten by monsters, they wouldn't even have a body to bury. I looked around me and everybody was just as terrified and worried as me. Until I noticed Carl in the corner sipping a damn cup of tea as calmly as possible. He didn't even seem to notice the surrounding commotion. Carl was also one of the passengers. He was a tall, elderly gentleman. He looked in excellent health. In fact, you could even describe him as ripped. Carl wasn't popular with the other passengers. I think I was the only one who bothered to talk to him, or he bothered to talk to. If the guy didn't like you, he would flat out ignore you. He spent all his time alone, sitting somewhere in his The Peace Suite and stroking his long white beard, or playing with his ponytail and observing the other passengers. Carl was from somewhere in Eastern Europe. He wasn't married and didn't have any children. What he did for a living? He refused to tell me, but he was a very educated man. He was very knowledgeable in matters of science, history, and philosophy. When he saw me, he gestured me to go to him. I did. What's going on? Werewolves, man. Werewolves. I know it sounds crazy, but... Werewolves, hmm? He interrupted as if it was the most mundane thing ever. You really should try the tea. It helps calm the nerves. How can you talk of tea at a time like this? 
Well, they also have liquor, if you prefer that. No, I would rather... I was interrupted by the sound of the door breaking down. The beast burst in, but stopped when they noticed Carl and me. Carl didn't even flinch, but the werewolves were positively terrified of him. If you ever had a dog, you are familiar with the body language. Tail tucked between the legs, head down, trying to look as small as possible. Whining. You know, I really don't appreciate it. When your kind bothers me on vacation, said Carl, annoyed. The werewolves didn't wait for him to say another word and ran away. Carl stood up and walked away in his usual, calm manner. The monsters were found later in their human form with their stomachs burst from the inside. There was no sign of Carl. To this very day, I have no idea what happened. When the authorities arrived, they concluded the drinks must have been spiked. The passengers suffered from mass delusions and started attacking each other. I don't blame them. The rational person tries to explain the unexplainable. Our story seemed crazy, so of course it must be wrong, mustn't it? No arrests were made. Of course they weren't. The real culprits were among the dead bodies, under mysterious circumstances. Before I start, I feel like I should let something be very clear. I absolutely love Ellen. We've been living together for about three years now, but have known each other our whole lives. In fact, we were childhood friends. And I know this may sound like a fairy tale to some people, but it truly felt like we were always destined to be together. Even after graduation, when we started dating other people, it only felt truly right when we were with each other. So I don't know what took me so long to ask her out, but I'm really glad I did. We have the same taste in music, movies, and even food. We laugh at the same dumb jokes and know exactly how to comfort each other in times of need. She's the kindest, most gentle and loving girl I've ever met. We even been talking about our plans for marriage and how we would like to have kids of our own. That's why it hurts so much how it all went terribly wrong in just four nights. I would also like to preface that Ellen doesn't have much of a family other than me, and some very distant aunts that she never met and doesn't even know their names. I was born in a big family with four siblings and plenty of cousins that were always visiting, and even helping out when we got in trouble. Ellen has none of that. She doesn't have any siblings, and her father was an alcoholic, abusive freak that died when she was young. Her mother was a very kind and inspiring person that took care of the family by herself for many years, and almost a second mother to myself. So when she passed away last year, it hurt us both for a long time. But Ellen stayed strong. She's not the type to let her feelings easily surface, so you gotta be a lot more perceptive to get what she truly feels. I used to proud myself in being capable of that. I felt like I knew her better than I knew myself. That's why this is all so strange and, frankly, terrifying. We were sleeping in bed, and I was dreaming. I don't really remember what it was about, but for some reason I'm sure of it. Until I heard her voice, very close to my ear. Knock, 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 knock. She was caressing my hair gently, while sitting in bed and looking below at me. I slowly opened my eyes, groggy from sleep. Hey, what is it, baby? She kept looking at me fixated and repeated, Knock, knock. Knock, knock. I glanced at the digital clock on top of the dresser. 3.27 a.m. I had work in only a few hours. What is it, Ellen? She paused. Please answer the joke, dear. Knock, knock. Knock, knock. Fine, I accepted. Mostly because I was expecting some kind of surprise. Ellen wasn't the type to do what she was doing for no reason. Who's there? Her smile opened up and she answered. Not me, so don't answer the door. I kept looking at her dumbfounded. What was that supposed to mean? Is that it? Is that the joke? Yes. 
she said, laying in the couch and covering herself with a blanket. Thank you for answering. Weirdo. I answered, closing my eyes and going back to sleep. Next morning, things went as usual. I only remembered the strange conversation while I was alone in the bathroom brushing my teeth, and wasn't even sure if it was what had truly happened or if it was just a weird dream. So we had our breakfast together, and she was acting normal, reading something aloud from a fashion magazine. Frankly, I wasn't paying much attention, so I took the opportunity to ask about last night. Initially, she didn't seem to know what I was talking about. Then her eyes fixated on me, and the same smile from last night crossed her face briefly. And I knew it wasn't just a dream. She told me it wasn't anything of importance, and stopped paying attention when I asked more inquisitively. And even though I shouldn't, I gave up. I had work and other matters to attend to, and just brushed off the weird event thinking it wouldn't happen again. But the following night, I woke up to her voice. Knock, knock. A pause. Knock. What is it now? I said. Ellen, what are you doing? Knock, knock. Knock. She repeated. This time she wasn't even touching me, just sitting in bed, looking at me with that same smile, but her eyes seemed larger and she blinked in longer intervals. I looked at the clock. Once again, 3.27 a.m. Ellen, come on. What is it? I got work in a few hours. Can't have the luxury of waking up in the middle of the night to answer knock-knock jokes. Knock-knock. Knock. This is getting creepy, you know. I'm not sure if this is some gag you've been doing, but I don't like it. Answer it. Knock-knock. Knock. I sighed, but also let a small laugh escape. It was creepy, of course, but she was also my Ellen, so it didn't bother me as much as it should. Fine, who the fuck is there? I answered in a playful tone. Not me, so don't answer the door. For some reason, I felt a chill down in my spine. It was the same answer as before, and I still didn't get what it meant. But the way she said it, with a strange, monotone voice, contrasted well with her smile and the fact that I had no idea of what she meant by that. What does that mean? I asked. I really don't get it. She just smiled and went back to sleep. I felt a throb in my heart, but did the same. Next day, we talked again about what was happening. She was very evasive with my questions, and I barely got her to say anything. It was almost as if she couldn't talk about it, which was very strange. Considering we talk about pretty much everything, I told her I needed to be well rested for work, something she should understand well, and wasn't liking her little gag every night. She just nodded, and I decided to not press further, as I didn't want to hurt her feelings and had work to attend to. When I got back home, we had dinner, watched a movie, and went to bed. Knock knock. I opened my eyes faster this time around. In fact, I barely got any sleep. I just knew she would do it again, and kept thinking about it the whole time. I glanced at the clock. 3.27 a.m. Knock, knock. I thought about ignoring her, just pretending I was asleep and she wouldn't wake me up. So I closed my eyes slowly, hoping that she hadn't seen me opening them in the first place, and stayed quiet. Knock, knock. I'm not answering your fucking joke, Ellen. Stop it. Knock, knock. I ignored, but she kept going. She had never been this insistent with anything before. I tried to ignore it, but it was getting on my nerves, and frankly, I felt scared. Why was Ellen doing this? Why every night? At the exact same time down to the minute? Why wouldn't she let me sleep until I answered her? Knock, knock. I got up in a sudden movement. God damn it, Ellen. I was ready for a discussion, but when I finally glanced at her, it was as if the strength was drained from me. She wasn't smiling. She wasn't blinking. Just staring right at me, fixated like an animal. And her mouth was moving slowly, and she didn't stop. Knock, knock. 
I didn't know how to react or what expression I had when I saw her, but my heart skipped a beat. It was terrifying, as if her gaze froze me in place. A thousand yard stare. Knock, knock. Who's there? I asked, feeling as if it was the only way out of that nightmare. Not me. So don't answer the door, she said weakly. Ellen slowly closed her eyes and laid down. I kept staring at her while she fell into what seemed to be a deep sleep. I got up and left. I walked downstairs and sat down at the couch in the living room, staring at the night sky outside and absorbing the quiet of the neighborhood. My heart was beating fast and it didn't slow down. I was too scared to sleep in the same room as my girlfriend, all because of a fucking knock-knock joke. But it was unnatural. I thought about calling someone. I thought about it all being some kind of sleep-related issue, such as some type of sleepwalking. But it didn't make any sense. I felt so tired and decided that early in the morning, I would call an old friend who's a psychologist and get the opinion of a professional. Something was wrong with Ellen. I stayed in the couch as the day rose and once Ellen woke up, she was acting normal again even asked why I wasn't in bed. I didn't answer. In fact, I didn't speak to her and simply left for work. She seemed very upset, but I wouldn't do anything about it. Once I got to work, I called my friend, told him everything that was happening in as much detail as I'm describing now. He didn't seem as worried as I figured, but we agreed in making an appointment for next week. Now I just needed to convince Ellen to come with me. I received plenty of text messages from her. She seemed very worried, sad, and even confused. She apologized a lot, and it broke my heart a little. I felt bad. I shouldn't have, but I answered her, and made her promise it wouldn't happen again. I also told her about the appointment, and she seemed reluctant but agreed to go with me. So, we made up. This was Ellen, after all. The girl I knew ever since I was six years old. The woman I loved and that had taken care of me for years. And as much as that strange behavior creeped me out, she wasn't doing anything particularly frightening or even dangerous. So for a brief while, I convinced myself I should give her another chance. When I returned home from work, we stayed together. She even prepared my favorite meal. Ellen was acting as gentle and caring as I always remembered, and I slept with her in our bedroom, even though I was still a bit reluctant. Knock. I couldn't believe it. She promised me she wouldn't. Knock. I gazed at the clock. 3.27am. Always. Knock. I was laying on my stomach and I couldn't see her face. In fact, I didn't even bother to look at her. I was feeling more sad than scared at this point. Sad that she had broken her word. Knock. Who's there? I answered, determined to just go back to sleep. Not me. So don't answer the door. I stayed quiet and closed my eyes. I just hoped I would be able to handle it until the appointment next week. To my surprise, I was actually able to sleep, probably because I hadn't been able to rest since last night. The following morning, I went back to not saying anything to Ellen, only very limited responses. I was expecting her to act the same as yesterday, trying to apologize, but she didn't. Mostly, she didn't say anything, almost as if she had accepted it. She also looked tired, or at least a bit weak. I went to work, but I couldn't stop thinking about her. Didn't receive any messages either. Once I got back, we had the most silent dinner I ever had in my life, and she barely ate anything. I decided to let her have the bedroom and sleep on the couch. I wasn't sure if it would stop her, but held on to the hope that she wouldn't go downstairs, only to tell me the same knock-knock joke again. I covered myself with a blanket, shaked off that uneasy feeling, and tried to sleep. I had a deep sleep without dreams, felt like I was lost in darkness. Then I heard breathing, opened my eyes to see Ellen standing above me, looking at me with a big, 
fixated eyes and dilated pupils that didn't seem to belong in such a completely neutral expression watching me sleep. I almost screamed in terror, jumped out of the couch, and her eyes followed me as I stumbled through the dark room, creating distance between us. For a moment, I was able to glance at the clock above the table, 3.27 a.m. Ellen, what are you doing? I asked, desperate, but she didn't move. In fact, she didn't say anything, just stared at me as if I was made of glass and she could see right through me. Then I heard a knock on the front door. Instinctively, I looked in that direction. It was followed by another knock and another. Someone almost pounding at the door. I glanced back at Ellen and she was still staring at me. Slowly, I got closer to the door and she didn't move. The pounding continued. Who's there? I screamed. It stopped and then I heard a voice. John? John, can you hear me? Open the door, please. John, please open the door. I froze in place. The voice kept calling me, but I couldn't believe it. It was Ellen's voice, coming from the other side of the door, but it couldn't be. I beg you, John. Open the door. It's serious. She's not me, I swear. She's not me. Slowly, I turned my head to look at Ellen, standing in front of the couch. She was looking at me, the same fixated eyes and a terrible, wide grin across her face. The pounding continued. John, open the door. Please, you have to trust me. I stayed still, not knowing what to do. And I don't remember what happened after that. I just woke up in my bedroom. The digital clock indicates it's 4.21 a.m. Ellen isn't by my side. I'm completely alone. I'm trembling uncontrollably, and I don't know what's going on. I don't remember what happened after I saw her terrible grin. I don't know if I opened the door. I tried to look at my phone, see if I could call the police or at least someone that I know, but I left it downstairs. All I have is Ellen's laptop, and it's where I'm writing this right now to get advice because I can't go downstairs. The corridor is dark, very dark, almost as if the shadows were leaning into the room, and I can hear a faint scratching sound coming from below. What should I do? Growing up, we had two rules. One, Always follow the instructions. 2. Never go upstairs after dark. We pulled into the driveway around 5.30pm. It is a long gravel path, now overgrown, just far enough from the two-lane county road to be entirely hidden by the oaks that line the property. I'd forgotten the rumble of tires over rocks and was surprised by how much that feeling reminded me of home. Just beyond the trees... I see it for the first time in 20 years. My childhood home is a two-story colonial with a big wraparound porch and a double door entrance. In my memory, the house was a glossy white that would reflect the sun so brightly, you could see it through the trees from the road. It looked diminished now in the evening light. Perhaps it is natural for houses to turn gray and wither when left alone. People do the same. Nadine put the car in park but left the engine running. Then her hand was on mine. Just say the word and we'll go. She promised and I knew she meant it. I felt so small for wanting to take her up on it. But I shook my head and looked at her. And before I could say anything she kissed me deep and long. The fear washed away and did not return. I believe you, she said. Do what you need to do to say goodbye. I'll be right outside. If there's a word for the kind of love you feel when your partner steps out of their comfort zone to support you, I don't know what it is. It made me feel brave, though, and that's what I needed tonight. 
I unzipped the backpack in my lap and pulled out two plastic egg timers. My watch told me it was 20 minutes until sunset. I set the timers, gave one to Nadine, and put the other in my bag. If I'm not back when this goes off, call my phone. Do not come inside under any circumstances. I love you. Love you too. She said, and then she pew pewed me with finger guns. And the cuteness of that made me laugh. 20 minutes. I promised. Then I scooped up my backpack and half jogged to the house. I was nine when my mom remarried. Up to that point, it was just the two of us, and we'd always rented an apartment near mom's work. So I was excited to have a proper dad, finally, and to move into a great big house with so much land. The sellers were an old southern couple who'd outlived the need for such a big house. They made mom and dad uneasy though. They stipulated in the sale that we all had to meet with them and promised to follow two rules. One, always follow the instructions. Two, never go upstairs after dark. Our realtor suggested that we play along for the sake of the sale, so we did. We smiled politely and promised to follow the rules. I wish we'd asked more questions though. If we had, mom might still be alive. I stepped into a shallow foyer and closed the door. It was dark, but enough light came through the windows to show me dust-covered picture frames. Our family of three, forgotten in time. I kept my eyes on the floor and waited by the foyer table. You hear them first. They flutter toward you like moths to a flame, and you must remember not to panic or scream. That only makes it worse. Just keep your head down and wait for the instructions. The note card slid into view. 1. Keep your eyes down. 2. Stay out of the kitchen. 3. Do not make a sound. P.S. Follow me. She is upstairs. Then it took me by the hand and led me into the house. Its hand was cold. Curiosity got the better of me and I peeked at its face. Raven black curls framed a stern-looking middle-aged woman. She squeezed my hand so hard that my knuckles popped. And with her other hand, she held up a single finger. Got it. I kept my eyes down. My guide led me upstairs to mom's sewing room. That's where I found her body. She was still wearing her blue dress with yellow sunflowers and a single shoe. All that remained in those old clothes was a bright white skeleton. It almost looked like a Halloween decoration, if perhaps too real. I put the egg timer on the floor nearby. Ten minutes. Then I got to work. I dumped the contents of my backpack so that I'd have somewhere to put mom. The little cylinders inside fell to my feet and rolled around on the floor. Then I reverently gathered my mother's skeleton into my bag. Something shuts off in your brain and you have to do something like that. You don't think about the details of which bone you are touching or who it belonged to. I had to pry a piece of charred firewood out of her right hand. Looks like we came to the same conclusion, Mom. I'm nearly finished when I hear Nadine's voice downstairs. You have to leave now, I yell. My timer went off, she called back. Like, five minutes ago. I have been calling you non-stop. There's a reason we always followed the rules. Topsy had the body of a person, but with two long arms and great claws that scratched the old wooden floors when it prowled the upstairs rooms. Its skin was yellow-brown like cigarette-stained paper, and his face was upside down. That's why I gave it that name all those years ago. All that was left of my egg timer fell from Topsy's hand and landed with an off-key ding. Still crouched near the place I had gathered mom, I grabbed one of the cylinders by my feet and slowly unscrewed its cap. I spent the last 20 years trying to make sense of this place, 
I made lists for everything and followed rules obsessively. But there's no therapy for downstairs ghosts and upstairs ghouls. There's no treatment for a monster putting mommy in the fireplace. One night, Nadine gently suggested that conquering my fears would help me move on. But fear is not an enemy to be defeated or a mountain to be climbed. Fear is a house. In my house, there are things dark and scary and unexplainable. Drinking myself senseless did not work. Therapy did not work. Even finding love, real love, didn't work. Those things cannot hurt a house made of wood and stone and ghosts and topsy. No, for this house. Only fire works. I pulled the string on the cylinder in my hand. The flare burst to life and Topsy screamed and recoiled. I popped another flare, and another until it was surrounded. The room was well aflame by the time I left the house. Nadine and I stood in the tall grass of the front yard and watched the fire spread. We didn't leave until the house collapsed in smoke and burning embers. I refused to move until I could no longer hear Topsy's screams. We buried Mom on a hill about a mile from the ruined house the next morning. I said a few words and marked the grave with sunflowers. Nadine cried, and I felt like I should have. But I didn't feel sad. I felt relieved. It was finally over. We got back to the car a little after noon. It was my turn to drive. I made a U-turn in the yard and headed back up the gravel driveway. I couldn't resist one look at the smoking ruins in the rearview mirror. My eyes stared on it until it was no longer visible through the trees. And then I turned onto the paved road and headed home. I pretended not to hear the distant wailing cry. So did Nadine. We've been trying to reach you about your cars. I hung up. Who on earth is even falling for these scam calls? It's always the same robotic voice. I don't even own a car. I bike to my classes. If they had even a slightly intelligent scammer behind that phone, you'd think they'd at least check if their unlucky victim had a car. Everyone's gotten their share of spam calls before if they've had a cell phone. It's a 21st century universal experience. On top of that, Everyone and their mother has had the whole car's extended warranty scheme pulled on them at least once or twice. Or if you're me, I guess, and they call you every other minute. My phone had started ringing again as I was sitting there at my desk thinking about it. I glanced down and saw a number I didn't recognize, so I hit decline. I have work I need to get done. Regardless of my silent prayers that my phone would remain quiet, it kept going off. My ringtone kept greeting me every time I thought it was over. I snatched up my phone off my desk and answered. What? We've been trying to reach you about your bikes. I hung up after hearing most of that. It wasn't until I put my phone back down that I realized the robotic droning on the other end had said, Bike, not car. I found myself eyeing my phone wearily. I waited for the call, but this time, it seemed that I had warded the caller off, so I decided I had misheard it. The stress of college probably getting to me. I'm sure it said car. My ringtone started going off again the next morning, waking me up before my alarm could. I was too exhausted to notice that it was an unknown number. I just flipped over and grabbed it off the nightstand, putting it up to my ear. Hello? My own groggy voice was met with silence for an uncomfortable amount of time. I sat up, rubbing my eyes, listening, but all I could hear on the other end was breathing. Confused, I checked the ID and saw the unrecognizable number. I was about to just hang up when I heard that voice again. We've been trying to reach you about your bike's extended warranty. 
If it continued talking, or I hung up right away, I can hardly remember. I was sure then that the robot had said bike. I guess I had complained before about how I didn't even own a car, and that they should research their victims, but that wasn't what I thought was going to happen. It's just a coincidence. It has to be. Once I turned back in, I had already hung up without thinking. Sighing, I recalled where my bike was chained up outside in front of my dorm. Maybe I should walk to class, just for a few days. That's exactly what I did. It was kind of a pain and I ended up being late a couple times, but the little anxious itch in the back of my head was scratched. I was a little relieved when I hadn't received any new calls yet. Maybe that was the right decision. Until my phone started ringing again. I flipped it over from where it lay face down on my desk and saw the number. It was the same area code as the rest of the calls. 811. Not that it had a location listed under the number. I clicked accept and put the phone up to my ear. Just like the previous time, there was the sound of quiet breathing until the familiar voice chimed at me. We have been trying to reach you about your extended life warranty. I dropped my phone. I've never hit the end call button so fast in my life. The phone lay flat on the carpeted dorm room floor as I sat opposite from it at my desk. I couldn't take my eyes off of it. Extended life warranty? It started ringing again. I didn't touch it, but it kept ringing. Finally, I slowly reached down, turning it over. At that point, I made an incredibly foolish decision. I tapped accept, but I wasn't greeted by the same robotic voice as always. Instead, there was a person. Why did you pick up? I stared down at my phone, not saying anything. I didn't know what to tell the woman on the other end. I could hear her breathing heavily, as if she had just ran to the phone. It was a familiar breathing pattern. Why did you pick up? She screamed into the receiver, making me flinch with how loud it was. They're going to come for you now. What? Was all I could remember mustering up. It was hard to speak with my heart pounding into my throat. I tried to warn you. God. The woman cut herself off. I stayed quiet. Suddenly, she screamed. It was shrill and long. The sound started to garble as if the reception was cutting out. It was turning robotic. More familiar until it finally ceased. The call didn't end. I watched as the timer displayed on my screen continued to tick up. Each second that passed felt like days. I slowly extended my arm, aiming to end the call with as much caution as possible. But that voice spoke again. This is a final courtesy call before we terminate your warranty. I tapped the red button on my screen. No sooner than I did, however, there was a knock on my door. I held my breath. I began to scoot away from my desk in the chair, grabbing my laptop off my desk and trying to reach the window as silently as possible. There was another knock. I held my breath. The knocks turned into pounding. I didn't dare to move an inch anymore. My phone started ringing again. I was several feet away from it, so I didn't even try to see who was calling, just in case it was someone else. But I didn't have to check. It picked up by itself. We are afraid your warranty has been terminated. Open up. I didn't move. The pounding on the door began to become slamming, as if someone was throwing their entire body weight against the door. I chewed on the inside of my cheek to keep myself quiet, so hard that I could feel blood start to trickle into my mouth. The slams were only growing louder and louder with each passing second. Let us in. Your warranty must be terminated. Open the door. The robotic voice droned on from my phone. I continued to stay as silent as possible, curled up in a ball in my desk chair. I didn't move a muscle. It must have been hours. The sun was starting to set through my window, but I still didn't budge. I was terrified, and then my savior arrived. The door opened. I thought I was done for, but it was just the guy in the dorm across the hall from mine. 
I straightened up so quickly that my laptop nearly fell to the floor. I scrambled to grab it as the guy leaned against the door. I didn't know his name, but he was giving me a weird sort of look. Are you okay in there? I thought I heard something hitting the door. He said, eyeballing me. I managed to give him a weak smile. I'm fine, thanks. How was he going to believe me if I told him the truth? If you're sure, keep it down. You're going to disturb somebody. He shut the door and went back to his room. It was quiet. The call had ended. I'm sitting on my bed now, writing out everything that happened in this past week or so. It's been maybe an hour since my neighbor left, and I haven't heard anything since then. I'm praying whatever was coming for me is done now, but who knows? I'm going to get a new phone for sure. I'm typing this on my laptop since I'm sort of scared to touch my phone, pathetically enough. I think I'm going to get a roommate next year as an extra safeguard. Someone who will overhear everything as well, hopefully. Convince me I didn't hallucinate the whole thing or something. I think I'm safe now. But if I get any more calls at all, I'm going to block them immediately. I recommend all of you do the same. I swear I'm going crazy. I can't breathe. It all started two months ago when I was walking to the bus stop. I live alone at the end of a road surrounded by the forest. Between my house and the main road is a cemetery. This cemetery is hundreds of years old. In fact, it is abandoned. No one visits the cemetery. Even the family of those buried there are long gone. Every time I need to walk past the cemetery to the bus stop, I make it brief. It's creepy. On this particular day, I needed to grab some groceries. As I'm walking by the cemetery, I hear a blood-curdling scream. Help me. At this point, I'm booking it and not looking back. I don't screw with the paranormal. On my way back from the grocery store, it's dark and I'm walking back to my house. I make it in safely and I didn't hear any more screams. Almost a week goes by and no screaming. Until Friday. I was making my way to the bus stop. It's about 7 a.m. I'm walking by the cemetery and hear a little boy crying in a dry, raspy voice. Please, someone, help me. I'm so scared. I decided to walk into the cemetery. Everything feels off. I feel like I'm being watched. I hear where the voice is coming from and kneel next to his grave. Jack L. Thompson, born 1798, died 1806. The poor boy was only eight. I say a prayer for him in my head and make my way to the grocery store. I'm back home and still can't help but feel like I'm being watched. Weeks pass by and every time I pass the cemetery I hear screams and cries of agony. I feel like I'm going crazy. And I hear it. A knock on my door. It's a man. He's in a panic. Can you please help me with my car? He pleaded. I took a wrong turn and I ended up next to the cemetery and I keep hearing screaming. I think the spirits are mad at me. He cried. I was in shock. Not crazy. Alright, don't worry. I'll get you out of there in no time. I give him a reassuring smile. I get my tools and we head down to his car. Well, it's your tire. Do you have a spare? I asked. I'll get it. Thank you so much for helping me. He said. Then we heard it. A woman's voice screaming. They're really mad. He says shakingly. He began to say a prayer. He gives me the tire from his trunk. I put it on and go to put the damaged tire in his trunk. I see a shovel with blood on it. I drop the tire as the impact from a wrench hits my head and sends needles running down my neck. I remember my knees hitting the ground. I'm awake. I swear I'm going crazy. I can't breathe. I'm screaming and crying for help. Confined to this coffin.
When I, 23 female, was 17, I was saving up for a backpacking trip and decided to get a second job. My dad happened to know a woman who owned a wedding venue and was looking for someone to do odd jobs around the property. For the sake of anonymity, we will call the woman Megan. From the moment I met Megan, I loved her. Truly, she was an amazing boss. I had absolutely no experience with any of the things she asked me to do, and looking back, I was a slow and, in my opinion, useless employee. However, she paid me extremely well and really liked me, tending to the garden, babysitting her five-year-old daughter, feeding the horses, painting fences, talking down brides, having a mental breakdown. I was up for anything, except when it came to the guest house. The guest house was a beautiful new building situated above the horse stables. The bridesmaids and bride-to-be would stay there the night before the wedding, and the night the bride and groom would stay there, they could look out the window and see the shimmering pond and the horses grazing in the field while eating a huge fresh breakfast that Megan would make with eggs from the chickens and veggies from the garden. It was truly beautiful. Yet, every time I was sent to clean after they left, I was paralyzed with fear. All my life, I have been a very independent person who prefers to be on my own, so this kind of job is right up my alley. But from the first moment I stepped in there, I got an acute feeling that something wasn't right. The best comparison I can think of is when you are out alone, and a man approaches you, and he has this hungry look in his eyes like he wants something and you get a sinking feeling in your gut, and a heartbeat in your ears, and you suddenly feel very exposed. I tried to shake this feeling off. Honestly, I felt embarrassed. This was such a beautiful, bright guest house with all new furnishings. There was nothing creepy about it at all. But the longer I stayed, the worse it got. The worse of all was the bathroom. Because when I scrubbed the bath, my back was to the door and I could feel something behind me. Goosebumps would cover my arms and my heart would race, but every time I turned around, there would be nothing there. I would clean as fast as I could, but that presence behind me was so strong it felt suffocating. I know it might sound crazy, but I was not alone. Something was watching me, and whatever it was did not like me. Every week, the feeling got stronger. I began to dread coming into work. I had nightmares, but I never told Megan. How could I? I never actually saw anything scary in the guest house. One time in particular, when I was cleaning the tub, the feeling got so bad that I whipped around and ran as fast as I could down the stairs and outside. I stood out there gasping for breath. I felt like I had almost died, even though really, nothing had happened at all. When my backpacking trip approached, and I handed in my notice, Megan asked to take me out to dinner. We had a great time talking about some of the crazy weddings we had that summer, and then she suddenly got serious. She said that now that I was leaving, she had to tell me something. She told me that I lasted the longest out of anyone she'd ever known cleaning the guest house. I went completely still and asked her why. She said that in the past two years, since the venue has been opened, she has had many strange complaints about the guest house. Megan's best friend used to clean it, but would only do it with her husband, claiming that it terrified her for a reason she couldn't explain. She also had a bride and groom say that the venue was lovely, but there was something very negative in the guest house. Worst of all, Megan told me she once had someone leave in the middle of the night, they told her they couldn't sleep, because something was there with them. I was floored. I felt like I had been punched in the gut. Suddenly all the months I had spent feeling embarrassed and crazy became something else entirely. I told her how terrified I had been, how scared I was to come to work, and she apologized profusely, which I appreciated because honestly, I was a little peeved she didn't tell me before. She said that she hadn't believed in any supernatural stuff until this guest house, and I couldn't help but agree with her. She promised to deal with the problem, 
I didn't know how she would do that, but wished her luck. When I came back from backpacking four months later, Megan asked to meet with me. I had been itching for an update about the guest house, and I think she could sense that. She told me after I left, she called someone to come assess the situation. Honestly, I still don't know much about supernatural things, so I don't know the right title for what this lady was, but I guess she's a well-known spiritual woman in our town who people have gone to for this sort of stuff. I guess she went into the guest house and immediately pointed to the vanity in the powder room. The powder room and the bathroom sit directly across from one another. I realized that when I cleaned the bathtub and felt that presence behind me, it was the vanity which was the only thing within my eyeline each time I turned around. Megan told me she got the vanity at an estate sale, and it had been in the guest house since the venue first opened. She said that the lady told her it was the most powerful spiritual force she had ever worked with, and asked that Megan destroy the vanity immediately, which she did. She also later told Megan that the spirit followed her home and attacked her and tried to possess her, but... I'm only mentioning that briefly because A, despite what I experienced, I don't really believe that, and B, Megan didn't tell me much about it. Since the vanity was destroyed, Megan tells me that she hasn't had any more issues or complaints with the guest house, but now she's super into spiritual stuff, which she wasn't before. Before this happened to me, I would scoff at these kinds of stories or explain them away but nothing can ever explain the way I felt in that guest house. Now, whenever someone tells me, or I read a creepy story, I pause before dismissing it, and think about those times where my whole body was immobilized with fear, which at the time, was seemingly no reason at all. I had read the earliest entry when it was first bequeathed, and I didn't think much of it. He passed in 2010 from supposed Parkinson's, but we never really knew what happened. Just that it was very sudden. However, we wanted to do a 10-year celebration of his life when the pandemic hit, and had to postpone it until this year. I thought I would transcribe the journal and have it available to have pieces of it read at the celebration but I've been reading it, and I'm somewhat in shock. Here's the current transcript. February 3rd, 2000. Dad's been gone for a week. I feel empty. It was so sudden. No one expects an aneurysm. Mom was silent for a while, but she's here now. She cooked for the first time in months, given it was honestly weird tasting. But she's really stepping up being the mom I always needed. I have to go. It's time for his funeral. And I have to be strong. Mom refused an open casket, but it's probably for the best. She has some weird superstitions, and maybe that's one of them. My 10th birthday is next week and I'm having a party. But it just feels wrong without Dad. February 3rd, 2010. Wow, my diary from when I was a kid. But my last entry was when my dad died. That's morbid. Not much has changed except mom still doesn't cook. She cooked for around a month after he died, but she was bad at it. Nothing ever tasted right. I threw up a couple times after dinner, and the meat always came out feeling wrong on my tongue, so she stopped. It's my 20th next week. Ten years since Dad died. Mom acted funny at first, but she's back to normal now. I never actually got to college. We didn't have the money to afford it, but that's okay. Mom didn't ever really work much afterwards anyway, so I never got my hopes up. I'm just grateful that ten years later, we're okay. March 9th, 2010. I've been getting a lot of headaches lately. I'm probably just dehydrated, but it's still annoying. Mom has been getting snappy, and we've fought more than ever. I think it might be time I move out. I still live in the small town I grew up in, and it might be time for a change. 
March 30th, 2010. New apartment. I don't know why I brought this old diary with me, but it's totally nostalgic. I was a pretty cool kid, I guess. I've had a ton of arm pain recently, but I don't know. It's probably stress. Mom practically kicked me out when I said I might leave, and traveling to Austin was a weird experience. I'm used to the middle of nowhere, and this most certainly isn't. The headaches have gotten worse, but Advil seems to help. April 19th, 2010. I'm having difficulty walking, which is really weird. I went to the doctor, but they just prescribed me with pain meds. And I didn't even remember to mention the balance stuff. I've been tripping too. How tired am I? I have a job interview tomorrow, so hopefully I'll feel better by then. April 20th, 2010. I got the job. Meet the new assistant coordinator of this cute little startup. So much work to do and the pay is crap, but I'm still excited. My hands have been shaking all day. April 27th, 2010. Or all week. May 13th, 2010. It's dad's birthday. Mom called today. She couldn't stop crying. Then she couldn't stop laughing. She called four times, each time forgetting she called before. I'm scared. Before I left, she was having trouble walking. May 25th, 2010. I'm going to visit mom. She's bedridden at home and I need to see her. I'm taking a week off of work, so there goes that promotion. I can't lose her too. May 26th, 2010. Mom barely remembers me. She can't eat and I can tell it's almost over. She handed me a letter, but I'm too scared to read it. I just want to be here for her. She is all I have left. May 27th, 2010. She's gone. May 28th, 2010. I still haven't read the letter. I've scaled back on work, partially because of grief and partially because I can't stop shaking. I'm forgetting simple tasks, yelling at coworkers. What is wrong with me? June 28th, 2010. I forgot where I put this journal. Everything is getting harder. My legs are practically immobile now. I can't stop crying. I've been to doctor after doctor and no one knows what's wrong. Why am I so sad? There's a letter on my desk, but I feel dread whenever I look at it. I quit my job. July 1st, 2010. I read the letter. Mom was more spiritual than I thought. She only cooked for a month after dad died because the meat wasn't fresh afterwards. I feel sick. She and dad had done this. It was never an aneurysm. I'm starting to forget what day it is. Who I am? She killed me. I am dying and I can't even remember why. July 2nd, 2010. I quit my job. July 9th, 2010. I read the letter, or I tried to. My hands kept shaking and I couldn't focus on the words. I can't move anymore. What is wrong with me? Everything is getting harder. My legs no longer work and my throat is closing up. July 17th, 2010. I can't do this. There's nothing left. August 1st, 2010. Wow, my diary from when I was a kid. The rest of the journal is illegible scribbles. Any advice on how to proceed with the celebration of his life next week? I live in an apartment complex that sits in a outer part of town. The nearest market is half an hour away, but the price of my home is worth it. I live with my roommate Caleb, and together we pay about $5.50. It's a fairly nice place with two bedrooms, two bathrooms, a kitchen, and dining space. 
and a living room. The appliances are fairly nice and it feels like I'm getting much more than I'm paying for. But the one freaky thing about this place is the neighbors. For background, Caleb has a French bulldog named King that lives with us. Or, well, he had one. One evening we were off to the store for some generic groceries. There was a break-in. Nothing was broken except for the window used to enter the house. And nothing was taken except for King. We put up posters, asked neighbors, but we saw no sign of him. It was devastating for the both of us as we loved this dog tremendously. A week or so later, there was a smell coming from the office building of our apartments. It wasn't a bad smell, it smelled like the Texas barbecue I grew up with. I went to investigate and saw a bunch of my neighbors gathered around some picnic tables and a grill. They were all wearing the same generic black robe draped around their shoulders. There was about 20 to 30 people gathered, wearing and eating the same thing. Maybe this was some neighborhood tradition I didn't get the memo of. One of my older neighbors, Casey, sat me down and handed me a plane. She offered me a robe, but I objected. I took a bite of the meat on the plate and got a flashback of home. It tasted marvelous. I had never had such good barbecue. I asked the manager of the cookout about it, but he didn't reveal his secrets. Whatever mysterious family recipe this was, i definitely eat it again. As Caleb arrived from work, he noticed the cookout and joined us. He didn't eat any of the food, nor did he take a robe. He quickly grabbed me without reason and took me home. He lectured me on how this was some creepy cult meeting and I shouldn't be participating. After reviewing the thoughts in my head, I completely agreed. But that was just a weird one-off thing my neighbors did, right? You'd be mistaken. The apartment above me belongs to an old guy from England. His accent stuck out like a sore thumb, but he was the most popular person among the neighborhood. He would hold large get-togethers at his house every other Sunday. They aren't loud, more so the opposite. I don't hear a sound from him, not even his giant footsteps echoing through the floor. Except occasionally, I hear this loud buzzing. It goes on for about an hour, but not every time he has one of his little house parties. But about a month ago, I started noticing these strange markings in everyone's right forearm. Whether it was just a friendly wave, a handshake, a high five, all my neighbors had one of these markings. Also, the other night while I was in bed, I heard this scratching. Caleb was asleep and wild animals didn't lurk around here often. I didn't get up as I was too lazy, but it kept on for 15 minutes or so. The next morning, I noticed the symbol that was on everyone's wrist was carved into my door. I was terrified. As I opened the door to check though, two flyers slipped from the crack of my door. A missing dog flyer. And a cookout invitation. A bit of backstory, I'm a 22 year old university dropout. I lost my parents when I was 6 years old in an airplane accident. Or so my grandparents told me. I was never good at making friends and I was bullied in school. As such I never had real friends. Everything changed when I started playing League of Legends back in 2014. There I had many friends, and they actually cared if I missed an opportunity to play with them. As time went on, they began forgetting about the game and me, and I was alone once again. That brings us to April 2020. I decided to drop out of university when the pandemic struck. We all had to stay in, which I didn't mind. I continued playing League of Legends. I thought that I was better staying inside. By November 2020, I had become severely depressed and alcoholic. All that loneliness had affected my mental health. This went on until May of 2022. It was then that I found an article about spiritualism and its benefits. I soon became obsessed with the paranormal. Late one night, 
I searched how I could communicate with the other side, and there it was. The Ouija board ritual. I wanted to try it out. Since I had no money though, I decided to go with my other method. I wrote all the letters on small pieces of paper, as well as the words yes and no. But then, I got scared and left it. Some days later, I was feeling depressed and had nothing to lose. Also, I could ask for happiness. Or so I thought. I went to my setup and started the seance. Is there anyone here with me? Yes. Do they know me? Yes. Do I know them? No. What is their name? Jonathan. Could he make sure that I won't be sad or depressed again? He paused. Yes. And that's where I decided to end it. I thanked Jonathan for being with me and went to sleep. For the next three weeks, I could actually communicate with Jonathan using the homemade Ouija board. I talked to him for most of my day and he actually made me feel much better. The almost two years of depression were gone since I could openly speak with someone who wouldn't judge me and rather help me. As mid-June came by though, I started noticing some weird things happening in my house. Stuff was missing or was in another place from where I had left it. I didn't notice at first because it was a small thing. What got me creeped out was that the small paper from my homemade Ouija board were on my desk spelling, not sad. I tried to communicate with Jonathan, but he wouldn't answer. Then I thought he had left and I got up in a hurry to search for some information on what to do. Once I sat on my chair and turned on my PC, I felt a painful scratch on my back. I jumped from my seat trying to find who it was, but I was alone once again. From then on, every time I was depressed or sad, I feel a painful scratch on my back. And a whisper is heard, but it's so low I can't understand what it says. Recently, my grandmother passed away. And when my grandmother told me I wanted to cry so hard, but I couldn't. When my happiness turned to sadness, I started feeling four nails on my neck. I held my tears, although I couldn't. I can't be sad anymore. He does everything, so I'm not. But that means I'm in pain. When I'm feeling down, I'm feeling pain. He does everything to make me happy. Maybe he thinks we're friends. About a month ago, my five-year-old daughter, who I'll call Dee, got a sudden interest in photography. She probably saw someone with a camera on TV and decided that she wanted one. For two weeks, she begged us for a camera, and me and my husband decided that we wanted to support her and her interests. We bought her a simple and cheap digital camera and gifted it to her. We taught her how to use it, which wasn't much more than pointing and clicking and told her that she would get her favorite photos printed. Dee took her camera everywhere with her, and took pictures of everything. We often had to delete a lot of blurry photos to make room for more. She was very good at following rules too, such as don't take other people's pictures without their permission, don't point the camera at the sun, and always wear the wrist strap. Me and my husband were very proud, and hoped that we were raising a future photographer. Last week, I had a day off, so I decided to go run some errands. I brought Dee along since my husband was at work, and there was no one to watch her. She didn't mind though, as long as she could bring her camera, she was happy. We ran by the post office, the bank, and lastly, a large clothing store, as I needed a new blouse for a party that was coming up. Dee and I walked inside and she instantly started to snap pictures of some sparkly dresses. I mostly ignored her as I looked around, keeping her in the corner of my eye. I looked through some shirts on one of those round racks, and Dee decided to push through them and duck inside. She did this often, as many kids do. She giggled away, and I let her be, and looked around at some other racks. After a few minutes, I called her, wanting to move on to a different section. She didn't answer me. 
Come on, D. You can't stay in there. I said. I couldn't hear any giggling, and she wasn't responding. I walked over to the rack and spread the shirts to look inside. D wasn't there. I called out to her, telling her to come to me. I looked around, but couldn't see her anywhere. This is when I started to panic a little. I had been keeping my eyes on that rack and knew that I didn't see her come out, but she had to be close by. I quickly walked around the area, looking inside other racks and calling out to her more. She was nowhere, and I started to really panic. I rushed to the checkout counter nearby and asked the cashier if she had seen her. Is your child missing? The cashier asked me. I told her the situation and she spoke into the microphone on her collar. We have a missing child, most recently seen in women's formal. My heart was beating so fast, and I could feel my face was red. I was embarrassed, worried that I looked like a terrible mom, but as long as Dee was found, it would all be okay. The other employees are searching the store for her now. Can you tell me what she looks like? The cashier asked me. I told her, and she repeated it into her microphone. Okay, ma'am, thank you. We have security by the front door to make sure she doesn't leave the store. She said. I didn't even want to think about the possibility that someone could take her. I went to look some more, calling out Dee's name, telling her that she wasn't in trouble and to just come out. Dee was always so well behaved. She never ran off like this. 20 minutes went by, and I was in full panic mode with tears forming in my eyes. Suddenly I heard crying. I recognized it as Dee instantly. I followed it, running across the store. I came to the same round rack that Dee had hidden inside initially. I looked inside and sure enough, there she was. I pulled her out as she sobbed and picked her up. I assumed that she had gone back inside the rack when I wasn't looking. I asked her if she was alright, and why she was crying. There was nobody, she said. I was confused and asked her what she meant. Nobody anywhere. I didn't know what she was talking about, so I asked her again. All alone. She was in hysterics. I pet her head and went back to the checkout and told the cashier that I had found her. She told her microphone that Dee had been found and called off the search. I was relieved, but worried. Did a stranger try to take her, or did she just get lost for a bit? I took her home and put her in bed for a nap, and told my husband what had happened when he got home. Later that night, Dee was doing better. I asked her if I could see her photos from that day, as it always cheered her up when me and my husband looked at them. She gave me her camera, and I scrolled through the photos. There was some of the post office, some of the bank, and lots of photos of clothes. I cannot explain the last few photos. It was the clothing store, except there were no people. That didn't make sense as there were lots of people in the store when we were there. There were lots of photos of the empty store, even one of the checkout counter without the cashier there. She had taken a photo of the front door and several of the parking lot. The parking lot was empty. There were no cars, no people, nothing. You could see the street and there was no traffic in sight. No wonder Dee had cried so hard. She was all by herself, some place where there were no people. I don't know where Dee had gone, but I worry every day now. What if somehow she gets taken back? It all started with bitter rejection, utter humiliation. That evening I made the unfortunate decision to go see Mindy. My best buddy Cliff tried to talk me out of it, but I was madly in love with the girl. She was way out of my league, of course. Cliff attempted to tell me so. Most crushes are. I should have trusted Cliff. After all, he was the one with the girlfriend. At least, he told me so. I had never met her. 
but I didn't even have an imaginary girlfriend to show for, so I turned a deaf ear and set off to see Mindy. This was pre-Facebook or Instagram, you see. No such thing as sending out an invite. You actually had to go see your crush to get properly rejected. Now why did I choose to go to her house and not just ask her out at school? That's an interesting question because Mindy lived in a farmhouse outside town, a mile or so into the woods. As darkness was setting in, I actually began to regret my decision. Then the Jones property finally appeared into view. A great slab of land surrounded by trees with a stately manor in the middle. Not much farming going on here. I knew Mindy's dad was loaded and had fixed the place up to be a quiet home in the woods. Leaving my bicycle and starting for the house, I murmured, Hey Mindy, wanna go see a movie? My heart drummed in my throat as I stepped onto the porch and reached for the doorbell. Just a small wait. Then Mindy greeted me herself. She looked surprised to see me. To make matters worse, one of her cheerleader friends stood beside her. Fuck. I would have turned away right there and then. Steve? Can I help you? The subject of my obsession querying. Hi, Mindy. I began. My voice shook, and the next words came out like glue. Wanna go see a movie sometime? Her friend snickered. Mindy's face clouded. Oh, Mandy said, elbowing her stupid friend. I mean, you're a decent guy, Steve, but I'm not interested. See you around, okay? Yeah, sure, I... She had already slammed the door into my face. I could overhear Mindy's friend burst into laughter, and Mindy's irritated but amused response. I just stood there on the porch for a while, heart in shambles. Then I returned to my bicycle with sagging shoulders, convinced I would never find love. But that was not how the evening ended. Cursed tears stung my eyes as I made my way home. My weak front light barely lit the pitch dark forest road, but the small light did find the figure that suddenly entered the road. Breaking hastily, I almost dropped from my saddle, eyeing the stranger. It was a pretty girl. Even more pretty than Mindy, in fact. Raven black hair fell on her shoulders and dark eyes found me. I briskly wiped the tears from my eyes. Don't cry for her. She's a bitch. Who? I started at her words. Who are you? You live around here? I do. I'm the foster kid. Of the Joneses, I mean. The girl said. Been with him for a while now. I'm Isabel. She held up a bottle that looked an awful lot like bourbon. You look like you need a drink. My eyes grew big. Where did you get that? Ripped it from my asshole foster dad. Want a sip or not? I hesitated, but was well aware that a beautiful girl just asked me out drinking. Mindy had been a mistake. This actually happened. So I nodded. Sure. We sat down behind the trees. Just shy of 16, this was the first time I got really hammered. We talked for hours, about movies, music, and bullshit. Isabel didn't open up about herself a lot. Since I had never seen her around, I figured she went to a different school than Mindy. When I finally got up to leave, my companion surprised me by planting a kiss on my mouth. Her lips were cold as ice, but obviously, I didn't care about that. You want to come back to my house? She asked. I know a shortcut. She gestured at the dark trees with a daring look in her eyes I could barely resist. But Mindy was still in the back of my mind. Wouldn't want to run into her again. Not tonight. I said, regret seeping through in my voice. I should really go. My parents are probably wondering where I am. She looked disappointed, but then her face cleared. Fine. See you later, village boy. Isabel smiled, kissing me again. Longer, this time. I offered to take her home, but she shook her head. I know a shortcut, remember? 
Fuck Mindy. I thought on the way home. Now I know how it feels to be in love. My lips still tingled. I realized this had been the first time I kissed a girl. No, I reconsidered proudly. She had kissed me. The next couple of weeks were one of the best of my life. I went to see Isabel a lot, always in that same spot between the trees. We made out and did a lot of other stuff as well, stuff I only dreamt of doing with a girl a few weeks ago. Cliff clearly noticed something, but he was also busy with his girlfriend. We didn't see much of each other, other than at school. I don't know why I didn't open up about Isabel, perhaps because it felt a bit strange, telling him I was meeting some girl in the forest. Thinking back now, that was kind of weird. Isabel invited me back to her place every time. I never gave in. On eager to run into Mindy. I wonder if she ever spotted me with her foster sister. She obviously didn't care. And then Mindy died. A crosswalk and a drunk driver. This was all it took to end her life in an instant. The school was shocked, the town was shocked, Mindy had been extremely popular. I went to the memorial just like everybody else in school. I never saw people as broken as the Jones. Mindy had been their only daughter. Their real daughter, I mean. Isabel sat with them staring at Mindy's coffin with empty eyes. She held the hand of Mr. Jones as he cried, never so much as throwing me a look. That was surprising. I thought she hated her foster dad. But when I went to see her afterwards, my girlfriend had disappeared. I had half the mind to offer the Jones my condolences and ask them where Isabel was. Something held me back. Felt selfish. Around that same time, Cliff went missing. He had told his parents he was going to do homework at my place, though he had never made such plans. I figured he snuck off with his girlfriend somewhere, but a couple of days in, he still hadn't returned home. The police got involved and found his car at the edge of town. Cliff wasn't in it. Neither was his girlfriend for that matter. Of course, I was concerned about my friend and helped the police as best as I could, but I have to admit, my heart was somewhere else. Isabel had stopped texting me. That was weird because she had been sending me messages almost every day. I rode to the spot in the woods a couple of times, but she was nowhere to be seen. It ate away at me, and I started to get worried. I realized how little I knew about her. I didn't even know the school she went to. So one day, I decided to go see her at the Jones place. As I parked my bicycle and stepped into the lawn, I noticed a change around the farm. I couldn't shake this oppressing feeling, like something bad had happened. Last time I had been here, I had asked Mindy out. I realized as I stood on the porch, and now she was dead. Hard to imagine. It also hit me I hadn't thought about Mindy's death since the memorial. Isabel was in the front of my mind. I rang the doorbell, silently praying Isabel would answer the door. No such luck. Mr. Jones appeared. He looked terrible, with grayish hanging skin and dark circles under his hollow eyes. I guess that's what losing a child does to you. The whole thing suddenly felt awkward. Mr. Jones, I... I stuttered. I'm so sorry about your daughter. I always liked Mindy a lot. I dropped a moment of silence, but he just stared at me like he hadn't even heard. Is Isabel home? The question finally got his attention, his eyes fixed on me like a cat. Isabel? He mumbled. Isabel? How do you know? Then his eyes flashed to a point behind me. Hey, you! He pushed me aside, running down the lawn, heading for the forest. That's not what you promised. You said I would get my daughter back. That's not my daughter. I stared with open mouth as Mr. Jones disappeared between the trees. I wondered if I should follow him. He clearly wasn't in his right mind. 
Then I turned and gazed down the hallway. Something felt wrong, and Isabel could be inside. In trouble. I hesitated for a second, touching my phone in my pocket. Maybe I should call the cops first. But I didn't. I stepped into the house. It was dark inside, as if every curtain was closed. A musty, nauseating smell entered my nostrils. From the hallway, I saw dishes piled up on the kitchen counter. There clearly hadn't been any cleaning for a while. I heard some shuffling upstairs and queried, Isabel? Nothing. Mrs. Jones? I added. No reply followed. I headed upstairs step by step, starting to get really nervous. Standing on the landing, heart drumming in my throat, I could make out that shuffling once more. It came from behind a door in the back. Isabel? Mr. Jones? I repeated. The sounds from the back room turned up when I spoke their names, but no reply followed. I took another step and froze. The door opened, inch by inch. Fingers curled around the corner. The person that appeared wasn't Isabel or Mrs. Jones. It was Mindy. But she didn't look anything like the Mindy I had known. I screamed and stumbled backwards. I missed the first step and dropped down the stairs. I landed on my back but ignored the pain. Scrambling upwards, I made for the front door down the lawn, heading for my bicycle. I didn't look back once as I sped down that dark forest road. Then a movement in the trees caught my eye. It was Isabel, disappearing in the woods. She was naked. I jumped off my bicycle and ran for her. What the fuck was going on? Isabel, I yelled. Wait! But entering the forest, my girlfriend was nowhere to be seen. Then I spotted her a couple of yards ahead. Thinking back, I don't know how I could. It was pitch dark in the forest. I kept on yelling her name, but she didn't respond. What happened in that house? Walking aimlessly, I noticed a shimmering light between the trees. Fire. I headed for the light and suddenly found myself on the edge of a clearing. Straight ahead, a tall slab of stone stood upwards. Behind it, something burned. I couldn't see what it was, but it had the vague smell of roasted meat. A figure shuffled around the fire, and there were sounds, wails, crying, someone screaming for help, a familiar voice. You found the shortcut. Someone spoke behind me. Two strong hands locked my arms. I screamed, somehow managing to shake free from the steel grip. I ran blindly for the opposite side of the forest. I trashed through the thickets for a while, thwarting tree trunks. Then the woods stopped and I was back on the road. I looked wildly around me, no clue which way town was. A rustling in the trees behind me forced me to pick a side. Fortunately, it was the right one. My parents couldn't make any sense of the incoherent story I uttered between panicking sobs. My dad simply called the police. When the cops investigated the Jones farm, they didn't catch any sign of Mindy. What they did encounter was Mr. Jones dangling from a rope. Mrs. Jones was found a couple of yards into the woods. What was left of the poor woman, anyway? Her body had been burned to crisps beneath a tall slab of stone. Remembering the smell of roasted meat, I retched when I heard. What about Cliff? I found myself asking when I was questioned by the police. Any sign of him? The detective shook her head. Why do you ask? No reason, I murmured. And Isabel? As I was questioned, I kept asking them about the Jones foster daughter. They were looking into it. They kept replying. When they took me in for another round of questioning, I tried once more. There's no record of an Isabel ever living there. The woman answered brusquely. Mindy was their only daughter. But, I muttered, that's, that's impossible. I knew her. We, but it wasn't that surprising. 
Since the police asked, I had tried to find her number and text on my phone. They were nowhere to be found. Vanished. The detectives eventually cleared me. It was established pretty quickly that Mr. Jones killed his wife. To what motive they never discovered. There hadn't been any notes of any kind. Something to do with the trauma of Mindy's death, perhaps. The horrific incident was labeled a domestic dispute, and that was that. My first girlfriend was never seen again, and neither was Cliff. Other girls came, and I'm in a steady relationship for years now. We all have to grow up sometime, right? Which brings me to last weekend when my girlfriend and I decided to stay the weekend at my folks. They actually moved. Their new house being a lot closer to the forest where I used to meet Isabel. The guest room is located on the ground floor, adjoined by the garden. The sound of a text message woke me up late at night. Groggy, I reached for my phone and stared at my screen. My heart skipped a beat. Hey, village boy. Wanna meet? In the same instant, I thought I heard a soft tap on the bedroom window. I lurched upwards, my heart drumming, and stared at the window. Had there been a movement, could have just been my imagination. My girlfriend was still fast asleep as I crept across the bedroom and opened the balcony door. Nothing. No one to be seen, but there was something on the outside tiles. An empty bottle of bourbon. Gulping, I gazed at the dark tree line at the end of the yard. I couldn't spot anyone. A sick joke, but who knew? As I stepped back inside, a soft giggling turned my stomach into ice. I would always remember that voice, but it was different now. Twisted. When I saw a pale arm reach for me from the corner of my eye, I slammed the door and dove between my blankets. I didn't get much sleep that night. The incident has sparked a lot of memories. That blind trashing through the forest. The smell of roasted meat. And above all, my best friend screaming for help. I recently moved to this new suburban district in my city that recently finished construction. It's my first ever house that I own, well, me and my fiance own. A lot of people living around the district are glad that it finally finished as the construction noises have been going on almost non-stop for nearly a decade. My childhood home is quite close to the district, so I remember the constant noise of construction machines pretty well as it started back in my early teenage years. I always wondered why it would never stop, even at night, but I brushed it off as it being connected to some bureaucratic nonsense that I simply don't understand. I honestly really like the area. At first, I was unsure about buying a house in the area since half of it is in built on grounds once occupied by a large metal refinery. However, I like it here than I would ever have imagined. Our neighbors are friendly, there's good public transportation, how close my parents live, etc. This place was meant to be just simple suburban real estate, but they had added space for a few small grocery stores in the planning process, turning it into a proper district. Basically, we have everything we need at arm's reach. Last Saturday, I noticed that a lot of lampposts in the neighborhood had loudspeakers attached to them. I asked my seemingly all-knowing neighbor about it, and he said that they are for emergency warning signals. We do get the occasional heavy snowstorm in the winter, usually followed by a decent flood in spring. The loudspeakers could be for extreme weather warnings, although no other district in the city has such speakers. They presumably have these here, in the newest district to test it out, right? Stuff like that is usually mentioned on the news, but I haven't heard from it. I suppose I just have missed it, I thought to myself. On Tuesday, I got off work super late. I work on the other side of the city at a telecom company as an IT specialist. 
Basically, we had some internet issues in the office ourselves, and it took us nearly two hours to find out that the ethernet cable was crushed under a desk and had broken. As it's summer, and my car's air conditioning is broken at the moment, I drove home with the windows down. It was half past midnight, so I didn't expect much traffic. Arriving at my home district, I started to notice a high-pitched ringing noise coming from the outside. The wind in my ears, I assumed it was just crickets going wild tonight. When I got home though, the ringing noise was definitely something else. Does anyone know that high-pitched squealing noise some car's brakes do? I think it's because the brake discs are dirty or something. It's super annoying and makes you tear your ears out. Anyways, it was that noise, only constant and never ending. This high pitched squealing noise. At first, I couldn't make out where it was coming from, but I soon realized that it's probably the loudspeakers. I quickly grabbed my bag and ran inside once the noise was killing me. I threw my bag by the couch and before going to bed, I wrote the local council about the loudspeakers and told them that they seemed to be broken playing this painful note all night long. The next day, I checked my email all day for a response. Around 3 in the afternoon, they finally responded. They claimed that the speakers were turned off at night and no noise was transmitted from them. They asked if I had a video recording of the noise. I didn't, but wrote that I'll see if I can get it on video tonight. That night, I intentionally left work late to see if I hear the noise again. When I got home though, I heard no noises besides the occasional car driving by or the gust of wind. I went straight to bed, however my fiance wasn't sleeping. In fact, she wasn't anywhere in the house. I called her. It rang for a bit before it hung up and I got a text saying, randomly went out with the besties and lost track of time. I'll be home in 15 minutes. I was tired, so I texted her, alright, no worries, and went to bed. The next morning, she felt that her entire body was sore. I joked about what they might have done last night for her to be so tired, but she promised that she had no idea what made her body feel so numb. I laughed it off until I checked out the district's Facebook page. People all across the district were complaining about their sore and numb arms legs, and backs. Such pain is usually related to lifting heavy things. Most who live here currently are either young children or their parents. Nobody really stays up late besides on special occasions like I did. The next couple of days have made everything even more confusing. Some people have woken up with burns on their body and my lower back aches like crazy. I went to the doctor and she said to be more careful when lifting heavy things. The thing is that I definitely haven't lifted anything very heavy in the past week. Whatever is happening to everyone, it's happening to me too. Another update happened today. Someone decided to set up a camera in their bedroom and set up a motion sensor to detect recording when moving is detected. They uploaded it to the Facebook group and well, it's interesting. The clip wasn't long, about 10 seconds, but it showed how the guy got up from his bed at night, wandered to the camera, and covered it with a blanket. His face was clearly seen in the video. It was a cold stare, no emotions whatsoever, not even tiredness. The final 5 seconds of the video seemed like he walked to the door and left the bedroom. The man himself said that he has no recollection about doing anything like that in the video. Some people called a hoax. Just something to stir up drama. Most people thought it was real though. Some commented that they had recently found themselves in odd places around their homes. Most have no record of ever sleepwalking before. A conversation about people sleepwalking continued for a few hours before the entire Facebook group was hacked and turned into a page advertising crypto scams. I heard from some people around the neighborhood that it was a deliberate hack to cover something up, that we were getting too close to the truth. Personally, I don't know what to do. I feel like we should temporarily move to my parents' house and think about the whole thing. My fiance thinks that it's just some weird phenomenon will pass quickly. 
We had our first ever fight over this just this morning. I suppose I'll ask my parents what they think, and if we even can move to their place. If we can, then I'll try my best to convince my fiancé to move there. If I need to, I'll drag her with me no matter how much she wants to stay. There's no way she's staying here without me. It's 3 a.m. An official phone alert woke me up. It says, do not look at the moon. I check my phone to see hundreds of notifications from different numbers. Some I don't even recognize. It read, look outside, it's a beautiful night. I put my phone down feeling uneasy and wondering what is going on. I have always been paranoid and superstitious so I decide to not look outside. I sit alone thinking about what is going on and I start to consider if it's just some weird scam type thing. I check my phone again to make sure it's even real, which it is. Then I see a message from my mom. Oh honey, look outside, it's beautiful. Now I panic. Even my mom is in on this. Is this some weird prank? I text her back. What's going on? Why should I look outside? She replies with, It's so pretty outside. You should take a look. At this point, I'm feeling scared and confused. Why are they telling me to look outside? I was told not to. I jump at the sound of my best friend texting me. He says, Dude, did you get that message saying to not look outside? This relieved me and I told him what happened to me. The same happened to me. What's going on? Do you know what's outside? I told him that I have no clue and I'm worried. I told him my mom was texting it and everything. That's weird, he says. Before I can text him back, there's a knock on my door. Sweetie, I hear my mom call. I call back to her asking if she got any weird texts. Weird texts? I haven't got any weird texts, nope. I told her to come in so I could show her my messages, but she refused. I called out to her to ask why she can't come in, but there was no response. I called again, but there was nothing. What the hell is happening? I asked myself. Then I remembered my friend. I texted him. Sorry, my mom was talking. She was acting really weird. Oh, I'm glad you're back, he replied. I wanted to tell you that I'm going to look out to see what the fuss is about. What? No. I tell him, but he didn't respond. I waited five minutes, quaking in fear and worry, when eventually my phone lit up. It was my friend. I looked at the message, and it said, Dude. I told him I was worried sick and asked him what happened. He replied with, It's beautiful outside. You should take a look. My heart dropped. Suddenly there was a knock on my door. Sweetie? The voice called. The door cracked open. My mom entered the room, but it wasn't my mom. It was skinny with jet black eyes. It grew a terrifying grin as it stared at me and said, Look outside, sweetie. I screamed as it came at me. The last thing I saw was my friend telling me to look outside and the light of the moon burned my eyes. As I stared at the bright glare of the moon, it felt like my eyeballs were being pierced by thousands of needles. I cried out as my mom held my head still, laughing. I couldn't close my eyes. It felt like the longer I stared, the more I had to keep staring. Suddenly, my body felt weak. My arms and legs went limp as I felt a wave of cold rush through my body. My hands tingled. Then I felt a sharp, excruciating pain in each of my fingers. I glanced down to see them growing freakishly long. My nails grew sharp and I freaked out. I was crying for help, but all that was on the street was creatures like that was holding me still, which I was now turning into. As I watched the streets lit up by the moonlight, I noticed the tingle moving through my body, downwards. It felt a terrible pain as if my stomach was being crushed. 
I watched in horror as my belly started getting thinner, my whole body stretching and morphing. I screamed until my throat felt like it was being ripped to shreds. Then it stopped. My mom let me free and I stood up. Feeling like I wasn't fully in control of my body, she looked at me, the grin wider. Lovely, wasn't it? She said in a hushed tone, and I noticed a tear dripping from her black eye. I tried to yell, but nothing came out. My mouth stayed shut, then my mouth opened. Out of my control, sure was. Said a voice out of my body. It sounded like mine, but at the same time it was so different. I wasn't in control of my body, although my mind was still here. That's when I realized that my mom is in that creature. She had to watch what it did to me. I almost started crying myself. It put its arm around me, guiding me to the door. We went outside and started following the others. I watched as my neighbor came out of his house, transformed. I watched as creatures entered houses and came out with the members of that house, transformed. What are we going to do, Mom? I said in my mind, and then the creature beside me looked at me, as if Mom heard me. Then it looked away and walked ahead, into her old friend's house. I walked with the crowd, starting to cry. What will I do? Is this the end of humanity?